Section Zero of The Yarn of Old Harbor Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker, July 25th, 2021, Westford, Massachusetts. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell. Poem. Have you ne'er heard the yarn of old harbor town? She was sweeter than Hinda or Heyday. When the hatches were flush with goods, victuals, and lush, the captain made sail with the lady. Old Rhymes, 1835. End of section zero. Chapter One of the Yarn of Old Harbor Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kimberly Dauber. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell. Lucy Acton. Old Harbor House stood about a mile from the harbor. It confronted the town which lay about one mile and a half off, right across a wide, romantic, heavily wooded ravine. The banks of this gap sloped softly and pleasantly into a plain of meadows, and two or three farms whose dyes of roof and cattle enriched the verdure, and down there ran a river singing in measures of music as it flowed into the harbor and mingled its bright water with the brine of the deep beyond. Above, on the placid slope of down close against Old Harbor Town, hung a straggler building or two, lonely in importance or consequential in some trifling pomp of land. At the point of cliff on Old Harbor House side, a low Percy lighthouse wheezed at night a yellow gleam that was a home greeting or godspeed to some five score fishermen who dredged in these and further waters and on the brow confronting the lighthouse, a venerable windmill revolved its vans against the sky. It has been said that Old Harbor House stood. The house takes its place as a beauty of the past. On Christmas Eve, 1832, fire reduced it to a few blackened walls. All through the long night the flames made a wild, grand show. Sea and land were illuminated for leagues and leagues. Out of the ashes of the beautiful building sprang that commonplace phoenix, the local poet, who celebrated the one tradition of Old Harbor Town in a copy of rhymes, of which the first verse should be found imprinted on the title page of this book. The house, or at least the front of it, was built after a design by Inigo Jones. The pediment was perforated by a circular window glazed with a casement whose frame resembled the spokes of a ship's wheel. A variety of antique symbolism resembling the hideous sculptures which sometimes close the chapters in books of the 17th century underran the eaves. The tall, narrow windows gleamed blackly amidst the skeletons of the winter or the colored embroidery of the summer creepers. The hall door was noble and hospitable in expanse. A carriage drive swept from it on either hand the oval lawn to a handsome gate whose supports were crowned by the arms of the Actons on one hand and the arms of a family into which one of the Actons had married on the other hand. One bright morning in April in that memorable year 1805, Captain Charles Acton, R.N., retired, stood on his lawn in front of the house watching a gardener who was at work at a flower bed. He was a slightly built but tall, very gentlemanlike man, one of the last in a crowd to be picked out as a seafarer. He was pale, his nose aquiline, lips thin, and the expression of the mouth firm. He was dressed in a frill shirt, loose cravat of white cambric, red striped waistcoat, long green coat with a high collar and small cuffs, tight breeches to the ankle buttoned to the middle of the thigh, and top boots. A rather low-crowned, broad-brimmed hat sat somewhat cocked on his head. His hair was long, without powder, and tied a little way down the back in a sort of tail. He was suddenly hailed from the gate by a loud, hearty voice. "'What cheer! How are you, Captain? How are you this fine morning? Have you heard the news?' The gate was thrust open, 
and there entered Rear Admiral Sir William Lawrence, a round-faced, bullet-headed seaman of the old type. He was dressed in a bottle-green coat, metal buttons, red waistcoat, knee breeches and stockings, shoes and large buckles, and being totally bald, he wore a wig, perched at the back of which was a little round hat. Sir William again asked Captain Acton if he had heard the news. French landed, inquired Captain Acton, as they strolled away from the flower bed and paced the grass in which the daisies were springing, in a quarter deck walk, the Admiral taking about one and a half rolling steps to Captain Acton's one. Yes, the French have landed, but not just in the way they like. One of our frigates, I haven't got to hear her name, chased a French privateersman ashore five miles up the coast yesterday afternoon. After taking out of her ten thousand pounds in gold, which the beggars had sneaked from a British West India man off Dungeness two or three nights before, they set her on fire. I had a mind this morning to ride over and view the wreck, or what remains of her. Lucy told me at breakfast this morning that on going to bed last night she noticed a faint tinge in the air as of the rising moon away to the eastward. "'Twas the burning wreck, I presume. "'No doubt. She'd light up a wide area. "'I expect the frigate that chased her will be one of the western squadron,' said Captain Acton. "'How finely those ships are doing their work. "'Since they've been sweeping these waters, scarce a French picaroon dare put his nose out, "'when before the seas swarmed like a tropic calm with bristling fins of sharks.' "'You have to thank Pellew for the idea of those squadrons,' said Sir William. "'What a gallant fellow he is. "'Whenever I hear his name, I recall the story told of him when he was a midshipman. "'He was aboard the Blonde. "'You remember Pownall?' Captain Acton nodded. "'General Burgoyne arrived alongside to ship for America. "'The yards were manned. "'The general climbed aboard and, looking aloft, "'spied a youngster standing on his head on the main topsail yard arm. "'It's only young Pellew, one of my midshipmen,' says Captain Pownall. "'But suppose he falls, sir,' said the general. "'Why, sir,' answers Pownall, "'if he falls, he'll sink under the ship's bottom and come up the other side.' "'Yes, very characteristic. "'I rank Pellew after Nelson.' "'Why, no, sir. "'Who, then?' "'I consider Cochrane possesses all the potentialities of Nelson. "'Then gallant old Jervis.' The admiral interrupted himself and gazed with an arch leer at his companion. "'As you know, I have had the honor," said Captain Acton with slight sarcasm, "'to serve under my Lord St. Vincent when he was Sir John Jervis, I may claim to know him.' "'Oh, yes, thoroughly, very thoroughly. "'I admit the gallantry of his action with the Pegas. It was as brilliant as a hundred other actions between single ships, not one of which nevertheless brought the victor an earldom. What made Jervis a lord? Was it his own or the genius of Nelson? That maneuver of the Commodore on the 14th won the battle. We took four ships from the enemy, and two of them were captured by Nelson. But I dislike St. Vincent for opinions which he is at no pains to disguise— he objects to the education of the poor. "'So do I, sir,' said Sir William. "'We'll not argue the point. St. Vincent objects to inoculation for smallpox because he says that that disease is intended by God to keep the population down.' Sir William laughed. "'He objects to service clubs. He said to a friend of mine—' "'Take my advice and have nothing to do with them. "'They are one of the signs of the times of which I highly disapprove. "'These assemblies of army and navy may in time become dangerous to the government.' "'When he was commander-in-chief, he strongly discouraged matrimony. "'He hated to have married officers in his fleet, "'for he said they were the first to run into port and the last to come out of it. "'I do not wonder that they declined to drink to his health at Bath.' "'I never heard of that.' said Sir William. It was in 1802. A naval dinner was given at Bath. St. Vincent was first lord, I need not tell you. His health was proposed and refused to be drunk by many of the company. The party broke up in confusion. Some toasted him in a bumper and left the room. Others turned down their glasses and sat still. 
And you would rank this old gentleman next after Nelson? Talking of Nelson, said Sir William, have you heard the yarn that is told of Tom Cook, the actor? He came on in the part of old Barnwell, and when stabbed forgot the words and would have died speechless. His murderer whispered with agitation, For heaven's sake, say something, anything! On which Tom, throwing up his little three-cornered hat, shouted in his thick lisp, Nelson forever! and died amidst louder applause than was ever provoked by the finest strokes of Garrick or Siddons. The story was to Captain Acton's taste, and he laughed with enjoyment. I should like, said the Admiral, to have met Nelson. In all my going a fishing, I never fell in his way. Well, said Captain Acton, I may say of Nelson as Pope said of Dryden, Virgilium tantum vidi. I was on the hard when two naval officers came ashore. I was thinking of other matters and scarcely observed them until they were abreast or a little past me. Then my glance going to one, I instantly perceived he was Nelson. His companion, I believe, was Trowbridge. In the glimpse I got of Nelson's face, I was struck by its paleness and careworn appearance. He looked at least fifteen years older than his age. They passed rapidly out of sight. I cannot express the emotions which that one-armed little figure excited in me. St. Valentine's Day, the Nile, Copenhagen. And how much more, cried the Admiral, with a flush in his cheek, and with that expression of triumph and pride which lighted up the eyes of men in those days when they pronounced the magic name of Nelson. I should like, I should much like to meet him, to see him, to grasp his hand, for a minute only before my windlass is man for the next world. Who knows what lies before us, said Captain Acton. Little enough before me, sir, exclaimed Sir William. Sailors dream of a cottage ashore, but when they come to it, I like my little perch. Tis not old harbor house, says he, casting his eye over the building. "'But I could wish the sea were within range of its windows. "'I was down in the harbour yesterday admiring the lines of your Minorca. "'She lay upright on the mud, awash to her garbard strake about, "'and I liked her lines in the run, "'and believed I could see a hint to our shipwrights "'in the cleanliness and beauty of her entry.' "'She is a pretty example of the French form,' said Captain Acton. I think I told you she was built at Bordeaux, from which port some elegant structures are sent afloat. But the French cannot approach the Americans as shipbuilders. Take that schooner of mine, the Aurora. By the way, she is due here shortly. I wish she may not have been taken by the enemy. I admire your venture, said the Admiral. I believe if I could muster two or three thousand pounds, I should be disposed to purchase a prize or two from the French, Spanish, or Yankees and follow your lead. Good interest on money is hard to get. Your ships do well for you, sir. I am quite satisfied, exclaimed Captain Acton complacently. But, as you know, I was mainly actuated by the desire to promote the trade of this decaying place. "'The inheritance of this property,' said he, sending his gaze over the wide grounds, agreeably wooded afar by orchards whose boughs in a season's yield, supplied cider enough to keep a parish merry through several generations, brought with it urgent obligations. I could not view Old Harbour going to pieces without a resolution to do something that might serve to keep it together. "'You will add to your ships?' said Sir William. "'I think not.' The prospect must brighten before I increase my fleet. The war risks are stupendous. I never see one of my vessels quit her berth but that I say to myself, when I next hear of you you'll be at Cadiz or Dunkirk or at the bottom of the sea. Sir William Lawrence halted in the quarter-deck walk the two were taking upon that bright green oval lawn and looked at the ocean which ran in a white line, pale and faint as ice at the horizon, betwixt the two points of the ravine crowned on the right by the lighthouse and on the left by a windmill. But the waters of the channel broadened down from their pearl-like margin into a delicate blue, which changed into dark green and brown as the sea shoaled into the land. The admiral seemed to find something to delight him in the prospect, and Captain Acton, standing at his side, viewed a scene, very familiar indeed to him, with pleasure 
which increased with the attention he gave it. Indeed, no piece of English landscape could have looked fairer on this fine April morning than Old Harbor Town and its harbor, and the little forefinger of pier. The windmill and the lighthouse resembled carvings, so delicately were their outlines traced against the silver blueness of the spring sky. In the harbor against the wharves were visible the mounting masts and yards of several craft, with sails hanging loose to dry, and the water of the harbor was dotted with a few squab shapes of smacks and the figure of a moored brig of war. The picture was tender and mellow with color, the springing lights of the early growths of the young year, the venerable face of the cliff as it swept from the slope of down where the windmill was to the beach, the slow motion of violet shadows over green distances, and the impression of placid provincial life was heightened by the calm in the air, which was scarcely vexed by the remote silver ringing of a chapel bell in High Street, Old Harbor Town. "'I often wish I was at sea again,' exclaimed Sir William, as the two started afresh on their quarter-deck walk. "'What a noble, open, hearty, soul-stirring life it is! What good fellows one meets, what brave ships, what splendid crews!' It is my hourly regret that my son should be out of it. Though I am his father, I say that this young man had in him, nay, he has in him, all the makings of a fine, dashing, even a great officer. But that devil drink, not that the vice is immoderate with him, but he takes too much. And when the fiend is in him, all that is weak in his nature appears, and he falls. Drink, but not so as to justify the word drunkard, drink and gaming, these undid him. He was a favorite with all he sailed with, and yet through his own accursed folly he is forced to quit the navy under circumstances which would bring the moisture into my eyes if half a century of hard weather had not dried all the dampness out of them. Captain Acton looked at his companion in silence, but with an expression of gentle concern. He must go to the dogs, continued the admiral, if he lingers on in this neighborhood. He can get nothing to do here, and idleness brings with it the temptation of drink. I hear him at the Swan. There he meets Lieutenant Tupman, and they grow married together, God what, over recollections. I wish he had Tupman's birth, a cabbage garden and a cottage and a pigsty and a gun brig that is never ready. I wonder the Admiralty keep up this farce of gun brigs stationed on the coast to guard against what they are never prepared for. I have heard Mr. Lawrence highly spoken of. When I was last in London, I met Pettigrew of the Circe, and he was telling me of a cutting-out affair in which your son was engaged in the West Indies, Antigua, I think. Nothing could have been more gallant than his conduct. He could have done well, sighed the old Admiral. A few evenings ago I was waited upon by Mr. Greyquill, a sleek and dingy little man whom I do not love the sight of. Such a visit must be an intrusion. I was sitting in the open window smoking my pipe when he pushed the gate and sneaked up the path in his land-stealing way, but before he could fetch the door I hailed him. "'Hello, Mr. Greyquill,' says I. "'Pray, what business brings you on this visit?' "'But in my heart,' I knew devilish well what he called about. He steps on to the grass over against my window, and with a low congee he says, I am sorry, Sir William, to intrude upon you, sir, but I can obtain no satisfaction from your son, and at the same time I have no desire to go to extremities. You'll not help your case by threatening me, Mr. Greyquill, said I. But look how the case stands, sir, he cries. "'Your son has had three hundred pounds from me.' "'No, sir,' I said. "'Well, sir, he owes me three hundred pounds. "'For how much advanced?' said I. "'For two hundred in good cash,' he answered. "'I looked the old rogue full in the eye and said, "'You should be a rich man, sir.' "'I want my money, Sir William,' says he. "'I trusted your son, as an officer and a gentleman, "'and as the son of an officer and a gentleman.' "'Hold, sir!' I shouted, losing my temper. "'What right had you to trust me as an officer and a gentleman "'when you never gave me your confidence? "'Did you drop a hint to me that you were advancing money to my son? "'Do you suppose, if I had known the truth, "'that I would have suffered you to accept my credit as a stake "'in these ignoble transactions?' 
"'Well, Sir William, I want my money,' said the old rascal, "'and must get it, though I hope not to be driven into extremities. "'Is Mr. Lawrence in?' "'No, sir,' says I. "'Good afternoon.' "'And I got up and left the window. "'This man, Greyquill, has managed to clap the thumbscrew of debt "'upon the hands of a pretty good few in our district,' said Captain Acton. "'But what's the use of locking up a man who owes you money? "'Leave him at large and you stand to be repaid. "'But flinging a man into a debtor's jail, "'not because he won't pay, but because he can't pay, "'seems to me folly as monstrous as locking up a man "'because being unable to obtain work, "'his wife and children come upon the parish. "'Look at the cost you put the country to on this account. "'There is the expense of the maintenance of the man in jail, "'and there is the expense of the maintenance of the wife and children on the parish. "'Now, by leaving the man at large, "'you give him the chance of obtaining a day's work. "'I hope old Grey Quill will not go to extremes,' "'exclaimed the admiral with a flush in his face. "'It is dishonour enough to be in his debt, but to be imprisoned. "'There is no good in his looking to me for repayment. "'I don't think he'll trouble your son in that way. "'He may be a Shylock, but he is not one of those money scriveners "'who demand your money or your flesh. "'At least I should say not. "'I only know the man to nod to. "'Of what use would a pound of your son's flesh be to him?' "'I believe, sir, that Mr. Lawrence is not so immoderate in his love of the glass, "'but that he might be entrusted with the care of a ship?' "'No, sir. "'Tis gambling, not drinking, that is his weakness. "'But he has drunk and still drinks more than he should. "'Yet I have little doubt if he could find himself in a situation of trust, "'knowing now the hardships and difficulties of life "'and the almost insuperable obstacles to a man's advancement,' when by his own folly he has ruined his professional career, that he would keep a stern watch over his appetite for drink. He has considerable powers of mind, an uncommon degree of spirit and resolution when he chooses to exert those qualities, and I say with the assurance of his profound sensibility to his present melancholy condition that he might be safely trusted to discharge any duties he may have the good luck to be called upon to execute." "'I think I told you, Sir William,' said Captain Acton, after a short interval passed in reflection, "'that the Minorca is in want of a captain.' "'Yes, I remember. The master died in the homeward passage, and the ship was brought to port by the mate, to whom I suppose you intend to give the command. "'Well, he is a respectable, though a very illiterate man, and I had half made up my mind to offer him the berth. But I am affected by your trouble.' I should be glad to be of service to your son. Whilst we have talked, I have been thinking, and if he is prepared to accept the position, I am quite willing that he should take the Minorca out and home from the West Indies this voyage on the terms I am in the habit of giving, twelve pounds a month and a commission on the earnings of the voyage. The Admiral stopped short and looked at his companion with a face that was warm and eyes that were dim with an emotion of gratitude that was almost the conqueror of his manhood. He extended his arm in silence, and the two officers clasped hands. "'Acton, you are good. This is indeed kind of you,' said the Admiral after a moment or two of silence. "'It would be a great weight lifted from my spirits to know that my son is shoved clear of the mischief of the idleness of this place, and that he is once more honourably enjoyed. "'For, sir,' said the old gentleman in a hearty, almost rapturous way, to be in charge of such a ship as the Minorca is to hold a command as honourable, if not as exalted, as any afloat. I do thank you, sir. He will be most deeply obliged to you. The two gentlemen released hands and continued their walk. Of course, said Captain Acton, he is well up in navigation. You will find him fully qualified in that and in all else. A smarter seaman never trod shipboard. "'I like the idea,' said Captain Acton, "'of a naval officer being in charge of my vessel. "'The men of the merchant service are a very rough lot. "'Many of the masters and mates can scarcely read or write. "'They grope their way about by dead reckoning. "'They so little understand the treatment of men "'that their crews consider themselves as good as they, 
particularly when they bring the sailors aft and hob and knob with the rum cask lifted through the hatch and broached in the cabin, till half the company lie motionless in drink, and the rest are fighting and running about mad. Two things the Navy teaches us, discipline and the art of it. At this point the couple turned in their walk and confronted the house, at the hall door of which, in the act of descending the broad flight of steps, was a young lady putting on a glove, attended by a little terrier, who at the sight of the gentleman bounded across the grass and barked with fury up at the admiral's face. This young lady was Lucy, the only child of Captain Acton, one of the most charming, indeed one of the most beautiful girls of her time. The scene of garden and flower beds quaintly shaped, and the backing of the noble, mellow, gleaming building with its pediment and symbolic carvings, was enchantingly in keeping with the figure and appearance of the girl, who by the magic of her looks and attire instantly transformed it into a picture charged with the colors of youth and health and a sweet and delicate spirit of life. Her apparel was prettily of the time, a straw hat, the brim projecting a little over the forehead and seated somewhat on one side, a plain light blue gown and long yellow silk gloves. The gown was without waist, and bound under the bosom by a girdle. Her hair this day was dressed in tresses which hung around the face, not curls but tender shadings of hair, as though the effect had been contrived by the fingers of the wind. But some curls reposed on her neck. Her eyes were unusually large, of a dark brown and full of liquid light. The eyelids were somewhat heavy, and looked the heavier because of their rich furniture of eyelash. The eyelashes indeed suggested at first sight that she doctored her eyes, as do actresses and others, but a brief inspection satisfied the beholder that all was nature transparent, artless, and lovely. A conspicuous charm in Lucy Acton was her color. Her cheeks always wore a natural bloom or glow. This, as in the case of her eyes, might have been suspected as the effect of art, but she blushed so readily, even sometimes on any effort of speech, the damask of her blood so wrought in her cheek on any impulse of mood or humor, that it was quickly seen the mantling glow was a charm of nature's own gift. No girl could have been more natural and few more beautiful than Lucy Acton. Had she lived half a century earlier, she would have been one of the toasts of the nation. She was twenty-three years of age, and it will be readily supposed had been sought in marriage by more than one ardent swain. But she had kept her heart whole. Nothing in breeches and stockings and long cutaway coat and salutations adopted from the most approved Parisian styles had touched the passions of Lucy Acton. She was like Emma as painted by Miss Austen. She loved her home, she adored her father, she was perfectly well satisfied with her present state of being, she could not conceive anything in a man that was worth marrying for, and being well, she meant to leave well alone. Where did she get those wonderful eyes? From her mother, who in her day had been a celebrated Irish actress. Kitty O'Hara, famed in such parts as Sir Harry Wildair, the fair penitent, and Ophelia. Captain Acton, when lieutenant and stationed at Kingston, had seen Mrs. Kitty O'Hara as Ophelia at Dublin Theatre, and before she had been on the stage five minutes he lost his heart to her. The beautiful and accomplished actress was living with her mother, a noble-looking old gentlewoman who claimed to possess the blood of Irish kings. Acton made love and offered marriage, and was accepted. He had little more than his pay to live upon. Nevertheless, he refused to allow his wife to return to the stage. He was a sailor, and must by reason of his vocation be often long absent from home, and he declined to subject his beautiful young wife to the temptations of the stage. He might also have been influenced by the case of Sheridan after his marriage with Miss Linley, and sometimes quoted Dr. Samuel Johnson's comment on Sheridan's decision. He resolved wisely and nobly to be sure. He is a brave man. Would not a gentleman be disgraced by having his wife singing publicly for hire? No, sir, there can be no doubt here. "'Down, ma'am, cease your clatter,' cried Captain Acton to the terrier, whilst the admiral saluted the young lady with a bow as full of homage as he would have conceded to royalty. "'Where are you bound to?' "'I am going to Old Harbour Town to do a little shopping,' 
answered Lucy, smiling at the admiral and showing her milk-white teeth, the whiter for the red of her lips and the bloom on her cheeks. "'Can I do anything for you, Papa?' "'No, my dear.' "'Can I be of service to you, Sir William?' said the girl, picking up her dog to silence it. "'You do me service enough by suffering me to see you, madam,' replied the gallant old sailor. "'Brighter lights and fresher colors seem to attend you. "'Your grounds, sir, have grown gayer since your charming daughter made her appearance.' "'I know nobody who turns his compliments so prettily as you, Sir William,' exclaimed Lucy. "'Do you know, sir,' said she, addressing her father, "'that Bates, the butler, just now told me there was a fire at sea last night.' "'No, on the shore, miss,' said the admiral. "'A French corsair was chased ashore about five miles up and burnt.' "'I saw the light from my bedroom window,' said Lucy. "'Who chased the Frenchman?' "'Lieutenant Tupman?' "'He! More likely he was chasing one of his pigs, "'if indeed he was not in bed, sound under the influence of Flip. "'As those brigs are not useful, and as they are not ornamental, "'why is the nation put to the cost of maintaining them? "'Had my son received Tupman's birth? "'Oh, ma'am, I must tell you of a noble, generous deed of kindness. "'Your excellent, large-hearted father has been good enough to do me and Mr. Lawrence.' "'He has promised him command of the Menorca.' "'Lucy looked at her father with an expression of surprise "'that vanished from her fine dramatic eyes in an instant. "'I am very pleased to hear it,' she said. "'I am sure Mr. Lawrence will be glad to get away from Old Harbour Town. "'He has visited many parts of the globe, "'and to be limited to two streets, "'and such streets as High Street and Lower Street,' with their little shops and tame and commonplace interests, must be such a trial to a man of spirit, as every day can but make more and more a punishment. "'It gives me great pleasure to serve my old friend,' said Captain Acton. "'Mr. Lawrence is an officer with a career full of gallant things. I have no doubt he is a capable navigator. Will you ask him to call upon me this evening?' "'At what hour?' Eight o'clock will suit me very well.' "'He shall wait upon you at the stroke, sir.' "'Good-bye, Sir William,' said Lucy. And in silence, the two gentlemen watched her walk to the gate and pass out. End of chapter 1 Read by Kimberly Dauber Chapter 2 of The Yarn of Old Harbour Town This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbour Town by William Clark Russell Chapter 2 Walter Lawrence Lucy Acton made her way towards Old Harbour Town by a lane that struck down off the road used by the coaches and post chairs. This lane was broad and in places steep and rugged, with long spaces heavily flanked with tall and spacious trees. Elsewhere, the low hedge revealed the sloping meadow, or plough field, whose margin where it sank low was defined against the blue water of the ocean. It was April, and some birds were in song. The sun shone brightly, and the breeze blowing from the sea sang pleasantly amongst the trees whose boughs were studded with little buds. The lane conducted Lucy to the valley, where the river was, and here she stepped upon an old bridge. When halfway across, she stopped to look in the direction of Old Harbour. The river flowed prettily under this bridge, and melted its brilliance in the waters of the harbour where, when the tide was at lowest ebb, it always had a bed for its discharge into the brine beyond. Lucy had often viewed this scene. Her pause now was dictated by a trifling feeling of curiosity. Against the wharves on the left-hand side, and over against the stump-ended projection of pier, was moored her father's ship, the Menorca, of which she had just been assured Sir William Lawrence's son was to be offered for command. This vessel lay with two or three others, a brig or two and a schooner, at the wharves, and with her own and the drying sails of her others, the tall spars, 
for yards across, the complicated lines of the rigging provided a bold and even ample figure of shipping to the eye. But in addition to these, there lay in the harbour a number of fishing craft, and this side of the extremity of the wharves within musket shot of where Lucy stood was the moored the saucy brig of war of about 180 tons armed with 32 pounder carronades. She was one of a number of the like sort of brig which were to be found in that year, 1805, on the coast of Sussex, Suffolk and Norfolk. These brigs were usually hauled into creeks or laid up in snug corners where the lieutenant, as Sir William had pointed out, had his cabbage garden and pigsty. They were designed as a provision against the invasion of the French and were quite worthless, as they were never ready, and always so anchored and so secured as to demand as much time in getting under way as would take a French army of invasion to march from Dover to Ashford. This cool indifference on the part of the lieutenants in command of the brigs is rendered the more surprising by contrast with the sincere terrors which the prospects of invasion raised in the country. The alarm indeed was very seriously justified, for in that year the French emperor had at his disposal at the Texel, Ostend, Dunkirk, Calais, Boulogne and Havre a total of 180,000 men with a fleet of 21 sail of the line, besides frigates and transports at Brest, a squadron at Rochefort, and a powerful fleet at Toulon, and at this time Spain had joined her forces with those of France against us. Nevertheless, the lieutenants in charge of the gun brig stationed on the coast took life of that unconcern, which is one of the blessings of peace. They cultivated their cabbage gardens, they attended to their pigsties, and they smoked their pipes and drank strong beer at taverns with sounding names such as the coach and horses, or the maid and the harp, and one of the worst offenders was Lieutenant Tupman of the Brig Saucy, which lay within gunshot of where Lucy stood. The thought of Mr Lawrence having received from her father the offer of the command of yonder little ship was put out of Lucy's mind by the image of placid sun-lighted scenery she contemplated, taking full possession of her. Familiar as the picture was, her beautiful eyes, moving slowly, dwelt in their brooding way upon the objects she directed them at, and her native loveliness seemed to gain by the impulse which visited it. And she, and the sweet and restful scene of cliff and distant blue water and quiet haven into which the fabrics that floated shook their lights and the delicate tracery of their gear were blent, and it was as though she was the spirit of the place. Close to lay the gun brig reflecting her white band broken by pools in the calm surface. She looked to be ready for sea. All her yards were across, the white sails furled with that exquisite finish which expresses the pat of the man of war's hand, but there was nobody visible aboard of her. Beyond, the eye went to the short length of timber pier, and on this side of it to some smacks which now floated at little boys or at their own anchors, though at ebb of tide Old Harbour was mainly mud, with the river's bed in the middle and vessels lying high, black and gaunt in several postures, whilst out in the south the ripple of the sea in smooth weather streamed to and fro with long lashings of black weed, and the air was salt and nimble with the smell of marine growths. The wharves were old platforms black with tar or pitch, and at the back of them were free warehouses for the accommodation of such merchandise as this old harbour received or sent afloat. Perched midway on the slope that was terminated by the brow of the cliff where the windmill this morning was peacefully revolving its vans was Old Harbour Town, a romantic grouping of little grey houses full of sparkling Los End windows backed by a church spire, the whole looking in the distance like a toy that could be put into a box and set out according to taste upon a table by a child. Lucy heard a church bell strike. She started from a fit of abstraction, and, turning to move on, confronted an old man who was crossing the bridge. 
The face of this old man was pale and wrinkled, his hair was long and quite white, his nose streamed down his face in a thin, curling outline, his mouth, when his lips were compressed, might be expressed by a simple stroke of a pencil, his eyes were deep-seated and extraordinarily luminous and swift in their motions, and his eyebrows, which were as white as his hair, were so thick and overhanging that they might have passed for a couple of white mice sleeping on his brow. His apparel had that dim and faded look which in fiction is associated with miserliness. His high and dingy white cravat and the tall build of his coat at the back of his head so sloped his shoulders that they looked to make line with his arms. He wore a faded red waistcoat, which sank very low, and under it dangled a bunch of seals. His knee breeches, left painfully visible, the pipe stem shanks clothed in grey hose and terminating in large shoes, burdened with steel buckles. He removed his little round hat and bowed low to Lucy. "'Good morning, Mr. Greyquill,' said the young woman, bestowing upon him one of those sweet and gracious smiles with which she favoured nearly all, thus rendering herself as much beloved for her cordial charm of manner as she was admired by the women and adored by the men for her singular beauty of face and graces of person. He bade her good morning with profound respect, her dog barked in his face, and she silenced it by lifting it under her arm. "'I hope your code is better, Mr. Greyquill said she, making to proceed in her walk. "'Much better, indeed, quite gone. I am greatly obliged to you, ma'am,' he answered. "'I find nursing of little account. Gruel and foot-baths and a tallow candle for the nose do not help me so much as fresh air. Fresh air seems to drive a cold up.' She agreed with him with a smile, and with a pleasant salutation of the head, walked on. The old man, looked after her, and whispered to himself in admiration of her kindness and person. A wooden-legged sailor just then came up some steps from the riverside on that end of the bridge, which the money-lender was approaching, and when Greyquill was close to, the tar, assuming a posture of abject despondency, pulled off his hat and extending it begged for alms. "'I have bled for my country, your honour," said the man. "'But you don't say you were paid to do so,' answered Greyquill. "'I, but I wasn't paid to lose my leg,' called out the man. Greyquill, who saw little to fear in the pursuit of a man with a wooden leg, turned his head upon his shoulder and cried back, "'There are too many of us.' "'That ain't my fault,' bawled the man at the receding figure. "'Yes, it is,' cried Greyquill. For people like you who can't get on ought to get out. The laugh with which the malicious old fellow accompanied this sally caused the sailor to gaze eagerly round the ground as though for a stone to heave at him. Meanwhile, Lucy, crossing the bridge, pursued the road to Old Harbour Town. She walked up an incline as gradual and pleasant as the lane which had brought her to the river. The hedges on either side stood thick, and the road was sentinelled by trees which, when robed in their foliage, transformed a long space of it into a beautiful avenue. The way took her straight to Lower Street, at the corner of which stood the Swan Tavern, a posting-house with a signboard that swung rustily for the long, dark night. But behind its little lower windows, a glimpse of old-world comfort could be caught. A sanded floor, a dark, polished table ringed with impression of immemorial mugs of ale set down upon it, a little great high perch in a setting of china, an old Dutch clock, and a blackboard with a score. This house contained a room which caused it to be the haunt of the seafaring men of the place. It was in the second story, and was lighted by a large bow window, with a seat running round it from which a fine view of Old Harbour was to be obtained and the spacious sea beyond. Here on a table in the middle of the room were to be found telescopes, newspapers, not older perhaps than a week, little sheaves of matchwood for lighting pipes at the fire in winter, or at a floating oil mesh in summer. This room always contained one or more seafaring men, 
and of a night, if there was a tolerable presence of shipping in the harbour, it was sometimes full, on which occasions it was so heavily loaded with tobacco fumes that one was at some pains to see one's friend through the fog. Here were battles fought over again, and future victories planned and won. Here you heard the arguments running high on the usefulness of certain sails in certain weather, on the best course to adopt when taken by the lee, on the wisest thing to do when chased by an enemy's cruiser. Here were told stories of admirals and captains whose names are shining stars in our national story, yarns of Hawke and Howe and Duncan, Rodney and others. For this room was frequented by several very old men who lived in Old Harbour Town and had served for king, and one of them, like Tom Tuff, had been coxswain to Boscawen. Of this man, a toothless salt whose face was like an old potato, dark with the weather of vanished days and covered with warts, an affecting story was told. It was evening, and the room was full of seafaring men, and this man, whose name was John Halliburton, sat at the table with a long clay pipe trembling in one hand and a glass of hot rum and water in reach of the other. Several songs had been sung by members of the company, and someone, by way of a joke, asked old John to oblige. To the amazement of everybody, the old man put down his pipe, took off his hat, out of which he drew a large red handkerchief, with which he polished his face, and in fixing his lustreless eyes upon the man who had asked him to sing, broke into a song in a strange, quivering, fitful note, as though you should hear a drunken sailor singing in a vault. The assembly was hushed into deep stillness. It was certainly a most unparalleled circumstance for old John to sing, in the middle of the second verse, some old nautical ballad popular fifty years before, he stopped, put his handkerchief into his hat, and his hat upon his head, and resumed his pipe, gazing vacantly at the man who had asked him to sing. "'Pray go on,' said the man. "'We are all delighted, Mr. Halliburton. Have you forgot the words? There's some here, no doubt. As are able to remind ye?' "'Oh, yes,' said a voice. Are ye speaking to me? said old John. Certainly, was the answer. What do ye want? We want you to finish the song ye was just now singing and broke off in. Me? Singing? exclaimed old John. Why, yes, of course. Me singing? quavered old John, with a voice of amazement. Why, I haven't sung this twenty years past. It was easily seen that the poor old man was deeply in earnest, and was to be speedily distressed. It was an affecting exhibition of mental decay, and rough as the company were, they had the good taste to change the subject. Lower Street was not the street in which Lucy shopped. It consisted mainly of little houses with screen doors and bright brass knockers and lozenge windows which opened and shut in the French style so that a small piece of a window could be opened at will. These houses were the dwelling places of pilots, sailors and fishermen belonging to the district. In the middle of the street was a nonconformist chapel with a burial ground spreading out in front of it till its outer confines were halfway upon the footpath. A wonderfully tended resting place, its billows of grass marked in most cases the silent beds of seafarers. The decoration of flower or memorial was largely nautical. The anchor, the Lilliputian bows of a ship as a headpiece, and here and there the headpiece was a gun. Tombstones, whose inscriptions endless discharges of wet and the threatening action of the wind had rendered almost illegible, leaned as though for support in their weariness against the walls of the adjacent houses, so that a few bricks or stones might separate a row of dead men from a little parlour full of cheerful company where the fire crackled briskly, where the oil flame shook in ripples of yellow radiance upon the walls and the ceiling where the atmosphere was good with the perfume of rum punch, and where a manly voice in an interval of silence might be heard singing a nautical ballad 
to the accompaniment of a fiddle. Lucy walked onto High Street, into which she turned, and from nearly every person that she passed, she received a respectful salute or a ducking curtsy, and for all she had a kindly word and a smile as lovely as a fine May day, and sometimes she would stop and speak to a child, on which occasions she generally took a penny from her pocket. This high street was pleasantly furnished with shops, the butchers, the owner of which shouted in talk to his customers as he dexterously chopped on his block, the bakers, with his little bow window choice with buns and cakes and pretty shapes of bread. Here too was the post office, which was like a peddler's tray for a variety of contents. After Lucy had done her shopping, and the few articles were to be delivered punctually that afternoon, she walked along High Street, so as to return by the road she had come by. When her steps had brought her abreast of the swan, she saw two men standing in conversation in the doorway of that old hostelry. They both bowed low to her, but it might have been noticed that after she had saluted them in return, the fine natural glow of her cheeks slightly deepened and her step appreciably quickened. If her object was to escape these men, she must either run, which would not have been seemly, or submit to being overtaken if pursued, which happened in the case of one of them, and within a few minutes a gentleman was walking at her side. "'Good morning, Miss Acton. I am going over to my father's. Are you returned to Old Harbour House? If so, I hope you will allow me to do myself a pleasure of accompanying you as far.' "'No, sir,' she answered. "'I am not returning to Old Harbour House. Not immediately.' I am going to the harbour. I am going for a little walk. How I am always being disappointed, he exclaimed. And she might, by the note in his voice, by a smile which did not show perfect self-control, and by a heated colour of complexion, have by this time suspected that this gentleman and his companion, who was Lieutenant Tupman, had not looked in at the Swan Inn, only to find out what o'clock it was. He was Mr. Walter Lawrence, a son of Admiral Lawrence, and down to a recent period a lieutenant in the Royal Navy. He was something over thirty years of age, but drink, dissipation, the hard life of the sea, and some fever which had got into his blood and proved intermittent had worked in his face like time, and he might have passed for any age between thirty-five and forty-five. Nevertheless, he was an extremely handsome man, of the classic Greek type in liniment, but improved, at least to the British eye, by the Saxon colouring of hair, skin and eyes. His teeth were extraordinarily white, and good for a sailor who had lived on gun-room there in times when the ship's biscuit was flint, and the peas which rolled about in the discoloured hot water called soup, fit only for loading a blunderbuss with to shoot men dead. His eyes told their tale of drink, but they were large and fine and spirited. His light brown hair, according to the fashion of the age, was combed down his back and lay in a rope-shaped tail there. He wore a wide-brimmed round hat, and his attire, a little the worse for wear, consisted of a blue coat, white waistcoat, sage-green kerseymere breeches, and... Needless to say, the cravat was high and full. He stood about six feet, his figure was extremely well proportioned, and in addition to these merits his carriage had the easy elegance which the flow of the billow and the heave of the deck infuse into all human figures not radically vile and deformed. His voice was soft winning and somewhat plaintive and no man whether on or off the stage not even inkledon sang a song with more exquisite feeling and sweeter sincerity of passion his companionship however in spite of his beauty for more reasons than one must prove then as it had proved on other occasions extremely embarrassing to miss acton Shortly after he had obtained his promotion, he arrived home on a visit to his father, and meeting her, fell in love, and offered her marriage. But Lucy had much good sense, which is not often allied with so much beauty as she possessed. Her heart admitted his fascination, 
and she had heard things of him that did him honour. Moreover, he was a member of a profession which she adored, but it had come to her knowledge, by avenues difficult to determine, that he was a gambler, and drank without moderation, and that his theory of life and morals was such as deserves severe condemnation, as it would surely end in provoking heavy punishment. She declined his offer, yet with a maiden's secret fretfulness over the perception that her judgment compelled her into a step against the wishes and sighs of her heart. He went to sea again, and did not return for two years, and when he arrived he came broken to the grief and shame of his father. He had been court-martialed and dismissed his ship. His offence was singular and characteristic. He was in a foreign port, and at nightfall he walked to the quay to return to his ship. He was intoxicated, and on being challenged by a sentry, tumbled the fellow into the water and immediately sprang after him and saved his life. Some, in the face of his gallant career, thought the sentence too severe. Others regarded it as lenient. His own view of it, he betokened by conceiving a bitter hatred against the service and by resigning his commission. He returned to England and went to his father ostensibly to seek a berth ashore, but for many months past he had been hanging about Old Harbour Town, an idler and a tippler, and handsome as he was, and brilliant as had been his short naval story, he was not the man to commend himself to Lucy Acton as a husband, whatever may have been her secret feelings in regard to his person and some points of his character. How, he exclaimed, I am always being disappointed. If you turn off at the bridge, I shall not be allowed more than ten minutes' talk with you. I shall turn off at the bridge, she answered. It is not long since that I was with your father. I left him in conversation with Captain Acton at Old Harbour House. I believe I heard your name mentioned as I passed away from them. What would they have to say about me? he exclaimed, with a rather unmeaning smile. I can believe that Sir William grows weary of my presence, and that he sometimes wishes me at the bottom of the sea. "'Tis a pity that he did so ill in prize money. "'He was born to no fortune, and married a moneyless lady, "'and here is my father, an admiral in the British Navy, "'obliged to dwell in a cottage fit only to make a dwelling-house for a poet, "'whose calling is, I believe, the poorest paid of any. "'I am much troubled,' he continued in a maudlin way, "'to think that I should continue to be a burthen upon the old gentleman.' But I assure you on my honour, madam, if I am not independent of him this moment, tis not because I have not been as diligent as old Nick himself in looking about me. But go where I will, and ask where I will, the door is shut, the place is full, the answer is nay. What a sweet little dog is that! How happy to be forever frisking about you, and often lifted and caressed! Here he sighed so loudly that she could not fail to hear him, and looked at her a little while with a somewhat tipsy steadfastness. "'There should be plenty to be done,' said she. "'There is the army. The army!' he cried. "'Could you put a greater indignity upon a sailor than to compel him to shoulder handspike and march up and down as though he were a soldier?' She fell a laughing at his sottish indignation, but quickly recollected herself. He burst into a loud guffaw when he saw that he had amused her, and said, I was just now with Tupman. I wish I had his berth. Here he looked behind him to see if the lieutenant was following, but, as a matter of fact, Tupman had re-entered the swan. He is stationed here to guard us against being invaded by the French which he provides for so carefully by lying abed until ten in the morning, then sulking over his breakfast of ale, new bread and tobacco, then doing some work in his bit of garden, he is a great lover of vegetables, then lurching up to Old Harbour Town, where, of an afternoon, he may commonly be found sitting over a pot, reading the newspaper and yarning with any man that will take a chair over against him, 
that I protest, when I met him at the Swan, not an hour gone by he had not heard that a French privateersman had been chased ashore by one of our frigates last evening, and burnt after ten thousand pounds had been taken out of her. I think if the French intend to invade us, they will not be stopped by Mr. Tupman and his brig. He thinks highly of his brig, though, says to me a day or two ago. I wish an enemy's cruiser would look in. She will not know that the saucy is lying here. I believe I could make my carronades talk to her, and it will please me to see the pier and the shore dark with figures whilst I was towing my capture into Ode Harbour. I doubt if he would rise out of bed to give an order to chase even a suspicious sail hub in sight. Here we are coming to the bridge, and you are going for a walk to the pier. Will you pluck me a daisy before you go? See, there are several monks for grass just there. I have nothing to remember you by. I will wrap it in silver paper, and it shall be the only sacred thing I possess. Oh, no, sir. You can do without a daisy from me, she answered, though her cheeks were warm with one of those sudden blushes which seemed to glow as though to prove that her lovely bloom was entirely due to nature and not to art, as the suspicious eye might fancy or the cynical eye desire. You will deny me even a daisy, he cried, with a sudden passion in his manner which alarmed her as he was not sober. He sprang to the side of the road, and picking a daisy returned to her, pulled off his hat, and said earnestly, indeed, in a voice of emotion and sincerity that put a fine and appealing meaning into the expression of his eyes, which by the power of the impulse then governing him was superior to the drink in his head. Let me entreat you, madam, to put this little flower to your sweet lips, and return it to me. It is but a trifle, I ask. You are too good and generous to refuse me. She took the flower, put it to her lips, and handed it to him. His passion for her was very visible as he received the flower with his eyes fixed upon her face. He gave her a low bow and then put on his hat, and going to the hedge, pulled a leaf in which he wrapped the daisy, and carefully placed both in his waistcoat pocket. To prove my sincerity, madam, said he, I could wish that the possession of this little flower might depend upon the result of a conflict between yonder brig with your humble obedient servant in command of her and the biggest corvette the Frenchman has afloat. Why, sir, do not you think that a great deal of nonsense is talked by young men and old men to young women? But I believe your father will be glad to see you. I may have a reason to suppose he is waiting for you to return. Here we part, Mr. Lawrence, and I wish you a good morning. And, sinking her figure in a curtsy fashionable in those days, she crossed the road and went down the little flight of wooden steps that led to the path by the river's bank and so to Old Harbour. She had not intended to take this walk, at Old Harbour House, dinner was served at two o'clock, and if she was not punctual, Aunt Caroline would grow alarmed and probably send the coachman on horseback in search of her. But it was only just noon, and there was time enough for her to arrive home at the dinner hour, and also to make this little diversion to escape Mr. Lawrence, who, she suspected, would have forced his company upon her even in this further walk has she not excited his curiosity by saying that his father was waiting to see him. He was not too far gone in liquor to understand that something of significance to him lay in her reference to Sir William, and when presently she was upon the riverside footpath and took a cautious peep over her shoulder, she observed him through the trees mounting the lane and walking somewhat fast. It is a very great pity she thought to herself, that so handsome a young man, and one so spirited and daring, as he has proved, should abandon himself to his vicious tastes. The longer he remains here, the more sottish he will become, and the lower will his manhood sink till he will be at no pains to relieve his father from the obligation of supporting or helping him, and the gallant creature who, if he took the right path, 
would march easily to fame and dignity and affluence must end as a drunken trembling degraded wretch the object of pity or scorn and who has pity for such people the beautiful girl sighed she had no intention of crossing the river by the ferry to gain the pier when mr lawrence had advanced well ahead she intended to resume the road he was taking and go home her mind however was occupied by him and yonder lying at the wharves was the minorca of which she understood he was to receive a command she walked towards the vessel she supplied an object for the little excursion and the walk would give mr lawrence time enough to put the necessary distance between them the river widened rapidly when it passed under the bridge the smooth water at the mouth of it reflected the chequered band of the saucy brig of war two or three smacks were hoisting their coloured canvas and sailing out to sea on either hand the banks of the ravine sloped well dressed in shrubs and wood and here and there stood a little house some small boats lay in black specks away out between the two heads fishing business was not very brisk in the harbour just then and the wharves were quiet they were free each of well-pitched timber long enough to supply berth stem and stern to two or three small vessels apiece they were backed by a row of warehouses some of which were captain acton's and in these were stowed the rum sugar and tobacco which his two ships brought from the west indies End of chapter 2chapter three of the yarn of old harbour town this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the yarn of old harbour town by william clark russell chapter three the offer the small amount of work in the shape of discharging and receiving cargo which was being done on the wharves of old harbour had come to a pause when the labourers dinner hour struck and but three or four figures were visible upon the tar black platforms along which the little ships were moored of these one was a brig and the other a schooner and one was the minorca a handsome coppered bark of five hundred tons built by the french and as we have heard taken from that people the sails of these vessels had been furled and the bright april breeze blowing from the sea sang in their clean rigging a couple of planks communicated between the minorca's gangway and the wharf and at the wharf end of these planks stood a man of a seafaring aspect apparently belonging to the bark as lucy advanced holding her dog lest the creature should skip in a fit of excitement into the water the man viewed her as though on catching her eye or receiving the encouragement of a look of recognition he was prepared to salute her perhaps she did not heed him but on drawing close to the vessel she looked at him and thanks to that gracious gift which by creating opportunities for tact helps more to render the individual beloved or popular than perhaps any other quality she immediately recollected the man and not only the man but his name as mr john eagle mate of the minorca who when the vessel was last in harbour and she had gone on board of her with her father had been introduced to her by captain acton he was a man of rough appearance whose hand had been in the tar bucket for most of his life a hard reserved man shy so ignorant that he read with difficulty and wrote his name as painfully as a hand tortured with gout inscribes with the pen how do you do mr eagle exclaimed lucy he stiffened himself and saluted her by a flourish of his hand to his brow and answered just about middling thank you miss i am sorry you are not better than middling she said it's for rheumatics it's got into my feet and my shoulders it's a pain as no spirits can stand up against are you doing anything to ease your suffering i drinks a drop of rum when it comes on very bad i've given up rubbing 
I've been rubbed till I've scarce got any skin left. I'll speak to Miss Acton. I am sure she will have something that is good for rheumatism, and if she has, I will send it to you. I thank you, miss, said he, with an incredulous smile. Was you going on board? No. What a big ship she looks compared with the other two. It is difficult to think of her alone in the middle of the sea. I can only imagine her lying at a wharf with protecting hills on each side. Does she sail fast? Give her a good breeze and she can find her legs, but she ain't to be compared with the uh, Aurora. She will be arriving shortly, I think. Do any day, miss, unless she's been nabbed, but the vessel that's going to take the Aurora will want more than wings. When does the Menorca sail? Early next month, I believe, ma'am. Her eyes repose thoughtfully upon the hull of the ship, mounting presently in a stealing way to the heights, and her colour seemed to deepen slightly to the impulse of a romantic mood or fancy. If there was nothing to fear from the enemy's ships, she said, and if the sea was always calm and the breeze gentle and mild, I believe I might wish to make a voyage in the Menorca to the West Indies. You'd be taking all care of, ma'am. But the sleeping berths are very little, and I am certain that's the motion of the ship. She shook her head and smiled, and then saying, Good morning, Mr. Eagle. If my aunt has a remedy for the rheumatism, I will send it to you. She returned the way she had come, mounted the steps, gained the bridge, and proceeded home. Meanwhile, Mr. Lawrence had gone about three quarters of a mile and was now approaching his father's home. The Admiral's cottage was in a lane off the main road. It was such an umbrageous retreat as Cowper, had he been in earnest, would have hastened to when he sighed for some boundless contiguity of shade. It stood in a little land protected by hedges and walls full of orchards. The Admiral lived in the heart of groves of cherry, plum, apple, pear, and other fruitful trees, which presently, in this month of April, would make the scene round about as beautiful as driven snow shone upon by the sun with almond-white flowers. The Admiral missed the sea. He was near it, nay, in heavy weather within sound of it, but not a glimpse of the blue deep could be caught through the windows. He had retired on a pension, and on trifling private means which rendered this retreat the fittest he could have chosen for the convenience of his purse and for the simple taste of his life. Here he lived with an old servant and a young girl, and now with his son, but he was always hoping that this last obligation would not be continuous, though the prospect of getting anything to do in such an obscure corner of the earth as Old Harbour Town was as remote as the possibility of Mr Lawrence ever becoming Prime Minister of England. Yet a secret hope, an indeterminable dream, one of those imaginations which make blessed the possessors of a sanguine temperament, buoyed the Admiral. Who could tell? Something might happen. Walter might fall in with a man who should prove a friend, even in that very haunt, the swan, which seemed obnoxious to his interests. Thus, the old fellow would reason without logic, or even knowing what he was talking to himself about. His mind was full of his son as he sat down this day at his dinner, which was put every afternoon punctually at half-past one upon the table whether Mr Lawrence was at home or whether he was not. The window at which the Admiral was wont of a pleasant evening to sit with his pipe was open. The room was small, with a low ceiling, but one should say a very dream of comfort to a nautical man. Its walls were embellished with pictures of sea fights, of frigates engaging forts, of encounters between line-of-battle ships, a handsome telescope, a gift for some deed of valour, lay in the brackets over the small, richly carved sideboard. The Admiral sat at table before a meal that betokened total neglect on his part of all thought of digestion. The dinner, in short, so far as it had been served, consisted of a round of boiled beef, 
carrots and turnips and a dish of potatoes smoking in their jackets, a stout loaf of black crust, a dish of fine yellow butter, and at Sir William's elbow was a silver mug with a thick glass bottom, just filled foaming to the brim from a cask of the very best ale at that time brewed in England, and in those days a glass of fine ale was a more delicious draught, more first quenching, more appealing to all the secrets of the interior than the finest liquor that has been drunk since, call it what you will, just as the admiral was cutting a second helping for himself from the round of beef, which being English was choicely tasted he heard his son's footsteps in the passage outside and after a short interval during which mr lawrence fitted himself for the dinner-table that gentleman walked in he was almost immediately followed by the housekeeper with hot plates she was very fond of mr lawrence she would listen for his footsteps he was still master walter with her and would remain so she had once on hearing of his money troubles offered to lend him from her slender savings but whatever may have been his character he was a sailor in this he would not take money from a woman the admiral viewed his son critically the walk home followed by a sousing of the face in cold water had helped to attenuate the lingering fumes in the young man's brains and on the whole his mind was about as steady as could be expected in one who was always more or less under the influence of drink have you dined asked sir william no sir this question would not appear strange when it is understood that mr lawrence occasionally took a seat as an ordinary at the swan served half an hour after noon the admiral cut a plate of meat and the pair fell to their dinner the housekeeper appearing to place such another silver tankard foaming full as grace sir william's elbow at the side of mr lawrence i met miss acton as i was coming home said mr lawrence and she said she had left you and her father talking about me captain acton and i were talking about you this morning said the admiral i was lamenting your inability to procure a berth of any sort and told him that i could see no hope for you while you continue to hang about old harbour town and to lounge in and out of the swan you'll admit sir that my failure to obtain employment has not been due to neglect in searching for it but what is to be hoped for in a place like this here are no industries there is nothing doing you cannot turn smacksman or start as a pilot i am extremely anxious to relieve you of the burden of maintaining me and my fixed intention if i can procure nothing to do between this and next month is to work my passage out before the mast of the united states if it should come to the backwards i am ready i confess this life grows insupportable and the more burdensome to me because it is a tax upon you sir the admiral buried half his face in his tankard and after wiping the froth from his lips and looking earnestly at the round of beef as though he deliberated within himself whether he should take another slice he said i am happy to say that i have good news for you an opportunity has been offered which will do away with the need of your shipping before the mast and seeking your fortune in america the minorca as you doubtless know is in want of a captain i was speaking about you to captain acton this morning and regretting as i must continue to regret whilst i have the capacity of a sigh i do not say a tear left in me that you should relinquish the service in which had you behaved with prudence you were eminently calculated to make a shining figure the gallant old officer paused and looked at his son and any one could have easily seen that he was equally moved by pain and pride indeed the man who sat opposite him was one who by manly beauty of face worn as it was by weather and excess by vigorous bearing of shapely person and by a story which brief as it was was as full of the stars of gallant deeds as a short scope of wake is alive with the brilliant pulses of the sea glow was one let it be repeated whom 
many a father's heart would rejoice in and approve of as it must deplore those lamentable if fashionable weaknesses gambling and a love of what dibden calls the flowing can mr lawrence had closed his knife and fork and swallowed half his tankard of ale when the admiral halted in his speech he regarded his father with eager earnestness but the admiral was not to be interrupted in his further disclosure having ascertained that his son wished for no more beef he went to the fireplace and pulled a bell rope and it was not until the housekeeper had removed the joint and vegetables and replaced them by a dish of norfolk dumplings with white sauce sweetened and branded a homely dish of which sir william was uncommonly fond that the old gentleman proceeded i may now tell you said he that captain acton this morning on my expression my regret that you could not obtain employment most handsomely and liberally made you the offer of the command of a ship the minorca mr lawrence's face lighted up but the expression was curious it was composite it seemed to be lacking in the elementary quality of exultation or rejoicing which naturally would have been sought for or expected he is very kind said he i should like the berth he proposes that you should take the vessel out to the west indies and bring her home he pays twelve pounds a month and gives a commission on the earnings of the ship what do you say why sir of course i accept without hesitation and feel most deeply obliged it is a step continued the admiral that may lead to other and even better things but first and foremost it finds you in employment and will put some money into your pocket and will leave the pressure which not only you but i am made to feel i do not choose that mr greyquill should visit me yet he calls to inquire after you he is a very impertinent old man and why he should call here to see me when he knows that every day i am within a stone's throw of his office i cannot tell he'll get his head broke if he troubles you sir captain acton wishes to see you at eight o'clock this evening you'll be there oh depend upon it this is a great offer he is extremely obliging and i must hope said the admiral since this opportunity has been brought about by me that you will do me the justice to take care to present yourself in such a state i shall not excite his resentment or which is worse result in the cancellation of his offer the old gentleman spoke with sternness and held his eyes fastened upon his son who cried oh sir i am not such a fool as to run any risk with this stroke of fortune you will present yourself at eight said the admiral a little more softly and i have no doubt whatever that you will receive the offer which will be properly executed to-morrow i believe that the minorca sails early next month you will have time to obtain the few clothes you may require the dress of the merchant sailor is inexpensive indeed a man in the merchant service dresses as he pleases it is a warm voyage and you'll find a few white clothes useful i do not suppose you'll be expected to know anything about stowage and the like but you will pick up what you want as you go captain acton spoke of the mate as a respectable though illiterate man he doubtless understands his part and little more will be expected from you than the navigation of the ship to her port a careful attention to your owner's interest and a strict execution of such commands as you may receive with regard to obtaining a freight and matters of that sort of which i confess i am ignorant sir william now rose from the table and went to an armchair at the open window upon the seat or ledge of which stood a jar of tobacco some clay pipes and a little machine for firing a match dipped in brimstone a very ingenious contrivance as old as the days of the second charles namely a little pistol-shaped fire-maker whose trigger struck a full and brilliant spark from the flint and kindled the tinder he filled his pipe and lighted it and sat in conversation with his son in whom the particular humour or mood would have been extremely hard to settle by the most sagacious of critical observers he was speedy in answering his father and his language did not show much abstraction of mind 
but even the admiral noticed that there was an undercurrent of thought in his son which was pursuing a very different course from the stream as it appeared on the surface sir william however was a man not in the habit of taking long or deep views his son was thinking of his good luck of his meeting that evening with captain acton of the opportunities for advancement which now lay before him and these reflections would naturally colour his manner and make him appear somewhat strange to those who knew him best captain acton received mr lawrence in his library a small but very elegant room it was lighted by wax candles on the table and wax candles on the chimney-piece its walls were covered with valuable books in finely carved cases. Captain Acton was reading when Mr. Lawrence was announced. He immediately put down his book and rose. It would have been easy to see that he was struck by and pleased with the fine figure and handsome face of Mr. Lawrence as he strode through the doorway, bowing with dignity and grace as he advanced. Of course, the captain was perfectly well acquainted with Mr. Lawrence. He had been to his house to dinner on more than one occasion with Sir William. They had met at the Admiral's house and out of doors. Yet Captain Acton appeared to find in Mr. Lawrence this evening a quality of bearing, a character of masculine beauty which had not certainly before impressed him to anything like the same degree. He had carefully dressed himself. His manner betokened complete self-possession. His handsome eye shone clear and steady and his face exhibited a mind whose command over itself was complete. The worn look, partly due to dissipation, partly due to the hard life of the sea, which was often injuriously visible by daylight, was now concealed in the soft veil of light shed by the wax candles. They shook hands and seated themselves. "'Your father has doubtless acquainted you with my object in asking you to call upon me this evening?' "'He has, sir.' Are you willing to accept the command of the Minorca? I am indeed, and have no words in which to convey my thanks to you for your kindness. Oh, say no more, sir, about that. I am pleased with the idea of a naval officer being in charge of my ship. And here Captain Acton again viewed the face and form of the young man with a pleasure and satisfaction the other could scarcely miss, though it was delicately tempered by Acton's natural gravity and his well-bred air. And now for a short time the conversation wholly referred to the business part of the compact. Captain Acton named the terms, stated the nature of the voyage, and his expectations, spoke of the cargo and the consignees, and of his agent at Kingston. Mr Lawrence listened with intelligence, and the questions which he put were all to the point. The rig of the vessel, said Captain Acton, is unusual. She is called a bark. The idea of fore and aft canvas only upon the mizzen mast is French. I am told that rig is very handy in stays. Do you know the ship, sir? I was never on board of her, but I know her very well. I admire her figure, though I do not think she is so finely moulded as your schooner, the Aurora. Oh, certainly not. And as a consequence, the Aurora sails two feet to the Menorca's one. That schooner is almost due. She is commonly very punctual. She earns more money than the Menorca. No doubt all will have been well with her until she enters the chops, but the Western squadrons have done great work. They have swept the French corsairs off the narrow waters and huddled the lily-livered rogues into their own ports. The Menorca is lightly armed, for eighteen-pounder carronades, for her business is to run and not to chase. You'll have to keep a bright lookout, sir. Your business must be to give your heels to everything that stirs your suspicion. I assure you, sir, said Mr. Lawrence with a smile which added a freshness to his beauty by that light, that I have no idea of taking command of your ship with a view to a French prison. After some further conversation to this effect, during which it was manifest that Captain Acton was very well satisfied with the generous resolution he had formed that morning to offer the command of the Menorca to Sir William's son, he left his chair and conducted Mr. Lawrence to the drawing-room. Wax candles burning purely and softly in sconces and candelabra illuminated an interior of singular elegance and rich in luxury. Lucy started from the piano the sounds of which had been audible outside before the gentleman opened the door. Her beauty, 
Her costume were in exquisite keeping with the objects which filled that room. The repository of the tasteful and sumptuous selections of several generations of actons. Lucy's garb was the picturesque attire of that age. The neck and a portion of the bosom were exposed, a handsome medallion brooch decorated the bust, the arms were bare to above the elbows, the girdle gave her gown a waist just under the bosom. In that light, all that was tender and lovely in her gained in softness, sweetness and delicacy. Her rich bloom had the divine tenderness of the flush of sunset, when, in the east, the velvet deeps are enriched with the diamond throb of the first of the stars. Not far from the large, old-fashioned hearth, beside a little table on which stood a work-basket, sat in a tall-backed armchair fit for a queen to be crowned in, a figure that must have carried the memory of a middle-aged or old man of that time well back into the past century. She was Miss Acton, Lucy's Aunt Caroline, sister of Captain Acton, a lady of about seventy years of age, who trembled with benevolence and imaginary alarms, who was always doing somebody good, and was now at work upon some baby clothing for an infant that had been born a week or two before. She belonged to a race whose extinction Francis Groves lamented. She was what was termed an antiquated gentlewoman, whose dress was a survival of the fashion of two, if not three, earlier generations, consisting of a stiff starched cap and hood, a little hoop, and a rich silk damask gown with large flowers. She acted as a housekeeper to her brother, and the keys of the cupboards jingled at her side. She was choice in her stores, which included cordial waters, cherry and raspberry brandy, Daffy's elixir, pots of currant jelly and raspberry jam, and her stock also comprised salves, electuaries, and purges for the poor. When she walked, she leaned, perhaps a little affectedly, on an ivory-handled crutch stick, and a fat pug-dog rolled in her wake. This pug now snored alongside of her, and the little terrier slept with its paws upon the pug's stomach. Mr. Lawrence was extremely easy. There was nothing of the embarrassment in the presence of ladies, which is often visible even in well-bred men who have fallen from their estate, and pass their days in liquor, and in looking in and out of such haunts as the swan. Indeed, his well-governed behaviour had something of a predetermined air, as of a man who acts a part, and with all the resolution of his soul means to carry it through, though he may be obstructed by physical pain or by mental distress. After a few airy nothings of salutation, and the like had been exchanged and all were seated, Captain Acton said, Lucy, I am now to introduce Mr. Lawrence to you in a new character. He is the captain of the Menorca. What is it that you say? cried Aunt Caroline, starting in her chair and peering over her gold-rimmed glasses at Mr. Lawrence. I have given Mr. Lawrence the command of my ship, sister, said Captain Acton. The news does not surprise me, said Lucy. I think I told you this morning, sir, that Sir William wished to see you. Do you like the idea of commanding the Menorca? Very much indeed, madam. My inclination leads wholly towards the merchant service. I would rather command the Menorca than a line of battleship. He smiled faintly, as though he guessed she would not believe this and she could not miss the expression of bitterness in his smile, which, as she was well acquainted with the story of his career, she perfectly understood. In truth, she felt a little grieved for him. It was pitiful to think of so handsome and gallant a young fellow descending from the lofty platform of the king's service to take charge of a poor little merchant vessel, whose one officer, a mate, was as ignorant and common a fellow as any that could be found in between decks of a man of war, remote from the society of the ward and gun rooms, though on board the Menorca, Mr. Eagle would be Mr. Lawrence's associate. Are you not afraid to take the command of a ship, sir? inquired Miss Acton, who continued to peer at Mr. Lawrence over her glasses. Afraid, madam? Afraid, sister? echoed Captain Acton. Your question reminds me of a story of Lord Howe, a lieutenant having reported the ship on fire returned, and said that his lordship need not feel afraid as the fire was out. Afraid? 
exclaimed Howe. How does a man feel when he is afraid? I need not ask how he looks. It is a very serious undertaking, said Miss Acton. I cannot imagine a more responsible position than that of a captain of a ship. If she sinks or is consumed by fire or strikes upon the rocks and the people perish, the captain, whether he survives or not, is answerable. If he dies with the people, he goes before God, who judges him. It is dreadful. If I commanded a ship and lost lives, I could never sleep. I should not know what to do for seeing the spirits of the dead. I should feel that they all look to me to return them their lives. And how terrible it must be to feel helpless when you are pleaded to by spirits who wring their hands and wail. Mr. Lawrence viewed the old lady with silent astonishment. If all forts like you, aren't, said Lucy, we should get no captains at all for our ships, and how delighted the French would be to learn that our men of war could not leave port because captains were not to be got. She received a smile for the perception of her point from Mr. Lawrence. Well, I did not think of it that way, said Miss Acton, who was active again with her needle and talking at her work. Of course, we must have captains for our men of war. I hope there is no fresh news of invasion. Nothing more since the privateers man was run in, said Captain Acton. Oh, aunt, whilst I think of it, cried Lucy. Poor Mr. Eagle, the mate of the Menorca, is suffering badly from rheumatism in his ankles. He could hardly stand. I told him that I would ask you to send him something to ease him. I'm sure I do not know what is good for rheumatism, said Miss Acton with a petulance that attends a sudden anxiety of benevolence. It is a most troublesome disease. You may rub and rub, and you only make it fly to another place, and often rubbing takes the skin off. I will send him some sulphur to put in his stockings, and I will see what else there is to be done for the poor man. And here, looking over her glasses again at Mr. Lawrence, she said, Pray, can you tell me how Mrs. Big is, sir? Mrs. Big, ma'am, I never heard of her. She lives at Uphill Cottage, and lay in of a very fine baby a fortnight yesterday, and has done very poorly since. You cannot tell me how she does? I cannot, madam. At this moment the door was opened, and the butler entered with a large sparkling silver tray of refreshments, wines and spirits, and cakes of several kinds. But Mr. Lawrence would take nothing. He had done very well, he said. He had supped handsomely with his father of a round of cold boiled beef. The hospitality of the tray was not pressed upon him. Miss Lucy took some wine and water, and a small draught of cordial waters was placed beside Miss Acton. "'Your father was telling me a few days ago,' said Captain Acton, "'of a narrow escape of yours, sir.' "'I have met with several. To which did he refer?' "'To that of the punt in which you attempted to sail from Plymouth to Falmouth.' Mr. Lawrence smiled. When his smile was dictated by some honest or candid emotion, free from irritation or contempt, or any of the passions which make merriment forced and alarming, the expression gave a particular pleasure to the beholder. It was full of heart, and seemed to lighten his beauty of much of its burden of wear and tear. "'What was the story, sir?' asked Lucy. A story of foolhardiness, madam, largely due to my difficulty in foreseeing issues. The remark appeared to impress Captain Acton, who fastened his eyes upon the speaker. I had made up my mind to go from Plymouth to Falmouth in a small punt. She was fourteen feet long. When I had got some distance away, my hat was blown overboard. I secured the tiller a lee, threw off my clothes, and jumped after my hat. As I was returning with the hat, the sail filled. The boat got way on her and sailed some distance before she came up in the wind. I had almost reached her when she filled again. This happened three or four times. At length I managed by a frantic struggle to catch a hold of the rudder. But I was so exhausted that it was long before I had strength to get into the boat. This tale induced Captain Acton to indulge in the recital of a hairbreadth escape of his own, but a flow of exciting anecdotes was arrested by Miss Acton declaring that she was not strong enough to bear to hear such horrid, moving stories, particularly just a little before bedtime. Lucy was somewhat puzzled by Mr. Lawrence. 
His behaviour was cool, gentlemanlike, distant, cautious, entirely sober, and for the most part, he expressed himself with a high degree of intelligence. She could not but remember that in the morning when, to be sure, he might be said to have been flown with wine and insolence, he had, with a passion which assuredly borrowed nothing of heat from liquor, plucked a daisy and bade her put it to her sweet lips and return it to him, and he had then concealed the little flower in his pocket as the only sacred treasure he possessed. This evening his bearing was on the whole as formal and collected as though she was but an acquaintance in whose company he could sit without being overcome by her charms. The passion of the morning was genuine and sincere, drink or no drink. The behaviour this evening was calculated and extraordinary. Perhaps in the delicate candlelight she might not catch every expression of eye, every movement of mouth, every shade of change in the expression of the whole face, so that she would justly imagine she had missed through defective illumination the impassioned look, the swift pencilling by a rapture of the liniments, which her maiden's intuition gave her eloquently and convincingly to know must be the secret homage of his heart. Let him mask his handsome and worn face as he would. I wish, madam, said he, that you would return to the piano at which we interrupted you. Papa will not thank me for making a noise. Oh, my dear, don't say that. I am quite sure that if you will play, Mr. Lawrence will afterwards sing, and I shall be charmed to hear you, sir, for I recollect your sweet and powerful voice both here and at your father's. There is little that I would not do to oblige you, sir answered Mr. Lawrence, and going to the piano he stood beside it, as though waiting for Lucy to seat herself at the instrument. "'Lucy, my dear,' exclaimed Miss Acton, "'play now goody please to moderate, or my lodging is on the cold ground, or Sally in our alley. I do not care which. They are all very beautiful, and I know no song, brother, that carries me back like Sally in our alley. Do you remember how finely our father used to sing it? "'He was at Dr. Burney's one night, sir,' said she, talking to Mr. Lawrence, "'when a famous Italian singer of that day. "'Who was it now? "'She was as yellow as a guinea, and her hoops were so large "'there were many doors she could not pass through. "'Who was it now? "'But no matter. "'After my father had sung, she stepped over to him, "'and cursing as though she would sit before him, she said, "'I have often heard this song sung, and thought nothing of it.' But now, sir, I shall ever regard it as the loveliest composition in English music. I, father had a very fine voice, to be sure, said Captain Acton, and so has Mr. Lawrence. Lucy had now taken her seat at the piano, and as the airs her aunt desired were well known to her, she played them from ear, while Miss Acton, in her stiff back chair, kept time with much facial demonstration of enjoyment, with her starched cap and hood. "'Will you now sing us a song, Mr. Lawrence?' exclaimed Captain Acton. "'With the greatest pleasure, what should it be?' As Miss Acton loved Sally in our alley, he would be happy to sing it. Lucy touched the keys. End of chapter three. Chapter four of The Yarn of Old Harbour Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbour Town by William Clark Russell Chapter 4 The Aurora Next morning, after Captain Acton had read prayers, he stepped onto the lawn to take the air for half an hour before breakfast and was immediately followed by Lucy who had hardly reached his side when Miss Acton appeared on the hall steps and carefully descended the broad flight, leaning on her crutch cane and followed by her pug. It was a charming spring morning, warm as June and brilliant as a diamond. The sea was white with the light of the sun, and the radiance of the water clarified the sky into a tender azure, along which floated a number of little mother-of-pearl clouds, brushed by a breeze which kept sea and land in motion, with a feathering of ripples and the dance of shadows. "'I cannot think of anything but sulphur for poor Mr. Eagle's feet,' said Miss Acton, as she approached father and daughter. "'I will give you a packet for him after breakfast.' 
Is not this a morning to lift up one's heart in rejoicing? How fair is this prospect? How tender and promising this scene of garden! How quiet the old town looks upon the hill! The heart swells in gratitude to God on such a morning as this. Very true, sister, said Captain Acton, and I hope we are all grateful. I am sure I am. I was very well pleased with our friend Mr. Lawrence last night. I witnessed nothing in him that I could have wished not to see. I do not know that I have ever met a more gentlemanlike man. He holds himself very well. He has a fine figure. And I like his type of good looks. It is manly. The face is a little weather-worn, perhaps. Tis a pity he cannot command his appetites, said Miss Acton. How would my heart bleed if he were my son? Poor dear Sir William, with that Christian fortitude has he resigned himself to the wretchedness of seeing his son out of the navy and squandering his precious time in drinking with Lieutenant Tapman. He can control himself, said Captain Acton. Did you observe, Lucy, that he refused all refreshments last night? Now, a man who is radically and incurably a sot cannot view a decanter of anything to drink, and the stronger the worse without thirsting for it. And did ever such a man say no to an invitation to drink with the liquor standing up in a bottle in front of him? I am sure he is a man of resolution, said Lucy. I never look at him without seeming to see why it is he should be so gallant and desperate a fighter at sea. He has a cast of a face that is very uncommon, full of power of thought, and the shape of his head is like that Greek bust in the library. How is it that a man with his spirit is unable to deny himself what he knows must speedily bring him to ruin? It is not only drink said Miss Acton. They tell me he's accustomed to bet very heavily. He will mend. He shall have a chance, said Captain Acton cheerily. I love his old father, and I am strongly disposed to like his son, and I am an ill judge of human nature if I am wrong in predicting that the command I have given him will lead to his reformation. I have ever found it true that the way to make a man honest is to let him understand that you have called your faith in his good intentions. He must be a black-hearted rogue beyond hope, who disappoints the high and reassuring expectations you give him to know you have formed of him. Mr. Lawrence has a beautiful voice, said Lucy. How touchingly he sang Tom Bolin. I could love him for his way of singing Sally in our alley said Miss Acton, but the song in his mouth has not the moving sweetness Papa gave it. At this moment, Captain Acton cried out, halting as he uttered the words with his eyes fixed in the direction of Old Harbour. Bless my soul, what can have happened? Is that the French flotilla in sight? The French flotilla? exclaimed Miss Acton. In sight, do you say? What can be the meaning of it? said Captain Acton. What do you see? The French flotilla, cried Miss Acton, in a voice tremulous with agitation. She darted her eyes through her glasses over the sea. If the French flotilla is not in sight, said Captain Acton, what can be the intention of Mr. Tupman rising at this very early hour and getting his brig under way? For certainly the saucy is making a start for something or somewhere. Do you see her sheeting home her canvas, Lucy? She is going out for a little cruise, no doubt said Lucy. I quite agree, but it is so unusual for Tupman to be out of bed at this hour that we cannot but think that something very important and dangerous has called him from his moorings. No, sister, the flat bottom boats are not in sight yet, and I suspect we shall have to go on staring for many a week and many a month, if not for ever, before we sight them coming along in a show with a little cock-hatted usurper his arms folded upon his breast, watching the van from the hindmost, for he is one of those mighty conquerors who are very careful of their own precious carcasses. It was as Captain Acton said, the saucy brig of war was getting under way, and it might be safely concluded for no other purpose than to exercise the crew by an offshore trip. Captain Acton and the two ladies stood watching the little toy figure away down in the river's mouth. Sail was made with man-of-war dispatch. 
all the clues were sheeted home together the yards at the same time mounting so that all at once it seemed the little vessel broke into a broad bright shapely glare of canvas slightly leaning from the breeze as she softly crept round and pointed her bowsprit seaward and whitening the water under her with the power of a floating body of radiance well done tupman cried captain acton who watched the manoeuvre with a sailor's interest sluggard as you are you have your little ship and her people well in hand i wonder if there's a foreigner afloat that could have made sail with the dispatch that brig exhibited the little leaning vessel diminished by the distance from which she was surveyed into a size fit only to be manned by Lilliputian sailors, crept like a small white cloud along the placid water of Old Harbour, and rounding the pier, hauled the wind for a south-westerly course. They watched her as she streamed onwards with a sparkle as pretty as a rainbow out to her forefoot, and a short scope of trembling luster astern as though she towed a length of satin. A few minutes before she disappeared from the sight of those who viewed her from the lawn of Old Harbour House, past the bluff or round of cliff on which stood the dropsical old lighthouse, she dipped her flag manifestly in response to a hidden salutation, and scarcely had she vanished when there stole out from the edge of the cliff round which she had gone the slanting figure of a large three-masted schooner with the English ensign at her peak. She was steering directly for her Old Harbour, Though she had evidently come a long journey, she made upon those silver-white rippling waters a far handsomer figure than the brig. She was clothed from truck to waterway with sails which reflected the light of the morning with something of the splendour of polished metal. Her hull was black, but she was inclined sufficiently by the breeze to reveal a narrow breadth of copper sheathing, which sprang pulses of wet dazzling light upon the eye in keen flashes like gunfire the aurora cried captain acton how nobly she sits how her sharp bows eat into it does she not come along handsomely what a slaver she would make nothing flying the british flag could catch her i did not conceive her due before next wednesday she has not been nabbed this voyage at all events oh she floats in like a swan said miss acton a most unfortunate image, sister, <laughs> rejoined the captain, laughing. For a swan's white book sits low upon the water, whilst yonder beauty is all airy, cloud-like height. The breakfast bell at this moment summoned them from the lawn. At table, Captain Acton said that he had asked Mr. Lawrence to meet him at his office down on the quay at half-past ten. This office was in a little house a few minutes' walk from the warehouses, Captain Acton employed a person who looked after his affairs, who, with the assistance of a couple of clerks, saw to the delivery and loading of cargoes, to the needs of the ships in respect of gear, canvas, carpenters and bosun stores, and so forth. But not the less did a gallant captain take an interest in his own business. He was laudably anxious to promote the prosperity of Old Harbour and Old Harbour Town, but though he was a rich man, a very rich man indeed in those days, having come into a fortune of eighty thousand pounds, together with the finely wooded and beautiful freehold estate known as Old Harbour House, he was by no means disposed to lose money in marine speculation, so he kept a keen eye upon the books, examined narrowly all the demands which were made for the ship's furniture, closely watched the markets in rum, sugar and coffee, and having a clear perception of the risk of war justly appraised the value of his tonnage to those who desired consignments through his bottoms. Shortly after breakfast he left the house and walked by way of the lane to the harbour. Lucy was not a young lady to sit idle. She could find something to do in every hour in the day. As Miss Acton did the housekeeping, Lucy was left to her own inventions, and being a girl of several resources, she was very happy in pleasing herself. Miss Acton went to look after the affairs of the home, and to attend to the needs of a little congregation of poor who were ushered into the housekeeper's room one after another every morning, except in Sunday, where they stated their wants and obtained such relief as Miss Acton's closets, stocks from her own purse, could supply, and if they did not get always exactly what they wished, they were sure of tender and consoling words, of sympathetic inquiry into their troubles, of a promise 
of some stockings for little James next week, of a roll of flannel for old Martha the day after tomorrow, pleasant and instructive it might have been to witness this old lady in her hoop and flowered gown asking questions, handing purges, promising little gifts of apparel to the poor people who ceaselessly sank in curtsies or plucked at wisp of hair upon their foreheads whilst they scraped the ground behind with their feet. Lucy, first of all, spent three quarters of an hour in drawing. She was a charming picture as she sat in the library, bending over her board. Her eyes dwelt in their beauty of lids and heavy lashes, sometimes with a little fire of pleasure, sometimes with a little life of impatience, upon the motions of her pencil and its results, and perhaps not always did she think of what she was about, for now and again the pencil would stand idle in her hand, the natural glow of her cheek was slightly deepened as to some visitation of moving thought. Her eyes would lift in languor from her work to the open window, upon the bit of landscape which it framed, beautiful, with its small darts and curves and lights of springtime in the trees. They appeared to brood in contemplation, from which she broke sometimes with a faint smile, sometimes with an expression upon her sweet lips which found a deeper loveliness for her naturally pensive look. When she had done with her drawing, she went to the piano and passed another half an hour at that instrument, then took up some work which she presently neglected for a novel, and shortly after eleven o'clock she mounted to her bedroom to prepare herself for a drive with her aunt. At half-past eleven, a carriage and pair drove through the gates and stopped in front of the house, and there fell from the box a groom in a livery of brass buttons and orange facings, who posted himself opposite the hall door and with crooked knee, stood it for entrance with trained intentness. He was not kept waiting long. The hall door was opened, and Mr Bates, the butler, appeared with a shawl and rug and the pug. A few minutes later, Miss Acton and Lucy entered the carriage, one nursing her pug, the other her terrier, and when some parcels were put in, they were driven away. I can think of nothing better than sulphur for poor Mr Eagle's feet. Here is a packet of it, enough, I believe, to enable him to walk in sulphur for quite a fortnight, said Miss Acton. They had arranged to drive as far as the bridge when they would quit the carriage and walk along the wharves to view the aurora and give the silver to Mr Eagle. But there were several places to be visited first of all. Mrs Brick was to be inquired after. A little basket of comforts in the shape of tea, sugar and the like was to be left at Mrs Lavender's, whose husband had fallen into a disused pit and, after lying in it all night, during which it rained heavily and continuously, he was discovered by a boy and later on hauled up with both his legs broken. Several such errands of kindness and compassion must render the drive to the bridge circuitous. As the carriage went down a lane into the main road, it overtook Sir William Lawrence, who was stoutly trudging along in the direction of Old Harbour, striking the ground as he went with a staff with the regularity of the pounding of a wooden leg, whose owner marches steadily. "'Pray get in! Pray get in, Sir William!' cried Miss Acton, after telling the coachman to stop, and in a few moments the hearty old gentleman was seated opposite the ladies and the carriage proceeding. I am on a visit to Old Harbour, said the Admiral, to inspect for Minorca. Now that my son is in command of her, I am doubly interested in the ship. Were you ever on board of her, miss? Yes, sir, answered Lucy. I paid her a visit with Papa when she returned home before this voyage, but I was never in her cabin. We will explore it together. I hope to have the pleasure of handing you over the side, ma'am, said the Admiral to Miss Acton. If the ship is perfectly motionless, I might venture to step on to the deck, answered Aunt Caroline. But I could not enter the cabin, sir. I believe the smell would instantly oppress me with nausea. I am a shocking bad sailor. Even the sight of a rocking ship at a distance provokes an indescribable and a very disagreeable sensation. You, madam, are not to be so easily upset exclaimed the admiral, looking with undissembled admiration at the beautiful glowing girl seated opposite, never more fascinating than in the dress in which she had apparelled herself this morning. 
Her large hat sat lightly on one side her head, and the fringes of her rich and abundant hair were like little pencilled shadowings upon her fair brow, save that now and again the passage of the carriage made these fairy tresses tremble. My son passed a delightful evening at your father's. Nobody could have been more agreeable, sir said Miss Acton. He has a sweet, strong voice and sings with great feeling. Oh, yes, he has the makings of a fine fellow in him, exclaimed the Admiral, with his face clouding somewhat. It is not for me to say so, but there was a time when I was proud of my son. Such was his zeal and gallantry in the service that I sometimes flattered myself a day would come when, like Lord Nelson, he would have a gazette to himself. His opportunities in the Navy are past. Even if he could be reinstated, I doubt if he would return. So lively, unnaturally lively, is the resentment and aversion which the sentence of the court-martial excited in him. It is a pity. It is a pity. The hearty old gentleman sighed, and his eyes reposed in thought upon the face of Lucy. She may have found an intelligence in his gaze which he did not possess, her cheeks were a little warmer. She cast her eyes down. The expression of the whole face was peculiarly pensive. Whatever may have been the thoughts in the Admiral's mind at that time, it is certain that among the mortifications and regrets his son's conduct caused him must be ranked the consideration that Mr. Lawrence, had he governed his conduct with prudence, would have stood a very good chance of winning the hand of Lucy Acton. The Admiral knew that his son had proposed to the lady, and his partiality as a father could not blind him to the reasons of his rejection. He had cause to suppose that in his quiet, unostentatious way Captain Acton had taken a favourable view of Lawrence's suit, but the sentence of the court-martial and his subsequent lazy, sottish life ashore had utterly extinguished the lieutenant's chances so far as Captain Acton was concerned. Naturally, Sir William grieved over this consideration. Here was a beautiful girl and an heiress belonging to one of the oldest families in the country. Her father had exhibited no marked ambition in the direction of her marriage. He was willing to leave her to choose, having confidence in her judgment, and convinced that her choice would be dictated by regard to her own happiness. Like Sir William, he loved his old calling, and a naval alliance would have been gratifying to him. There was indeed much for the poor old admiral to deplore, and no doubt Lucy had some delicate sense of what might be, or should have been, as she sat with her cheeks a little deepened in colour, and her eyes pensively bent downwards. The carriage stopped opposite the steps on the bridge down which Sir William, holding Miss Acton by the hand, conducted the old lady with admirable solicitude for her safety, begging her not to hurry, but to lean upon him and not trust to her cane. The two dogs were left behind. The scene of the quayside was gay and indeed festive. The few ships had hoisted colours in celebration of the Aurora's arrival, and the large flags of those days streaming from masthead and gaff end and ensign staff and jack staff combined with the brilliant blue of the sky the light and lovely greenery of spring that clove the ravine slopes the sober hue of the cliffs the white shape of the squab lighthouse past which some gulls were wheeling the chocolate tint of the revolving windmill the sober grey of the houses and the diamond sparkle of the river with its softened reflection of the bridge and banks streaming into its heart in dreamlike shadow of what was mirrored. This combination, I say, coupled with the motions and colours of human life on the quayside, albeit the beer hour had struck, and the picture owed nothing of animation to the workmen, fascinated the eye with the calm, the freshness, and the glory of a little English sea piece, Sabbath-like in repose, lighted by the sun of April, beaming in a perfectly fair heaven. Naturally, the arrival of the Aurora, as of any ship, but particularly a vessel belonging to the port, must be an incident full of active interest. 
for wives and children of the crew lived in Old Harbour Town, the men were related to two-thirds of the people of the place. The return from a considerable voyage of a ship in those days was not the commonplace familiar happening of every day which it is now. Ships sailed in convoys and arrived in groups at long intervals. Again, a ship was attended with a passion of interest which is no longer felt. Will she fall in with the enemy? Will she escape him? There was much to tell after a voyage in those days, no matter into what regions of the globe a vessel sailed. New lands to discover, amazing and enriching products of the soil to be reported. New races were to be met with. Indeed, in 1805, Sydney Cove in New Holland, which had been settled by Philip in 1787, was scarcely thought of as a new land in this country. It was too recent and remote. It was to supply reports later on, news which was to startle and excite the nation, differing only in kind from the information ships returned with from the East Indies and China and the great continent of South America. Therefore, when a ship was newly come home, even to a little maritime scene such as Old Harbour, there was plenty to hold groups in animated converse on the quayside. The Aurora had hauled in to her berth. The crew were busy in unbending her sails. The Minorca lay close enough to establish a contrast, and everybody would have admitted that if the bark was a smart ship for her time, the three-masted schooner built by the Americans was as shapely a fabric as the gracefulest men afloat. The Admiral and the ladies paused before her on their way to the Minorca, which lay further on. They would not go on board. There was too much confusion. The captain, however, stumping the quarter-deck and shouting orders, saw and recognised them. He was a thick-set man, brick-red in complexion, with deep red greasy hair, earrings, brown eyes, and a mouth that, through some injury, was drawn a little way up into his left cheek. He came to the bulwark rail, with his hat in his hand, and as the Admiral and the lady stepped to the quayside to speak to him, he exclaimed, Happy to see you, ma'am, and my hearty respects to you, miss, and I hope that Admiral Lawrence is none the worse for remaining ashore. Glad to see you safely back, Captain Weaver. What a very quick voyage you have made this time, Captain Weaver, called out Lucy. Some Frenchmen had the scent of ye, Captain, eh, and gave you heels? exclaimed Sir William. There's sometimes a virtue of half a gale of wind in a round shot, eh, Captain? Why, sir, answered the captain, it is true that we was chased, but that didn't make us the voyage for young ladies obliging enough to praise us for. Off the skillies a French frigate hove in sight on the weather bow, but what could she do with us? I eased off and got her a beam soon afterwards on the quarter. I then luffed, sir, making a tight jam of it, and crossed her bows at the distance of about three mile. She threw a few shots at us, but what's a frigate a-going to do with a vessel as can look up as the Aurora does, until by fund of the wind seem blowing fore and aft? He ran his eyes proudly over the spars of his vessel, and along the length of her. I am glad to know that you return and find your wife and little boy well, said Lucy. Oh, thank you, mum, thank you. And it's deeply beholden I am to you and Miss Acton for calling and inquiring after them, not to mention presents which leave my Sarah most grateful indeed. That's their little Tommy of mine grows like a ship you're rising. Because I'm his father, I'm not going to pretend he don't improve every voyage. Put him into the Royal Navy, said the Admiral. The King wants chips of old blocks like you. No fear, sir, called the Captain over the bulwark rail with a steady shake of the head, and a smile that merely ran his mouth higher into his cheek. I've set my art upon making him a lawyer. He shall end up like old Mr. Greyquill, as rich and as comfortable, and when he's old he'll hang out a white head of hair like a flag of truce, to let the world understand he don't want any more quarrelling. Good! cried the admiral with a laugh and applauding flourish of the hand and with this laugh and smiles and bows from the ladies sir william and his companions pursued their way to the minorca 
It was apparently a morning half-holiday with Old Harbour Town. Groups stood or walked about the wharves in talk. Most of the people respectfully saluted the ladies and the admiral, who, one or another, had for every other person a kindly sentence or a pleasant smile. Standing in the gangway of the Menorca was Mr Lawrence, who had manifestly seen the party approaching, though himself had been hidden from them by the interposition of the main shrouds. He crossed the planks which connected the ship with the shore, and stood with his hat in his hand as though they were royalty. "'Is Papa on board?' asked Lucy. "'No, madam. I left him at his offices about half an hour ago. "'We have come down to look over your ship, Walter.' said the admiral, sending from the wharf-side a sailor's knowing glance about the masts and spars of the bark. You'll not have had time yet, but I trust whilst you're in harbour you will set a good example to others by keeping your gear hauled taut and your yard square to a hair by lift and brace. She shall look as smart as she can be made to look, sir, answered Mr. Lawrence. Permit me to conduct you on board, madam. He had the grace sense and tact to offer his hand to miss acton who said do not let go of me those are very narrow planks if i should be left alone in the middle i should turn giddy and tumble trust to me madam said mr lawrence and taking the old lady by the hand he marched her on to the planks and they went in safety over the side into the ship the admiral and lucy followed the decks were empty the men at dinner she was a flush deck ship that is to say, her decks ran fore and aft without a break. She was steered by a wheel placed aft, which was unusual. Her deck furniture was simple. She had the necessary companionway to the cabin, a little caboose or kitchen abaft, the foremast, and abaft that again a long boat secured keel up to ring bolts by lashings. She also carried a couple of boats secured under the bulwarks. Her artillery was trifling. Four eighteen-pounder carronades, two of a side, the purpose of which it was idle to inquire, because, as she carried but twelve seamen, two boys, a steward, and a cook, she was not likely to make much show of resistance against a pirate with a blood-red flag of no quarter at his masthead, or any ship of the enemy which, though but a lugger, would certainly be far more heavily armed and manned than the Minorca. A fine sweep of deck, said the admiral. Lord, how the old spirit comes into one with the feel of a ship's plank underfoot. Is Mr. Eagle on board? asked Miss Acton. No, madam, he is ashore getting his dinner. Will you give him this packet of silver and tell him to put a little into his stockings? I hope it may do the rheumatism in the poor man's feet good. Mr. Lawrence pocketed the packet with a bow. Occasionally his eye went to Lucy, but he never suffered it to dwell, nor indeed did he seem to mark his sense of her presence by any particular behaviour. He was perfectly sober, his eyes clear and beaming, his cheeks painted with a little colour, and his apparel showed care. His father glanced at him, and seemed well pleased, and Lucy owned to herself that she had never seen him look more handsome, and that somehow, or other no stage, seemed to fit his peculiar type of beauty more happily, with a subtler blending of all qualities of its furniture, with the spirituality of the man, than the deck of a ship with the rigging soaring. "'It is wonderful to think,' said Miss Acton, "'how far a ship like this will go. I suppose she would go around the world.' "'Again and again, madam, whilst her timbers held.' "'Around the world!' exclaimed Miss Acton, looking about her with an expression of awe in her face. It is a long way from Old Harbour Town to London, but around the world. I believe I should be proud had I been around the world. How few who are not sailors can boast of it. Let me conduct you into your cabin, madam, said the Admiral. No, sir, I must be content to stop on deck. It is about twenty years ago since I was on the sea. I crossed from Dover to Calais. We were two days terribly tossed about, and I almost lost upon some sands. I lay dreadfully ill all the time, and on our arrival at Calais, when I had the strength to speak, 
I said to Papa, we must return by the sea, it is true, to get home. But once I am at home, I will never more put my foot into a ship. But the cabin is motionless, madam, said Mr. Lawrence. It is the tumbling of the sea that makes you ill. Here we are as restful as a painting. The very look of that hole, said the old woman, directing her eyes at the companionway, makes me feel as though if I descended I should suffer all that nearly killed me in my voyage from Dover to Calais. May I have the great honour of showing you the cabin, miss? said Mr. Lawrence. Yes, since I am here I should like to see the ship, answered Lucy. I will keep Miss Acton company on deck, said the Admiral. Mr. Lawrence led the way below. A bark of five hundred tons, though she will be regarded as a considerable ship in those days, will not supply lofty nor extensive cabin accommodation. This little ship's interior consisted of a cabin into which daylight passed through a skylight in the deck above. In the middle of this cabin was a short table capable of seating one at each end and two of a side. The cabin was painted brown and somewhat gloomy. The furniture merely supplied the ordinary needs of the occupants. There were four sleeping berths and a little compartment which was used as a pantry. I was never in a place like this before, said Lucy, resting her hand upon the table and gazing round her with the curiosity which a new and striking scene of life must always excite in an intelligent mind. The bedrooms are very small, said Mr. Lawrence, going to the berth that confronted the aftermost end of the cabin table and opening the door, but at sea any little hole is good enough to stow oneself away in. Amongst other things, a sailor learns how to sleep. And the habit is so strong with me of slumbering anywhere that if there was room for me, I believe I could sleep in a horse pipe when the ship is pitching bows under. What a very little room, said Lucy, peering in through the door Mr. Lawrence held open. How fearful to be locked up in such a box when the ship is sinking. Oh, you must not think of such things, madam. How fearful to be locked up in your bedroom, though it should be half as big as his ship when the house is on fire. Would not you enjoy a short voyage? A trip to the West Indies is short. It is a tropical journey, and all the romance of the sea is in it. In what thing, sir? Oh, madam, in magnificent sunsets, in storms of fire which harm not, though they are as sublime as one might figure a vision of hell viewed through such tremendous doors as Milton described, in birds of exquisite plumage, and flight which is beyond all other forms of grace, in fish of a thousand lustrous dyes, and the dark wet blue of the long shark, in nights magnificent with such stars as do not shine upon these islands. For as you strike south, madam, the glory of things which are glorious waxes hourly, the moon expands into a nobler shield, and her path upon the water is a torrent of silver that seems to mark the death of the mystic realm it sounds. As he spoke these words, the companion ladder was darkened, and a moment or two later, Captain Acton entered the cabin. End of chapter four. Chapter five of The Yarn of Old Harbor Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell Hall Captain Acton paused for a few moments at the foot of the companion ladder, with a grave smile on his face. This is the first time you have been in this cabin, Lucy, I think, he said. Yes, sir. Well, and what do you think of the accommodation offered by the Minorca? I hope Miss Acton thinks well of it, said Mr. Lawrence. I was trying, this moment, to tempt her to take a voyage to the West Indies by a poor description of some of the wonders which are to be met in the trip. Oh, if we should think of a journey to the West Indies, we should not choose the Menorca, said Captain Acton. I confess that I have sometimes, myself, had a fancy for looking into one or two of the old ports, which I remember as a midshipman. The Aurora would be the ship, 
she has a speed that would make me indifferent to pursuit. At the same time, there is always the risk of capture, and as I can no longer serve my country by taking my chance of a French prison, I believe I am discreetly advised by leaving well alone, that is, until peace comes, if ever it comes. Is not this a very fine cabin, Lucy, considering the size of the ship? I dare say it is, Papa, but how should I know? This is the first cabin I ever was in, and the Menorca and the Aurora are the only two vessels whose decks I have ever stepped upon. Then, let me tell you, there are countless naval officers afloat who would reckon themselves in paradise if they had such quarters as these to live in. Look at the Saucy. The well of a Codsmack is more comfortable than her sleeping places. Take a corvette or gun brig stationed on the west coast of Africa, or kept cruising along the West Indian shores. The heat strikes through the plank, and a man sleeps in a furnace. Cockroaches in numbers thick as ropes blacken the beams. Rats, ferocious with thirst, are found drowned in the hook pot of cold tea you want to drink. Everything simmers. The paint even below, if there is any paint to be found, bubbles, and you are fed on scalding pea soup and beef blue with brine, the very sight of which raises a craziness of thirst which you slake by rum, for the cooling of which might offer you year's pay for a piece of ice. Now, these are airy quarters. An admiral might well be content with such a living room. He looked into one or two of the cabins or sleeping berths, and examined a strand of arms affixed to a bulkhead just before the companion ladder. If, sir, you should be tempted, whilst I have the honor of holding command in your service, into taking a trip in one of your vessels to the West Indies, said Mr. Lawrence. I hope I shall be the one privileged to navigate you and Miss Acton there. Oh, we should be in very good hands. Very good hands, answered Captain Acton, lightly regarding him. They had met by appointment not long before at Acton's offices, and there the gallant captain had taken notice that Mr. Lawrence was as sober as he himself was whilst the care with which he had attired himself had promoted all that was excellent in his person to such a degree that captain acton had never thought him handsomer and on the whole a finer specimen of the young british naval officer indeed he had congratulated himself on behalf of his worthy old friend sir william on having resolved to give his son this appointment for it surely looked as though with this gift of a birth with this opportunity for honorably employing himself, and so getting a little money, and easing his father of the burden of his maintenance, the young fellow's reformation had begun, and naturally, Captain Acton, who was an exceedingly kind-hearted man, and a sound Christian in principle and behavior, could not but be happy in the reflection that he might prove instrumental in rescuing a handsome young man, a gentleman, the son of an old friend, himself a naval officer, a person whose character was enriched by many meritorious and some rare qualities, from the ruin, physical and moral, into which he was fast decaying through drink and an idleness which was a consequence of an aversion to his old calling, and the almost insuperable difficulty of obtaining anything to do, whilst loitering in old harbour town and passing most of his time at the Swan with Lieutenant Tupman. Mr. Lawrence would represent the voyage to the West Indies as beautiful, wonderful, and indeed magical, as an Arabian night's dream, said Lucy. But you did not tell me of cockroaches, sir, she added with a smile, and with one of those looks which in her seemed a brooding or dwelling of the eye, though, if judged of its effect by time, the look was scarcely more than a glance. Yet this was the consequence of the peculiar beauty of her heavy lids rendered yet more languid by the fringes through which the large dark brown orbs of vision directed their gaze and you said nothing about the beef blue with salt which creates thirst before it is tasted we will undertake to keep you free from cockroaches madam said mr lawrence and the beef captain acton speaks of is shipped for the sailors i believe sir it would not be difficult to send aft every day such a dinner and breakfast 
as would convince Miss Acton that at sea all that we eat is not bread grubs and beef hard enough to carve snuff boxes out of. For my part, said Captain Acton, I don't want to sit down to a better banquet than a piece of really good ship's pickled beef, finely grained, and cutting delicately and well fatted, and a crisp ship's biscuit, and you may add a drop of real old Jamaica. I have dined more heartily off such a dish than at many a dinner ashore of ten or twelve courses. You were young, sir, said Lucy, and you enjoyed all that you ate. There was a good deal that you ate when you were young, that you would not eat now, and even now I doubt whether you would find the old relish in your prime piece of pickled beef. Captain Acton smiled, and looked fondly at his daughter, and said pleasantly, "'And pray, my dear, what are Mr. Lawrence's temptations to a voyage to the West Indies?' "'I think you spoke of sunsets,' she said. Captain Acton broke in, "'We have finer sunsets in England than any you get in the tropics. "'Birds of exquisite plumage, and beyond all forms of known grace in flight.' "'Aye, but they don't sing,' said Captain Acton. "'Give me the song of the thrush or the blackbird "'before all the finest feathers in the world.' "'Wonderfully dyed fish,' said Lucy. "'Oh, madam,' said Mr. Lawrence, "'with a little blush in his face, "'I did not intend my poor representation "'of the fascinations of a voyage to the West Indies, "'for the ear of so experienced a sailor "'and so keen an observer as Captain Acton.' "'Well, we may go with you some day, sir,' said Captain Acton, good-humouredly. "'But peace must be declared before I embark. "'We are keeping Miss Acton waiting.' "'He led the way up the companion ladder. "'Amongst those who just then were standing upon the quayside, "'gazing with more or less of interest at the Minorca "'and the other vessels moored to the walls, "'was old Mr. Greyquill.' whose figure was immediately conspicuous by reason of his long white hair and heavily white-thatched eyebrows. And this day he wore a round velvet cap such as might have been suggested to him by a portrait by some old Flemish artist and a velvet coat. He stood on the wharf a few paces behind some people who formed a little group and peered at the Menorca with a sharp of his hand pressed against his brow seeking to determine the faces he saw on board he was too far off to recognize the admiral and captain acton who now appeared but the moment mr lawrence's head was visible above the bulwark rail he knew him and seemed to try to catch his eye but lawrence who instantly perceived him averted his gaze or turned his back and after steadily staring for some moments under the shelter of his hand the old fellow shuffled off "'Have you secured a berth, miss?' asked the admiral, with a hearty, jolly smile. "'Mr. Lawrence paints the voyage to the West Indies in very tempting colors,' answered Lucy. "'If Lucy and I should take the trip, we should go in the Aurora,' said Captain Acton. "'You, at your time of life, brother, going a voyage to the West Indies, with every probability of the French making a prisoner of you and Lucy?' cried Miss Acton, in the high key in which she saluted the ear when she was alarmed. My dear sister, we are going to do nothing of the sort. Not that a voyage to the West Indies, in such a vessel as the Aurora, would be a fearful adventure, or a terrible ordeal. Indeed, I never look at that little ship, said he, turning his eyes in the direction of the schooner, without a longing to be on her deck when she is fully clothed when the liberal breeze of the sea blows steadily, and when bending under her white heights, she springs like the flying fish from one sparkling sea to another, cradled always by the rocking hand of the swell. You should add Papa's description to your list of the charms of a West Indian voyage, said Lucy, with a slight glance at Mr. Lawrence, for, when a girl has been proposed to by a man, and has refused him, and when she is perfectly well aware that his passion remains as great for her as ever it was, she will be coy, shy, cautious, something unintelligible, perhaps, in his presence. 
"'Upon my word, Acton,' said the Admiral, "'you have just put into words the fancies I have had "'whilst I have been conversing with Miss Acton. "'The old spirit will speak in a man. "'The old love will grow eloquent once again "'at the suggestion that quickens it into bright memory. "'And whilst I have been talking to you, "'I have, in imagination, "'paced the starboard side of the quarter-deck, "'which we will call the weather side. "'This harbor, these wharves, the old town have disappeared, and I am surrounded by a wide ocean in the heart of which this little ship is rushing, streaming her wake like a comet's tail, bursting the surge in rainbow-like arches for her progress, filling the air with the music of shroud and backstay, and lightening the heart with a sense of freedom, which the sea alone can give, and which used to visit me like a sense of gratitude, or rejoicing as though something had been given to me, that was gracious, beautiful, and rare. Mr. Lawrence viewed his father with astonishment, Miss Lucy with a smile whose beauty was radiant with applause, Miss Acton with an expression of awe, whilst Captain Acton burst out, "'Upon my word, Admiral, forgive me for saying so, but I never could have believed such thinking so expressed was in your line of mind.' I believe St. Vincent would be very pleased did he possess your powers of delivery. Oh, come, come, cried the Admiral. Don't make me feel more ashamed of myself than I am. But, Miss Lucy, is not the sea a subject about which you cannot think without being inspired, with thoughts high above those which visit you from other topics? When such a man as Nelson is in your mind... "'Yes, Nelson is the great sea-poem of the age,' said Captain Acton, "'and I find more melody in the thunder of his guns "'than in the prettiest turns of the poetic measure. "'Are you going home, sister?' "'Yes, we have done all we came out to do. "'Where is Mr. Eagle? "'Mr. Lawrence, you will not forget to give him the sulphur for his poor feet?' "'I will not, madam.' and I trust that the application of it may make him a little better humored. One might notice a man's ill temper, said the Admiral, if he were over you, but when he is under you, there used to be a saying in my day, it's in the power of an officer to ride down any man under him. I believe Mr. Eagle is a very respectable man, though illiterate like most of them in the lower walks of the merchant service, said Captain Acton. This sort of people come on board through the hawse pipe, but at a pinch their knowledge, which is uncommonly practical, is sometimes vastly useful. They are acquainted with maneuvers which would often put their betters to their trumps. They know all about rigging, its straining point, have little tricks above the average seamanship for heavy weather, are learned in the pumps in their gear, and indeed know ships not only with the familiarity of a master rigger, but of a master builder. One of these men, I believe, is Eagle, and I think, sir, you will find him all that I tell you he is, though like most of his class he is of a somewhat sour and sullen nature, and quick to grumble. I'll go home with you, sister. Admiral, can we give you a lift? No, I thank you, sir. I am to dine today with Mr. Perry. I have long promised to eat a cut of cold meat with him. His cider is the best I know. His cider alone makes him worth dining with. Give Perry my kind regards, said Captain Acton. And thank him, twittered Miss Acton, for the beautiful sermon he gave us last Sunday, and tell him I am looking forward to such another next Sunday. This said, they all went over the side, the Admiral taking great care of Miss Acton as she crossed the planks. Mr. Lawrence remained in the gangway. When on the wharf, his father called to him. Where do you dine, Walter? At the Swan, sir. I have a few words to say to my son, said the Admiral. I will bid you good-bye here, and with the ceremonious courtesy of that age, he took leave of Captain Acton and the ladies, who proceeded to their carriage, where they were cordially welcomed by the passionate barking of the pug and the terrier. Mr. Lawrence's eye reposed upon Lucy's figure, whilst his father was bidding the party farewell. Whilst she walked away on Captain Acton's right, Aunt Caroline strutting and leaning with some affectation on her crutch cane on his left, 
the three much saluted by the people who lingered on the wharf as they went. The young fellow's eyes still reposed upon the girl, even as the admiral came stumping across the planks, pounding them with his staff as he walked. Well, said he, I suppose you kept your appointment this morning with Captain Acton. Oh, certainly, and his reception was all that I could have expected at his hands. Are the terms pretty satisfactory? Twelve pounds a month and ten percent commission on the freight. On the freight? On the money earned by the carriage of cargo, sir. I understand, said the admiral. This should prove a very good offer. Very good terms. What will this ship carry? Mr. Lawrence reflected as though mentally gauging depth of hold and breadth of beam, and answered, I think, when flush, she should hold six hundred tons. Six hundred tons out and six hundred home. That is twelve hundred. I don't know what freights are, but they must rule high, and, kindly creature as he is, Acton is the man to know to what market to drive his pigs. I think you have done very well. Besides obtaining occupation which may conduct you to something higher, or at least better, you stand to clear about a hundred pounds by this voyage. The value of its wages, sir, will depend upon its length, interrupted Mr. Lawrence. I know that, cried the admiral, but whatever the sum, it is good money, and honestly earned, made not as you could make it in this place, and better a hundred pounds gain by toil, which a man's conscience approves and applauds, than one hundred thousand fetched from the pockets of others by the crime of gambling. He looked steadily at his son, whose eyes were fixed upon the carriage which the Actons were at that moment entering. Did you observe, Mr. Grayquill, continued the Admiral, on the wharf behind the little crowd of people viewing the ship under his lifted hand? He was there when you came on deck. I saw him. What brings that old man here peering and mopping and mowing? Has he heard of your appointment? I wish he may not be hatching some scheme, planning some design to end this, your fortunate command, by arresting you unless you pay him up in full. I don't know what his intentions are, said Mr. Lawrence, with some blood coloring his face. I saw the old rascal plain enough, but avoided his eye as I feared he might have the insolence to step aboard and address me in the presence of Captain Acton and the ladies, and yourself, sir. But if he has heard of my appointment, I cannot conceive that he meditates my arrest as an alternative to my paying him in full, which he knows I cannot do. I should tell him that by waiting he will receive payment by installments. This I can manage now that I have money coming to me. Will he stop his sole chance of receiving back his loan by clapping me into jail? Why, perhaps not, answered the admiral. He would be a fool as well as a villain for so doing. Take an opportunity of putting the matter to him as you put it to me. I do not want to see your chance obstructed, nor Captain Acton's kindness embarrassed by any action on the part of old Grayquill. And I beg, sir, continued the old officer, speaking slowly and solemnly, that during the rest of your time ashore, you will behave with that discretion which can alone secure you the continuance of Captain Acton's good will. You are going to dine at the Swan? I am sure you will understand what must signify a report that you were not master of yourself, for, continued the old admiral with emphasis, it is idle to believe that the best-natured man in the world will confide his property and the care of valuable lives to the custody of a man who is not fit to take charge of himself. "'You may trust me,' said Mr. Lawrence, making Sir William so low a bow that it might have been thought that they were strangers and had met on an affair of ceremony. The young man watched his father roll away towards the steps which conducted him on to the bridge. His face was sunk in thought. A peculiar gloom was in the expression of it. His beauty, even in repose, always had something of sternness in it. Now, as he watched his father's diminishing figure, his mouth gradually put on an air of bitter hardness, and a frown gave severity, and even the light of anger, to his eyes. 
he was lingering on board until the hour when the ordinary at the swan was served and whilst he stood looking over the rail near the gangway so profoundly self-abstracted that his eyes turning idly seemed without speculation mr eagle came across the planks he limped a little and the expression of his face was uncommonly acid with pain and the nature of the man oh said mr lawrence waking up here is a packet left by miss acton for you for your feet he handed him the sulphur i am much obliged i am sure said eagle he put it to his nose i have tried it again and again he said and it ain't of no more use than if you was to rub in snuff but she's a kindly lady to remember me said he putting the packet into his pocket and i hope sir as when you meet her you'll present her with my humble acknowledgments mr lawrence gave him a nod and then turned his head away not desirous of further converse with a man he regarded as inferior to a boatswain's mate or master at arms upon a man of war eagle was on board to see to the arrival of cargo which came into old harbor very leisurely in wagon loads at a time the minorca was now receiving commodities for the passage out but she did not sail till the third of may and was not yet more than half full up mr lawrence looked at the clock which was affixed to the house at the end of the wharf in which captain acton had his offices and was about to leave the ship to make his way to the swan when a man who had been standing a few moments on the quay side at the foot of the gangway boards stepped across and saluted him mr lawrence exclaimed oh it's you what do you want the man was almost a caricature owing to malformation and other deformities his red hair flamed he was hunched his arms were as long as a baboon's and seemed designed for climbing his legs were arched and at the same time crooked at the knees so that he appeared to be stooping whether he walked or stood and to complete the suggestion of his origin he had a trick of scratching himself like a monkey he was about twenty-five years of age whose son he was he could not have told he preeminently belonged to the parish lawrence had got to know of his existence by one day sauntering into the justice's court among the prisoners charged with various misdemeanors was this man who had no other name than paul he was accused of having taken a vegetable a cabbage or a turnip from a field which lay invitingly open and the punishment inflicted was a fine or a term of imprisonment mr lawrence struck by the extraordinary appearance of the man or witnessing a very great hardship in a pauper having to pay for so mean a thing as a turnip by a considerable term of incarceration put his hand in his pocket with a sailor's liberality and finding the money that was wanted handed the amount to an official of the court and the man went free the man waited outside for mr lawrence when he appeared he seized his hand and fell upon his crooked knees and kissed and slobbered his hand and blubbered with tears trickling down his face that so help him his good god come what might he would do anything no matter what to serve his honour he would die for his honour let his honour command him to jump into the river then and there and drown himself he'd do it if only to please him his gestures wilt on his knees his extraordinary grimaces, the strange, wild terms in which he expressed his pathetic gratitude for this condescension of a gentleman in taking notice of and rescuing from jail a poor, pitiful vagabond, a child of the parish, a no man's son, nor woman's either, a creature who lived he could not tell how, sometimes by stealing a raw vegetable, sometimes by running an errand, sometimes by the bounty of a tradesman who might fling him a crust or of some drunken fisherman who might toss him a shilling to sing him a song and dance as he sang a performance so hideously uncouth that hogarth would have immortalized it could he have witnessed it his gratitude in short was so diverting at the same time moving in its appeal to pity that mr lawrence could scarcely forbear a laugh 
and indeed did laugh when he got rid of the fellow and walked away. "'I understand that your honors got command of this ship,' answered Paul. "'Well,' exclaimed Mr. Lawrence, eyeing him with that sort of regard with which one views some hairy, human-like importation of the likeness of a man, and perhaps better looking than some men, from an Indian or South American forest. "'If your honor hasn't shipped a steward, sir, I should be mighty glad if you'd take me. I could sail round the world with you, sir. I'd love to be your shatter. Wherever your honor goes, I'd like to be there.' The strange face of the fellow with its red eyebrows and red eyelashes and red fluff upon his upper lip and compressed nose, ape-like or sheep-like, so that the nostrils seemed to be squeezed out of position, and to gape from either side, quivered with feeling, with intensity, and passion of desire. Mr. Lawrence, with a ridiculing smile, said, What do you know about waiting on people in the cabins of ships? What I did should be to your honor's satisfaction. I could lay a cloth and set a dish, and I'd learn in as many hours as much as it would take others' days. "'But you were never at sea. You'll be sick in your hammock, and I shall be wanting someone to wait upon me.' "'Oh, yes, Your Honor, I've been to sea,' answered Paul, with prodigious earnestness. "'I've been in smacks. I've knocked about all my life in boats belonging to this harbor. Sick? No fear, Your Honor. I'll sarve you for nothing.' Mr. Lawrence looked at the red-headed, monkey-faced, pleading creature, not, in that look designing, it was manifest, to give him a birth, but all on a sudden his face slightly changed, an idea seemed to flash up in him and work in his countenance, just as a light kindled suddenly within a mask, made of something transparent might, by the intention of the artist, change its look. "'What's your name again?' he said. "'Paul, Your Honor,' answered the fellow, brightening instinctively with a face Mr. Lawrence now viewed him with. No other name? No matter. Paul will do very well for the books. He mused a little with his eyes fastened upon the ship's decks. For a space he was deeply sunk in thought. Presently his eyes rose to the figure before him, and he examined him as curiously as though he had never before seen him. "'Be here,' said he, on Saturday next. "'It may be that I'll give you the berth. "'No more words. Off with you.' "'The fellow made a dash with his hand at a red forelock, "'and in his crooked gait went through the gangway "'and walked away up to the wharf, "'just as Mr. Eagle rose out of the main hatch. "'Mr. Lawrence walked to the swan. "'The entrance was under a covered way, "'into which the stagecoach drove for baiting.' Mr. Lawrence walked into the bar and observed a letter, fixed in a frame of red tape, stretched across a board covered with green baize. As he was in the habit of receiving letters at this house, he looked at this one and saw that it was addressed to him. He pulled it out of its mesh of tape, and, addressing a middle-aged, comely woman who sat in the window in the bar, where she supplied lookers in with pots of frothing beer, or directed them to such parts of the house as they desired to visit, he asked when that letter had been left, and was answered that the letter carrier had brought it in about two hours before. He seemed to know the handwriting on the envelope, and there was a frown upon his face as he broke the big seal. He read it where he stood. It was a letter from a Captain Rousby, informing him that he owed him the sum of one hundred guineas, that this money, as a debt of honor, had been payable immediately on proof of the loss of the wager, but that so far from having received it, Captain Rousby had been waiting for nine months without obtaining further satisfaction than the now wearisome and well-worn excuse that Mr. Lawrence could not immediately pay, that he was expecting to obtain employment in the course of the month, which would enable him to discharge this debt with interest, if Captain Rousby thought proper." The captain informed Mr. Lawrence that last week Mrs. Rousby had presented him with twins, a catastrophe which greatly increased his expenses at a time when he was without employment and when money was never more urgently needed. 
Captain Rousby then went on to inform Mr. Lawrence that if a portion of this debt, say, twenty-five guineas, was not sent to him by the first of June, it would be his unpleasant duty to visit Old Harbor Town, call upon Sir William Lawrence, and state the facts of the case to him as an officer and a gentleman. If he could obtain no satisfaction from the admiral, it would be his painful duty, a duty that must be singularly distasteful to a man who had been a messmate and shipmate of Mr. Lawrence, to take such steps as his lawyer might advise. When Mr. Lawrence had read this letter through, he was in the act of crushing it by one of those spasmodic motions of the hand, which accompany a sudden violent gust of wrath. He met the eyes of the female in the bar fixed upon him. In her gloomy, beer-flavored recess, faintly luminous with hanging rows of highly polished drinking pots, and a sideboard well within laid with metal vessels for drinking from and for holding drink, the landlady of the Swan, for such was this decoration of the bar, had manifestly been studying his face whilst he read. She knew him very well, and she was also well acquainted with his habits. In a breath on meeting her eyes, he changed his resolution and folded up the letter into its original creases, giving her a smile which did not seem in the least degree forced, and saying to her in his pleasantest manner, Is the ordinary on? And receiving her answer after she had darted a look at an invisible clock in her room, In another three minutes, sir, he passed on and went upstairs. The ordinary was held in a long room next to the room in which the seafaring men congregated. As a meal, it was renowned in the district. Coarse it might have been called, coarse and plentiful, but it was of that sort of coarseness which makes very good eating. Mr. Short, the landlord, was a liberal caterer, and he excelled in choice of rounds of beef, in joints of venison, in legs of pork and mutton, in fine dishes of veal. And this ordinary was always graced with a precedent dish of fish, which was invariably fresh from the sea, and whether turbo, cod, bake, soles, and many flat fish which the smacks brought with them into Old Harbor, were delicious in freshness and flavor. Short's cheeses, too, were always very fine, dry, crumbly, flaky, nutty, and without being too strong, they flavored the bread or the biscuit with what the palate knew to be real cheese. His cellars held a very fine old port, but it was seldom asked for unless some person of distinction and importance occupied a seat at that teeming and appetizing board. Short brewed his own beer, and a delicate amber draught it was. There was no better beer brewed in England. This ordinary was held every day, for there were always people passing through Old Harbor Town, and then Old Harbor Town itself was liberal with its own supply of guests, pilots, smack owners, and others who found it cheaper and much more convenient to get a cut at the Swan than to sit down to an ill-killed and ill-cooked joint or a fried chop or steak in their own homes. The ordinary was frequently graced by the presence of distinguished people. A lord would occasionally take a chair. Several neighboring squires were regular frequenters when business brought them into those parts. Captain Acton had often made a meal at that table, and so had Sir William. Mr. Short occupied the head of the table, and the oldest frequenter, who happened to be present, the foot. Mr. Short took his seat when Mr. Lawrence sat down, and all the people who had come to eat were then assembled. In a picture they would figure as a homely old English lot, men in bottle green coats, in red coats, in purple waistcoats, in plain pilot cloth, here and there a dandy built up in the latest style, here and there an old fogey who stuck to the fashion of the last century, and figured in a little tie wig, a frill very fit for the harboring of snuff, a cutaway coat with immense pockets, such as Boswell might have been found drunk in, in Edinburgh, and shoes with buckles. Mr. Short said grace, and prayed for the king and royal family, and for the utter ruin and confusion of the French, Spanish, and all our enemies. 
In two or three places the walls were adorned by maps, with which no navigator of this age would dare to risk his life fifty miles out of sight of land. A spinet stood in a corner. It was sometimes customary, when the ordinary was ended, and the sentiments had been brought to a conclusion, for anyone who could perform, to sit down to this spinet and accompany any gentleman who was good enough to oblige. But it was always understood that the song must carry a chorus which everybody present knew so that everybody present might join in it. Hence the same old melodies were very often heard in that long room with the low ceiling and its clock whose voice was audible all over the house at night. Mr. Lawrence was a quality guest, and being a frequenter, had a place of his own, which was on the left hand of the landlord. Thus he got the fish of his choice, the cut of meat he liked best, the best draught of ale the house could supply, and this ordinary was too useful to him to allow him to be in debt to it. Short was the large fat man with a pink face, merry little drunken eyes almost buried out of sight in his hairy eyebrows and eyelashes. His pear-shaped nose was so purple at the end that it might have been supposed he had just been fighting his way through a hedge full of nettles. He treated his patrons as guests, and of those he knew, would ask familiarly after their relations and how their businesses went and the like. Mr. Lawrence sat very silent, yet ate with appetite because what was put before him he relished, but it was observed that he limited himself to one tankard of beer. When the ordinary was ended, pipes were put upon the table and jars of tobacco, and then Mr. Short, without rising, exclaimed, Gentlemen, before I give you a sentiment, I shall be pleased if you will allow me to propose a toast. It was only known to me this morning that my highly respectable friend on the left, Mr. Lawrence, the son of that distinguished officer, Rear Admiral Sir William Lawrence, has received, through his friend Captain Acton of His Majesty's Navy, the command of that beautiful bark, the Menorca. I am sure that there is near a gent here who takes an interest in our old harbor, and who has the honor of the acquaintance of Captain Acton and Mr. Lawrence, but will feel proud and delighted that that beautiful ship, the Menorca, which we all claim now as belonging to our town, will be commanded by as fine an officer as ever walked His Majesty's quarter-deck. Gentlemen all, I give you the health of Captain Acton, Mr. Lawrence, and the Menorca, and may prosperity attend the beautiful ship, and may she return home to gladden the eyes of all well-wishers of our grand old town by loading our storehouses with more foreign produce. Mr. Lawrence looked startled when this toast was begun, but he composed his face as Short proceeded, and when everybody was extending his glass to him and wishing him all the good luck that Short desired, he was receiving the general salutation with a composed smile and an air of courteous appreciation. One sat at the table who peered at him hard when Mr. Short began. This was a middle-aged man in a brown wig. He was one of the two clerks kept by Mr. Graquill, and regularly dined at the Swan's Ordinary, a repast which had never once been decorated by the presence of Mr. Graquill, who, living in rooms over his offices, chose to eat, for his breakfast, a little fish which he bought from a man with a barrel with whom he haggled, and for his dinner a cutlet or a piece of steak, just enough for one, with the vegetables, and for supper whatever might have been left from breakfast or dinner, and if nothing was left, then a piece of hearty bread and cheese, as he would term it, and a glass of beer. The man with the brown wig peered with his head on one side at Mr. Lawrence, as though Mr. Short's toast conveyed a piece of news to him. When the landlord had made an inn, and the house named had been pledged, Mr. Short, filling a pipe and inviting those of his friends who were smokers to follow his example, asked old Mr. Sturgeon, a well-known smack owner, for a sentiment, who in a feeble voice and eyes from which the light of being had almost been extinguished by time, broke out in a sort of hiccup, as we ascend the hill of life, may we never meet a friend. 
This was enough for Mr. Lawrence, who perfectly understood that all the sentiments, which were likely to be delivered at that table, he had heard over and over again. He rose, made a bow to the landlord and the company, and walked from the room to the adjacent room, which was made a reading room of by the pilots, smacksmen, and others, and sitting down at the long table, took a sheet of some paper which was there for the accommodation of the frequenters, and, after thinking deeply, undisturbed by the sound of singing which started next door, he began to write in pencil, obviously making a draft of a communication he proposed to copy there, or more probably elsewhere. Certainly what he wrote about did not refer to the letter he had received on his arrival at the Swan. This may be assumed, as he never referred to that letter which lay in his pocket. He wrote leisurely, and with absorption, never heeding the noise next door, and when he was done he carefully read through what he had written, and with his handsome face stern with a quality of resolution, and the temper which enters into great or violent undertakings as their impulse or seminal principle, he pocketed the letter and left the room by another door. End of chapter 5 Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona September 14, 2021Chapter 6 of The Yarn of Old Harbor Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell. Chapter 6 The Letter. Mr. Graquill's office was in High Street. He used two rooms for his professional affairs and the rest of the house, which was a small one, he lived in. He was an attorney, and a flourishing one, so mean that his name had passed into a proverb, but honorable in his dishonorable doings, so that though every man agreed that Grey Quill was a scoundrel, all held that he kept well within the lines of his villainy, and that he was unimpeachable outside the prescribed and understood rules of his roguery. Two mornings following the day on which Mr. Short had proposed Mr. Lawrence's health, old Mr. Grey Quill rose from his chair at his office table and said to his clerk in the brown wig, who sat within eyeshot at another table in the adjacent room, that he was going to collect his rents at Grey Quill's buildings, and that he would not be back before half-past twelve. He never looked so white as he did this morning. His white hair seemed to rest like a cloud upon his head and shoulders. His eyebrows bore so strong a resemblance to white mice that no one could have overlooked the similitude, particularly as each eyebrow flourished over the bridge of the nose a few little dark hairs which resembled tails. His waistcoat was white, not having come from the wash above three days, and his stockings were white. He left his house and walked down the road which led to the bridge, but instead of crossing the bridge he descended a short flight of steps abreast of the flight that led to the wharves. These steps conducted the passenger to the riverside walk that went up the banks of the stream, and a very sweet walk it was this morning. The bright river trembled in prisms and gems under the pleasant breathing of the wind, which was aromatic with the odors it culled in its flight over the country. The birds sang gaily with here and there a deep flute-like note. It was a morning lovely and delightful with the virginal spirit of spring, when all creation seems new, when no note in the trees no sweetness in the air, no bloom or flash of white on the bough, no timid wayside flower that seems to have sprung into being since yester-eve and glances at you coyly from its little wayside bower, but delights the senses as a beautiful surprise, as a something remembered but never so fresh, so appealing. A bend of the river's path shut out the view of old harbour town and the harbour, and just when Mr. Grayquill reached this turn he saw Mr. Lawrence coming along the road having manifestly gained it by a little bridge some distance beyond which was another way, but rather roundabout, of getting to Old Harbour from Sir William Lawrence's cottage. Mr. Lawrence looked very well. His colour was fresh, his eyes carried the light which nature intended them to take, but which his hand was perpetually seeking to extinguish by draughts of strong liquors. He had been extremely temperate for three days, and his resolution was producing its fruits in his general appearance, 
It is indeed surprising how short is the period asked for by nature, even from men who live harder and drink harder than Mr. Lawrence, to restore them to as much of their healthy old good looks as in some cases makes them almost irrecognizable. "'Good morning, Mr. Lawrence,' said Mr. Grayquill, making the gentleman a low bow. "'I may take it that you're going to the ship which I am pleased to hear Captain Acton has given you the command of.' "'You are very kind, sir, to take an interest in my affairs,' answered Mr. Lawrence with slight sarcasm. "'I think I have some reason, Mr. Lawrence,' answered Mr. Grayquill, drooping his head to one side and looking at the other with a confidential and familiar expression, which was scarcely a smile, but which teased the hot blood of Mr. Lawrence as though the look masked an insult. Mr. Lawrence viewed him in silence. "'I may trust at all events,' continued the money-lender, "'now that you are in receipt of money.' and if the terms have been correctly named to me, they speak very highly in favor of Captain Acton's generosity, that you will give my debt your immediate attention, and that if you cannot pay all, you will pay as much as I have a right to expect from the amount you receive. You shall be paid, sir, said Mr. Lawrence. It would be convenient to me if you would fix a day for the first payment if you cannot pay the whole, said Mr. Grayquill. I shall not be able to pay you anything this side of my first command of the Menorca. If I hand you the sum of twenty-five guineas after my return, that is, when I am paid off by Captain Acton, I believe you will not have much reason to complain, sir. Mr. Grayquill shrugged his shoulders. Twenty-five guineas is a very small proportion of three hundred pounds, he exclaimed. It is not three hundred pounds, sir, answered Mr. Lawrence, with the countenance of a man who is resolved in his intention, but desires to speak with prudence and good humor. "'But from my point of view it is three hundred pounds,' cried Mr. Grayquill. "'What is the good of money without interest? "'I enter in my books the interest on my money as part of my money. "'And if you tell me I am not to speak of my interest when I speak of what is due to me, "'what is my situation? "'How am I to live? "'The profit the butcher makes by the sale of his carcasses is the interest upon his outlay. "'Deprive him of that and he will not sell you meat, "'because he could not afford to do so.' The butcher does not charge at your rate, Mr. Grayquill, said Mr. Lawrence with a faint smile. I will not declare what the butcher charges, cried Mr. Grayquill, a little warmly for so sleek a man. But take my word, the British tradesmen, whether tinker, tailor, butcher, baker, and will throw in grocer as we do not value rhymes, charges at rates which, if reduced from profit to interest and called by that aggressive term discount, would represent every shopkeeper in the nation as big a scoundrel as the most voracious of your money-lenders, sir. He bowed as though to the applause of an audience, and looked the better pleased with Mr. Lawrence for having heard him. Well, Mr. Grayquill, twenty-five guineas when I'm paid off in my return home. I can say no more, and I can promise no more. You speak like a gentleman to me in this matter, which you do not often do when I refer to it, nor your father neither. Sir William Lawrence has nothing to do with my affairs. Still, he might recognize my claim on your debt, and treat me perhaps with the commiseration with which he would pity himself if he lost three hundred pounds. You have not lost it, Mr. Grayquill. No, sir, and from my conversation with you this morning, I am satisfied I shall receive every penny. I wish you a truly prosperous voyage and a safe return home and that the Frenchman won't be the means of dishing more hopes than your own. He made another of his bows, and Mr. Lawrence, saluting him with a slight smile and lifted hat, passed on. Just at the bend of the road, not ten paces from where they had been standing, Mr. Lawrence drew forth his pocket handkerchief to blow his nose, and with it there came out of his pocket, and fell upon the road unobserved to him, a large sheet of paper folded into four. Mr. Lawrence blew his nose and went round the corner, and the paper would have been out of sight had he looked behind. Old Grayquill, trudging on busy in thought with Mr. Lawrence's debt, was moved by some idea of the man to look behind him. Mr. Lawrence had disappeared. Quite discernible from where Grayquill stood was the sheet of paper Lawrence had let fall. Old Grayquill stopped, peered, reflected that it might be a letter that he himself had unconsciously been toying with and had dropped or that in some other way had let fall from his pocket. He retraced the few steps that lay between and picked it up, and proceeded with it in one hand, whilst with the other he fumbled for his spectacle case. 
He immediately saw that it was a sheet of paper about the size of foolscap, but somewhat squarer, of a bluish tint. It was provided free of cost to the frequenters of the sailor's reading room at the Swan. He well knew the paper, for many a letter written upon it he had received. It was of a convenient size for those who used it, as first of all it was ruled on one side, which enabled a man to steer a straight course with his pen. The page was likewise so large as to enable a man to write big, and few who used it could write small. It also supplied plenty of space for erasures, whether of expression or spelling, and this was useful. When folded into four and sealed or wafered, the sheet became a letter which needed but the address to qualify it for the post. In the case of the sheet Mr. Greyquill held, it had been folded to resemble a letter, but it had not been made one. It bore no address, and the communication started at once without the prefatorial dear sir, or the like, and it closed without signature or initials. But Mr. Greyquill immediately saw that the handwriting in pencil was Mr. Lawrence's, and that the document must have fallen from that gentleman's pocket just now when they parted. We have seen that the frame which bounded Mr. Greyquill's portrait of honor was large. Most men recognizing the handwriting would have denied themselves the right of reading this letter, because they had found it lying in a public roadway for two reasons. The handwriting was known to them, and the recent presence of the writer where the letter was found would have identified it as its owner's business in no wise to be intruded on by a man of honor. But this sort of argument did not fall within the frame of Mr. Greyquill's picture of integrity. It was a letter lying ready for anybody's hand in a public way. Next, it was not addressed. Third, it was not signed. And fourth, though the contents were apparently in Mr. Lawrence's handwriting, yet some people did write, as Grey Quill knew, so wonderfully alike that there was no reason to conclude without strong internal evidence that the letter Mr. Grey Quill held was written by Mr. Lawrence. However else it was, it was certainly a draft roughly penciled of a letter that had been copied in ink and no doubt dispatched. Here and there was an erasure in ink, which proved that it had been copied in ink and corrected in certain places by the pen that was transcribing it. He had not proceeded far when his eyebrows, which, as we have heard, inimitably expressed the aspect of two white mice, arched their backs to an extraordinary degree as though in imitation of a cat when enraged. His mouth took on the posture of a whistle. With his eyes rooted to the sheet, he stopped and scratched his head until he nearly tumbled his hat into the road. Just then, certain large white-bosomed April clouds which had been leisurely sailing up from over the sea began to discharge some rain, and one shower was so smart that Greyquill took refuge in a small wayside barn, where until the rain ceased he had the opportunity of reading the letter several times. His astonishment was unaffected and amazing. With a habit of senility, he kept on muttering to himself aloud whilst he perused and reperused the letter. Is it possible? Is this the officer and the gentleman? Could an egg so full of criminal matter find any black fowl willing to hatch it in so pleasing a nest? And I am called an old scamp because I part with my honestly earned money for a consideration which is trifling in comparison with the benefit I confer, the help that I am to the man in need. This will require thought. I shall need to think pretty considerably before I decide. Meanwhile, Mr. Lawrence, I wish you a prosperous voyage, and I wonder what you will do when you find out that you have mislaid this letter, a copy of which to somebody or other, as pretty a scoundrel as yourself, no doubt, you have unquestionably by this time posted. Meanwhile, Mr. Lawrence walked towards his ship. He should have been on the whole well satisfied with his meeting with Mr. Greyquill. Perhaps the profound indifference which in reality possessed him as to the old scrivener's willingness to accept twenty-five guineas, or, in short, anything as an installment, was because he had long felt that the old man never durst take extreme action. Grey Quill knew that Mr. Lawrence was very popular in his own particular way in Old Harbour Town and the neighbourhood. He drank and treated, and in a high degree possessed the liberality of the sailor. The townspeople were proud of him, not only because he was a handsome and finely built man, but because he had shone in many deeds of gallantry whilst in the navy, and everybody was agreed that when Mr. Lawrence was court-martialed, the service lost as fine and plucky a seaman as was ever afloat, and one to be recalled to his duties with apologies and without delay. Admiral Sir William Lawrence was also highly respected, 
and people spoke with pride of his living in their neighborhood. It was likewise well known that Mr. Lawrence was a friend of the Actons, and in a small town of small gossips, the idea, if not the circumstance, of Mr. Lawrence having offered for the hand of the beautiful Miss Acton was not likely to be neglected or overlooked, and to do the gossips justice, they had imputed the rejection of the handsome and dashing young naval officer to his loose habits. Mr. Lawrence was well judged that if Grayquill locked him up for debt, Old Harbor Town would rise against him. His windows would certainly be broken, his person might go in danger, for there was more than one who had suffered at the hands of Grayquill who would be grateful for any sort of excuse to administer a sound cudgeling to the old man and take his chance of the law, fortified by the conviction that if it came to a fine, the amount would be subscribed several times over. Mr. Lawrence's business on board the Menorca did not keep him long. He was primarily there to see to the arrangements of his own cabin, and also of another cabin aft which was his design to convert to a sickbay. This end was chiefly accomplished in this cabin by the rough construction of a couple of bunks. Just before he left the ship, the young fellow Paul, whom he had told to come down on Saturday, stepped from the fore part of the ship where he had been watching two or three men caulking, and gave Mr. Lawrence his usual salute of a pluck at a forelock and a scrape of a hinder foot. Yes, said Mr. Lawrence, running his eyes over him. The articles are opened at Mr. Acton's offices. Go and tell the manager, but here, he pulled out a card upon whose face was some printed address, and with a pencil struck out the address, and wrote to the effect that the bearer called Paul had been engaged by Mr. Lawrence as his cabin servant. These lines he initialed and gave the card to the youth, bade him present it at the offices before one o'clock, or he would find them closed. "'Have you no better clothes than what you wear?' he said. "'No, sir. "'You may give an order for a suit of decent apparel fit to wait at table with, "'for I want you to understand that your duties may bring you to wait upon ladies and gentlemen, "'though you know nothing about that. "'Do you hear?' "'I, Your Honor,' answered the fellow with a grin decidedly above a clown's intelligence. "'You can pay for the clothes on your return, "'or by drawing an advance which Mr. Acton's manager will let you have.' "'Do you know Miss Acton?' "'The lady that lives at Old Harbor House along with Captain Acton,' answered Paul. "'I mean Captain Acton's daughter.' "'I should think I do, sir,' answered Paul, grinning. "'You know her well enough, for example,' said Mr. Lawrence, "'critically surveying him as though he took counsel within himself whilst he talked, "'that if I gave you a letter for her and for no other,' "'he frowned and with some passion emphasized none other, "'you are not likely to mistake, you are not likely to give it to another.' I couldn't mistake, Your Honor. I know the lady as I know you, and if so be as I did mistake, then I hope Your Honor would blow my brains out, for I shouldn't leave your side till Your Honor did. Mr. Lawrence, with a nod and an expression of face that was scarcely a smile, quitted the ship, and on the wharf found Mr. Eagle, who had as a matter of fact for a minute or two been watching him. That young fellow came aboard not long ago, said the mate, and I asked him his business. He replied that he was to be cabin servant by your choosing. I was nigh telling him he was a liar, for I couldn't suppose that the likes of him and his rags would suit a gent to sarve the king, and be waited upon, as I understand they do in the sarvice by marines. Lawrence smiled and answered, The marines may not be all you think them, Mr. Eagle, though they are a noble fighting corps. I took a pity upon that young fellow. I once to help him out of a difficulty and his gratitude rose to the height of a dog's, which, as you know, is very superior to man's. His ugliness interests me as the sort of beauty you find in the toad or the snake or other things which make ladies scream. He can bring dishes aft as well as another, and will look a very pretty young man in a new suit of clothes. I may not be down in the ship again till Monday. Good morning, sir. He walked away, leaving Mr. Eagle staring apace, and as he was going over the side... Paul, who was coming down, received a very acid, watchman-like look from the mate. Mr. Lawrence pursued the same road home by which he had gained Old Harbor. In all probability, had Mr. Grayquill not looked back, the young gentleman would have found his letter where he had unconsciously dropped it. That side of the bridge, the upper river water path, was much unfrequented, save on a Sunday, when lovers walked along it, and now and again a little family dressed in their best. 
It was many chances to one that the two or three who had passed along that path, since Mr. Lawrence and Mr. Grayquill had stood in conversation upon it, would have picked up the letter or even taken notice of it, so very remote from their ideas of things worth stopping for and examining on the highway was a folded sheet of paper. Mr. Lawrence walked on. He thought of old Grey Quill when he passed the place where he had stopped to talk. He crossed the quaint old bridge duplicated in the river, which streamed with becalmed surface up here and mirrored with the precision of a looking-glass the hues and shapes of every bird that swept the glassy surface for an insect, and gaining a rich lane formed by seven or eight hundred years of growth, for a monastery had stood here and a knight had had his manor where now the land was without relic of stone or brick, but the vegetation left by these people flourished, and though not above half a mile in length, that lane formed one of the most glorious, soothing, enfolding, impulse-creating walks in all that countryside, which abounded in little paradisiacal reaches of a like kind. I say Mr. Lawrence crossed the bridge, and emerging from the lane struck the high road, and presently gained his father's cottage. Even in three days the weather had worked a miracle in the increase of the beauty of the orchards, in which the admiral sat pipe in mouth, tankered at elbow, embowered, a sort of figure who went at his window would have greatly puzzled the knight of Spencer's fairy queen. For what should such a shape secretly ambushed in a spot fit only for the dancing tread of the fairy, or the gaping stare of the ogre who tries to see how the land lies by peering through two apple boughs, what should such a shape signify? Briefly arresting the clouds of smoke which rose from his lips, by vain efforts to extinguish by copious draughts from his tankard the magical fires that blaze in its interior? Whether the knight would have tilted at the figure or pricked his horse into headlong flight is a conjecture that must be left to those who have read the poem and know the man. The admiral just now happened to be at dinner. A shoulder of mutton and onion sauce with potatoes roasted with the shoulder and such other vegetables as the season yielded was a dish fit to set before a king and the monarch who turned up his nose at such a dainty should be made to banquet on nothing but the fare they give kings upon the stage. Indeed, Sir William would tell his friends he knew for a fact that a shoulder of mutton was the favorite dish of His Royal Highness Prince William. If it was objected that the joint yielded more bone than meat, he had his answer. Sir, I once said to a sailor who had obtained a berth ashore on sixteen shillings a week, How do you manage to rear your family? How many are there of you? Why, he answered, there's me and the old woman and four youngsters and grandfather. You never see meat, of course, said I. Oh, yes, we do, he answered. Meat, I cried. On sixteen shillings a week and seven people to support, four of them hungry youngsters? Well, he answered, I do's it in this way. On Saturday I goes to the butcher and buys a shoulder of mutton. On Sunday we has it ought. On Monday we has it cold. On Tuesday we have what's left of the cold. On Wednesday what's left of the cold we have made into ishi ashi. On Thursday we make what's left of the ishi ashi into ashi ishi. On Friday we does without, and on Saturday I goes to the butcher and I buys another shoulder of mutton. Now, the admiral would say with his face warm with triumph, Name me any joint but a shoulder of mutton that will supply what kept this family in meat, or the like of meat, from Sunday to Thursday. The admiral made his son welcome with unusual warmth. I never tasted a finer flavored piece of mutton. This jelly, too, lifts it to the dignity of a haunch. Those spring cabbages are very tender. We do not eat nearly enough vegetables in this country. What purifies the blood like a well-cooked spring cabbage that melts in the mouth? I am in hopes that we shall get a very good show of potatoes. Are you fresh from the ship? He had asked this question with much importance. Indeed, during the last two days he had manifested great interest in all that concerned the merchant service, had found out, for instance, and avowed the fact to Captain Acton, that our colonial empire was founded by British merchant seamen who, in the employ of merchant adventurers, sailed into all parts of the globe and established settlements, and often fought for the preservation, if not for the conquest, of principalities over which the king's flag now waved. He also pointed to the Honorable East India Company and asked if our own or any navy were superior in their capacity and splendor to those ships, and whether our navy treated their officers with so much consideration, liberality, and prudent foresight for each man's well-being. 
Yes, I have come straight from the Menorca. Will you complete your lading by the date announced for your sailing? I think so, and I hope so. I am very well disposed towards that scheme I have put into being, the construction of a sick bay. Every ship should have a sick bay. You must agree with me, sir. Wherever room can be found, a sick bay is most important, answered the admiral. A man falls sick of smallpox. What are you to do with him? You can't cure him, and you can't heave him overboard. But because one falls ill, it surely does not follow that the other should go sick. Besides, we carry no surgeon, which was an additional incentive to my suggesting a sick bay to Captain Acton. Oh, you have done well. Acton will value your foresight. A sick bay is a valuable detail in a ship's catalogue. They talked of this and of other matters connected with the Menorca, and then the Admiral went to the window to fill his pipe, and Mr. Lawrence to his bedroom. Some thought whilst eating with his father had occurred to him, and he felt in his pocket for the copy of the letter which he had drawn out with his pocket handkerchief, and which Mr. Graquill had got possession of. The handkerchief was there, but the letter was not. When he had drawn out his handkerchief and felt and found the lining of his pocket bare, when in short he completely understood that the letter was not where it ought to be and where he knew it should be, he turned as pale as the muslin curtain that partly veiled his window, started with an abrupt swagger of motion as though he had been struck violently behind, then with the energy of madness felt in all his pockets, pulling out everything, meanwhile gazing around the room with eyes which seemed on fire with their vigor of scrutiny and passion of fear. He endeavored to recollect himself that, by calming his terrors, his memory might better serve him. Urgent alarms often induce vain hopes which we should laugh at in a cool mood. He believed he might have put that letter down in his bedroom, and perfectly well knowing that he had not done so, and yet coaxed by a will-o'-the-wisp hope, he ransacked the room as though he knew that in it was to be found a gold piece of value whose discovery demanded a careful search only. What was certain in his mind was that the letter was in his pocket when he walked that morning to visit the Menorca. He remembered withdrawing it from his pocket, but in what part of the walk he knew not, and re-perusing a portion of it to refresh his memory. He tried to find comfort in the recollection that the letter bore no address and no signature. But a thundercloud of horror came down on this feeble streak of sunshine when he recalled the damning, incriminating contents of that sheet which he had scrawled in pencil at the Swan Inn. Whoever found it would know that Mr. Lawrence and Mr. Lawrence alone had written it, and this too, irrespective of the handwriting. But here he found another little hope. Some squalls of wet, one very heavy, had set the kennels running shortly after he had met Mr. Grayquill, and if that letter had lain exposed to those three or four deluges, it not only stood to be changed into a mere rag to the eye which none would dream of even glancing at, but the writing must have been washed out to a degree to render the sense of the letter unintelligible. He considered that it was not above two or three hours when that letter was in his pocket, and that it must have fallen somewhere betwixt his father's house and the Menorca in that time. For he had taken the same road to and fro. He reflected that that road was but little used compared with the lane that led to the bridge where the Acton's carriage had stopped. Understanding as a sailor the preciousness of time, and conceiving that if the letter had by some strange mischance fallen during his walk unobserved by him, it might still rest in the spot where it had dropped, in so much that chance, for the fellow was a gambler at heart, might concede him yet an hour, even two hours, in which to find it. He put on his hat and marched out of the house, just saying to his father in the window that he had an appointment and should miss it if he didn't hasten, and then stepped out, casting as he went to right and left of his path eyes as piercingly scrutinizing as those which the madman darts when he seeks for the philosopher's stone. It is needless, of course, to say that this searching walk was in vain. Whatever lay white in his road he rushed at, and in his gizzard he cursed the vast number of pieces of white paper which did somehow, as though distributed by innumerable malicious gray quills, attract his eye and retard his progress whilst he turned them over. On his way this side the bridge he met an old man with a stick, who stopped in his lame walk to turn about any little heap as I met. This old man was attended by a dog, who smelt at what the man touched. "'Have you seen a letter?' cried Mr. Lawrence, a broad piece of paper folded into four lying in the road. "'Seen a what, Your Honor?' "'Where are you from?' "'From Oozles.' 
Mr. Lawrence repeated his first question. I don't know what you mean, said the old man. Mr. Lawrence easily perceived that he didn't, and went on his way, always hunting with his eyes. Past the bridge he met another old man, a peasant with silver hair, fit, dressed as he was, to walk upon any stage, and immediately take part in any performance that included a peasant, a foster child, and a baron. This white hair gave him a reverend look, and his legs were strangely bandaged round about, and his smock was a gown in which he could have preached a sermon without exciting much suspicion as to the propriety of his dress. "'Have you seen a letter folded in four lying in the road?' shouted Mr. Lawrence. "'I'm a little art of earring,' was the answer, and the picturesque old man put his hand to his ear shell-wise. Mr. Lawrence went close to him and shouted. "'Guard bless your worship,' said the old man in a sweet voice and a face beautiful with the touches of the pencil of time upon a countenance originally open, gracious, and good. I hadn't received a letter since her last from my poor old wife, and that'll be twenty year ago, as I know by the laying of the foundation stone.' Mr. Lawrence broke away and asked no more questions during the rest of his walk. He saw no letter, nothing like it. He went on board the Menorca, and seeing the maid at the main hatch, asked in an offhand way if a copy of a letter had been found in the cabin or any other part of the ship that morning. No, sir. And there was an end. With wrath in his heart, and cursing himself again and again as a barnyard idiot fit for spread eagling only to carry such a missive as that about with him, when its miscarriage might prove its destruction, might even now be working it. He stepped onto the wharf and came across Paul. Here, said he. The youth approached. I have lost a letter this morning, said Mr. Lawrence, explaining its form and size, and it must have fallen from my pocket somewhere between my father's house and this ship by way of Old Friars Road. If you can bring me that letter, or find out if it has been found, and if so by whom, before we sail, you shall have five pounds. Simply a letter, your honour, folded into four, without address, written in pencil, and not sealed, said the hunchback. That's it, exclaimed Mr. Lawrence. I'll do my best, sir, and I'll work from dawn to night to find it, if it's to be found, was the answer. End of chapter 6「LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell. Chapter 7. Where is the Menorca? Mr. Lawrence was, for a few days, very uneasy, but uneasy is a mild term to express the state of a man's mind that starts at a look or an exclamation who fancies he is whispered about when two go past him talking, who expects that every man who approaches him is going to speak to him about the letter he has found, who imagines that every look that his father fastens upon him is a prelude to a tremendous attack, who is willing to attribute the silence of Captain Acton to the consideration of what steps, in the face of such an enormity, should be taken by him against the son of his old friend Sir William Lawrence. But Lucy Acton smiled and curtsied when he passed as usual. Old Miss Acton was nervously polite in her way, in her little chirrupy salutations. Captain Acton was sometimes down at the ship, but had nothing to say about the finding of a letter, good or bad. Therefore, after a few days of miserable anxiety, during which he was remarkable for sobriety and for conspicuous regard to his personal apparel, Mr. Lawrence allowed the subject of the letter to slip from his mind, satisfied that it had been reduced to pulp by the wet that had fallen on the morning he lost it, or that it had been blown by some sportive stroke of breeze into a corner, or a place where it was as much lost as if it had dropped from its pocket into the ocean. As evidence that Mr. Lawrence was improving in general esteem, a brief conversation passed at Old Harbor House on the fourth evening following the day of the loss of the letter. Captain Acton had invited some friends to a rubber at whist. Sir William Lawrence was to be amongst the guests, but as he lived near he was always late, explaining that the fact of his living near excused him for taking plenty of time. 
Miss Lucy was lovely in black muslin, spangled with stars as the hair is dusted with gold. Whilst they waited for Sir William, the conversation turned upon his son. How greatly Mr. Lawrence has improved, not indeed in manners, for he was always a very fine gentleman, a very pretty gentleman, but in appearance, since you gave him the command of the Menorca, Captain Acton. This was said by Lady Lamont, the widow of an East India director, who had achieved a reputation for beneficence in the district without spending very much money. "'What I much admire in Mr. Lawrence,' said Miss Acton, "'is his art in making a leg on entering a room. "'His art in this way rises to a degree "'that is very unusual in men nowadays, "'and I should think particularly in seafaring men. "'His deportment embraces the whole room. "'A man has a right to claim some sort of excellence "'who can make a leg with skill. "'Tis a very old-fashioned term, madam,' said General Groves. "'Current in my time, but I question if much understood in this. "'It is most happily explained in the play of The Man of the World,' said Miss Acton. "'I was never more pleased than by Sir Pertinac's Maxicophant's reply to his nephew's question, "'how he had made his way in the world. "'Sir Pertinac's replies, "'By booing, sir. "'A great deal of money and fine social positions have been obtained by booing.' "'Hence the value of being able to make a leg in your opinion, madam,' said General Groves. "'If trousers come in, legs must go out,' said Lucy. "'What is the good of being able to make a leg with elegance, "'if fashion compels you to conceal the eloquent member?' "'Well said, miss, well said,' cried Miss Proudfoot, "'who was a very good hand at whist and very quarrelsome over the game.' "'I don't believe, myself,' said Miss Acton, "'that trousers ever will come in. "'Men whose calves are of a good shape, "'and who have long been in the habit "'of admiring and cherishing them, "'will be very reluctant to conceal them "'in those ridiculous, unmanly garments called trousers. "'As the majority of men strut this petty earth on drumsticks,' "'said General Groves, "'I expect that in a few years hence "'the universal male wear will be trousers.' He looked at his own legs. Time had somewhat shrunk them. Mr. Lawrence has wonderfully improved of late, said Miss Proudfoot with a glance at Lucy. I should say that, when in the Navy, he was one of the handsomest men in that glorious service. All praise of him is gratifying to me for his father's sake, said Captain Acton, whilst Lucy sat in silence with the shadow of a smile lurking about her mouth, but invisible in her soft, dreamy half-veiled eyes. "'Would not you like to take a trip to the West Indies in your father's ship, miss?' said the Reverend James Prettyman, who had been headmaster at a fashionable school for young gentlemen for many years past, in a city about twenty miles distant from Old Harbor Town. "'Only the other day,' replied Lucy, "'I told Mr. Eagle, the mate of the vessel, that I could not imagine a pleasanter trip than a voyage to the West Indies in the Menorca, but I stipulated that the sea should be always smooth. There it is, said Miss Acton. Give me a sea as smooth as our lawn, and I will accompany you, my dear. Here Mr. Pierpoint, who held some influential position in connection with Old Harbor, and was one of Captain Atkins' frequent guests at his whist tables, exclaimed, The master of the Aurora told me, a day or two ago, that Mr. Lawrence was attempting a wonderful innovation in merchant ships by the introduction of a sick bay after the custom of men of war. It is true, sir, said Captain Acton, and Mr. Lawrence loses nothing in my esteem by his idea and application of it. The merchants care nothing about their sick. A sick man is no man's dog, I believe is one of their adages. Every vessel, supposing her to be above a certain tonnage, whether flying a pennant or not, should have quarters properly fitted for the reception and treatment of the sick among her crew. "'I should think so, indeed. Poor men!' exclaimed Miss Acton. "'Suppose she carries no surgeon,' said Mr. Pierpoint. "'Her master should be able to dispense physic with the aid of a book,' said Captain Acton. "'Besides,' The idea is to isolate the sufferers from the rest of the crew in the black, wet, 
slush-lighted holes in which merchant sailors are forced to live in dozens, breathing the aroma of their own breath, and creating such an atmosphere that the wicked halo of miasma gleams a corpse-light round the flickering, stinking flame which hovers at the mouth of the spout of the lamp. "'What an awful picture!' cried Miss Proudfoot. "'Who'd be a sailor in the merchant service?' exclaimed General Groves. "'It is a noble life,' said Lucy, "'but it must be nobly lived.' "'Oh, madam, I thank you,' exclaimed Mr. Prettyman. "'To live nobly, you need pure air to begin with, "'but it certainly does young Mr. Lawrence great credit to be the first, "'as I apprehend from this conversation, "'to introduce sick quarters for sick men on board merchant ships.' I doubt even if the East India Company's vessels are fitted with such humane receptacles. And yet Nelson, said Lady Lamont, liked the merchant service so well that he was reluctant to leave it to enter the Royal Navy. When he came from his West India voyage in a merchant ship, his favorite saying was, Aft the more honor, forward the better man. At this moment, the conversation was interrupted by the bustling entrance of Admiral Sir William Lawrence, when, of course, the conversation was immediately changed from the subject of his son and sick bays to other matters. The Menorca was announced to sail on Tuesday, 3rd May, at half-past twelve o'clock. All her people, without exception, lived in or near Old Harbor Town. Consequently, her crew was quickly assembled. On the day previous, they had bent all sails, rove all running rigging, done all that was necessary to render a ship fit for the sea. She lay between two other vessels, but was readily distinguished, not only by her rig, but by the height her masts towered above those of the others. It had been arranged, between Captain Acton and Admiral Lawrence, that the latter should breakfast at half-past nine with Captain Acton who would then fill an hour with transaction of certain business, which he could deal with in his own house, leaving the admiral to amuse himself in the grounds with his pipe, and, if he chose, a telescope, after which they would walk leisurely down to Old Harbor, go on board the Menorca, and take a farewell view of the vessel with a godspeed to her new commander. Lucy, overnight, had said she would join them, but she did not appear at the breakfast table. Her father inquired for her, and was told that she had left the house an hour earlier, or perhaps more, to take the morning air and a walk with her dog. Neither Captain Acton nor Miss Acton witnessed anything strange in the absence of Lucy from the breakfast table. She was in the habit of taking these early walks, and would often turn into a cottage whose inmates she well knew, and breakfast with the occupants, enjoying more the egg-warm from the nest, the home-cured rasher of bacon, the pot of homemade jam, the slice of brown bread and sweet butter, the bowl of new milk, or the cup of tea which, on such grand occasions, would be introduced by her humble friends, than the choicest dainties which her father's cook could send to the breakfast-table at Old Harbor House. "'I expect you will find her down at the wharves waiting for the ship to sail,' said Miss Acton. I met Mrs. Jellybottle yesterday. She told me that Farmer Jellybottle had received on the previous day a large parcel of very substantial eatables from his brother, who is head gardener at Lord Lancaster's. Lucy has possibly been tempted by the display. Here is her dog, anyhow, exclaimed the Admiral, as the little animal marched into the room and stood near Lucy's chair, with forefoot lifted, as though she awaited her mistress. "'How sits the wind?' inquired Captain Acton, who, being used to his daughter's occasional absence, took no particular interest in her failure that morning to attend the breakfast-table. "'I believe,' said the Admiral, casting his eyes at the window, "'that it blows a pretty little offshore breeze from the north. The sea is rippled by it into a dark blue, and your ship will sail into it with almost square yards.' "'No ship of mine departs without my heart accompanying her,' said Captain Acton. "'I believe I am bound to go in one of them to the West Indies some day or other, "'but not whilst there's an enemy cruiser to be met with in the circle of the horizon.' 
"'I suppose, sir,' said Miss Acton to the Admiral, "'that there is no further news of the descent of the French.' "'Plenty of news, madam,' answered the admiral. "'But most of the reports are lies born of fear. "'The French never can get a footing upon this land.' "'This led to a brief argument between Captain Acton and Sir William, "'who was making a prodigious breakfast off a large crab, "'which he affirmed was much more delicate eating than the lobster, "'as the shrimp is sweeter than the prawn, "'though people whom the actor Quinn loved to deride "'were of a different opinion.' He had begun with crab, and was now plowing heartily through a dish of eggs and bacon, with a view to letting go his anchor in some savory sausages. Captain Acton fed capriciously, as a man who thinks of his digestion more than his appetite. After breakfast, the captain went to his library to transact certain business with a lawyer and one or two others. Miss Acton to the housekeeper's room, there to receive certain poor people, and Sir William Lawrence, filling his pipe, waited in the grounds until Captain Acton should appear, and diverted himself as best he could with conversation with the gardeners and in admiring the springing flowers. He came from the kitchen garden and was standing in the middle of the lawn, where he obtained a view of the sea betwixt the bluff on which stood the windmill and the other bluff on which stood the lighthouse. He sent his gaze in the direction of Old Harbor, it was a heedless gaze. He took no particular note. Alongside the wharves, a number of small vessels were moored. They somewhat crowded the eye with their rigging and spars. The brig of war lay in her accustomed place off the pier. Apparently it was not Lieutenant Tupman's intention to put to sea that day. All of a sudden the Admiral's gaze, that was somewhat heedless, that of a man who takes in a general prospect without regard to particulars, grew intent. His eyes were fixed on Old Harbor. In a minute they grew more than intent. Astonishment dilated them, and they were not without the sparkle of alarm. He rubbed his eyes, and removing his pipe from his lips, strained his gaze once more at the shipping in the harbor. "'Good God!' he ejaculated. "'Where is she?' Only a little bit of sea lay within his sight. That which he had seen ran in blue ripples between the points of cliff which framed the entrance to Old Harbor. Though the scene was distant, his sight, for a man of advanced age, was fairly good, and even all that distance off, he could, without much difficulty, distinguish the fine lines of the Aurora's masts, bearing their truck high above the spars and rigging of the vessel abaft and ahead of her. He walked to a bed of flowers at which an undergardener was at work, and said to the man, "'Have you good eyes?' "'I can see a good bit, Your Honor. "'Do you know the Menorca?' "'Oh, yes, sir. "'Could you distinguish her if she's in the harbor at this distance?' "'Why, certainly, Your Honor,' answered the man, looking at the Admiral. "'Then tell me if you see her.' and the admiral watched him with such an expression of face as he might have looked with at a falling barometer in seas distinguished for cyclones and typhoons. The gardener gazed and gazed, and his intent regard crumpled his brow, for he seemed ambitious to be able to say he could see the ship. After a considerable pause, during a portion of which the man sheltered his eyes with his hand, he exclaimed, if the Menorca's a three-masted vessel, square-rigged forward, and fore and aft rigged on the mizzen mast, then all that I can say is, Your Honor, she ain't among that shippin' down there. Without speech, the Admiral walked away swiftly on the stout staff he was used to carrying, striking the sword with it till you witness the energy of his thoughts with each blow, and entering the hall of Old Harbor House, took down from its brackets a very handsome, and for those times, powerful telescope, with which he returned to the place he had left, where he might obtain the best view of the harbor that was to be got from the grounds of the mansion. He leveled the tubes at the shipping, but witnessed no signs of the Menorca. He was amazed. The glass sank in his hand, and he rubbed his naked eye and fastened it again upon the harbor. The vessel was to sail at half-past twelve, and it was now about quarter past ten, and the Menorca was gone. 
the old gentleman took aim with his glass at the little breadth of sea that was in sight in a hopeless way conceiving that a sail invisible to his bare vision might leap into the lens out of the distant blue recess and proclaim herself to his nautical eye as the ship that was gone nothing was in sight he stood musing it was as we have seen about a quarter past ten captain acton would not have completed his business until something after eleven should the admiral invade him with the announcement of this strange disappearance of his ship he considered the matter a little and concluded that it must be impossible but that although captain acton had been silent on the subject at the breakfast table he must know the business of his ship and that it was understood between him and mr lawrence that if the wind served or anything unforeseen befell or if mr lawrence in his judgment chose to sail before the time announced he was at liberty to let go his fasts and blow into the open at any hour he pleased thus it struck the old man though secretly he did not regard his own reasoning as sagacious nevertheless he determined to await captain acton's arrival from the business which was holding him in his library so he lighted his pipe afresh with a singular little pistol-shaped pipe lighter and struck about the grounds with his staff blowing great clouds out of the depth of his meditation and often heaving a sailor's blessing at the two points of cliff which interrupted the view of the sea to east and west of the coast it was a few minutes past eleven when captain acton came out of the house talking to miss acton who was followed by her own and lucy's dog sorry to have kept you waiting so long admiral exclaimed captain acton why sir answered the admiral i don't see that we should be late if we did not go at all i don't quite understand said captain acton gazing with friendly interest at the jolly round weather-dyed face of sir william whose look certainly at this moment did not wear the jocund expression they were used to carry your telescope is in the hall sir said the admiral but your sight is very good i presume that you are aware that your ship has left her berth and is not in the harbor not in the harbor cried miss acton good gracious has she sunk do you think captain acton sent a swift and searching glance at the shipping in the distance he then with quick steps fetched his glass by his movements and countenance the admiral immediately perceived that he did not know his ship had sailed he pointed the telescope at the shipping the minorca was certainly not one of them the river flowed bare from the sea under its bridges to its inland recesses and offered no creek nor shelter to the eye for a vessel of any tonnage if the bark was not in the harbor she had put to sea both observers on the lawn were sailors and did not need to be told this if your son has sailed said captain acton with a face charged with perplexity doubt irritation and astonishment he had no authority to do so what has caused him to take this step surely as a sailor who has served the state he before all masters in the merchant service ought to understand the meaning of the word of command sir william's countenance resembled the expression that properly decorated captain marriott's port admiral when he was told in no uncompromising language you be damned and where pray is lucy said miss acton in a voice querulous with alarm and other feelings for miss acton was one of those old ladies who are always praising providence for its blessings but who are very willing to find calamity in trifles she is a long time gone who says that she breakfasted with the jelly bottles and at what time did she leave the house and if mamie went with her why is she here she added turning her eyes upon the little terrier the hall door was wide open a footman was crossing the hall captain acton called to him what time this morning did miss lucy leave the house i don't know sir i'll ascertain sir and the man disappeared the minorca not in the harbor exclaimed miss acton staring at the cluster of rigs beyond which rose the breadth of narrow sea shining in a blue tremble to its horizon no accident could have happened 
or you would have heard, brother. Miss Lucy went out at about half-past seven, sir, said the footman. Come, Admiral, we will walk to the harbor and inquire into this matter, said Captain Acton, who was somewhat pale and looked extremely disconcerted. But where is Lucy? cried Miss Acton. Send the people about and make inquiries, answered Captain Acton. She is making calls. It is the Menorca that has disappeared. But what a dreadful responsibility to leave upon my shoulders, said Miss Acton. Suppose those I send about come back and say she is not to be found. It is more than I can bear. The charge is too awful. What am I to do if she is not to be found? "'But she is to be found,' cried Captain Acton, surveying his sister with a quarter-deck severity of look. "'What do you think? That Lucy has run away with the ship? She has breakfasted somewhere and is gossiping somewhere else. I leave you to make inquiry, sister. The area to be covered is not wide. She will be telling you where she has been before we return. Come, Sir William, this is the most extraordinary thing that has happened to me in my time.' The two gentlemen set out at a vigorous pace, leaving the poor old lady overwhelmed, motionless, and gaping with the alarm raised in her by this enormous obligation of discovering whether her niece had breakfasted with the jelly bottles, or with other folks, where she was, and why she had not returned since half-past seven this morning. All the conversation of the two officers consisted of idle speculations as to the cause of the Menorca having sailed, some hours before the time announced for her departure. It was clearly necessary that Mr. Lawrence should have much business to do before he could quit his moorings, and that if the ship had sailed as early as the captain and the admiral suspected, her captain had completed all necessary arrangements on the previous day. For first, the loading of the vessel was to be fully completed, and all the necessary papers and documents to be on board, the clearance or transire from the customs duly obtained, and the master furnished with copies of the charter party, or memorandum of charter party, and of the policies of insurance on both ship and goods. "'I saw Mr. Lawrence on several occasions yesterday,' exclaimed Captain Acton, and he did not suggest, by a syllable, that he was making ready to sail early this morning before the various officials he would have to see were aboard." The admiral struck his staff strongly upon the earth, and stopped to look through a break in the hedge in the lane or road which they were descending at Old Harbor. The captain stopped, too. They stared again. "'But he must have had some object,' cried the old admiral, whose face was strongly flushed with heat and conflicting passions. "'We shall very shortly find out what that object is.' and I shall feel very greatly astonished if it does not satisfy you, sir, as well as myself. They resumed their walk. When they reached the bridge, they found old Mr. Grakewell leaning over the rail and gazing with intentness, with a sort of lifting leer which could not be defined as a smile, though it was like the shadow of one, in the direction of Old Harbor. This person was not used to address either of the gentlemen on meeting them in the public streets. They were accustomed to nod in silence. But this morning, as the admiral and the captain passed him, the admiral, so close as to brush his coat-tail, the old scrivener turned with a rapid motion and exclaimed, still preserving his singular leer, "'I beg pardon, gentlemen, but as I fail to see the Menorca amongst the ships, may I inquire if she has sailed?' "'That, sir, is the errand which is carrying us to the wharves,' answered the admiral, and the two passed on, whilst Mr. Grakewell, retaining a hold on the rail of the bridge with his hand, gazed after them with an unchanged face. It was hard upon twelve o'clock when Captain Acton and his friend reached the wharves. Though there was plenty of shipping about to suggest occupation, there was little apparently doing. Here and there a song was monotonously sung by sailors or laborers who were leisurely taking in or discharging cargo. Had the Menorca sailed at her appointed hour, the little harbor would no doubt have looked gay with colors flying on the ships, 
and plenty of gossips to see the vessels off on the wharf. Captain Acton and the Admiral turned into the Custom House, and the first person they met after leaving it was Josiah Weaver, master of the Aurora, a thick-set man of a dark red complexion, rendered more glowing still by the sun, greasy deep red hair, earrings, and brown eyes which move sharply in their sheaths. "'I find,' cried Captain Acton, eagerly addressing him, "'that the Menorca has sailed. "'How is this? "'Do you know anything about the matter?' "'She left the harbor at about quarter past eight this morning, sir,' answered Weaver. "'At about a quarter past eight, exclaimed Captain Acton. "'What was Mr. Lawrence's object in quitting his berth before the fixed time?' Captain Weaver faintly smiled, slightly glancing at Admiral Lawrence. "'When I saw the ship starting,' said he, "'I walked over to her and asked Mr. Lawrence, "'who was standing right aft watching the crew working, "'making sail and so forth, "'what made him in such a hurry, "'and he answered that he had received news on the previous night "'of a French cruiser that was hovering over this part of the coast, "'that when last seen, she was standing to the eastward, and that he had made up his mind to sneak the Menorca out at daybreak, if possible, so as to have the heels of her should she shift her helm, as he had no mind to start his first voyage in Captain Acton's employ, by being taken by a French cruiser, and locked up for a time no man could determine. "'And that was the reason for sailing which he gave you?' said Captain Acton. "'Yes, sir.' Captain Acton looked at the Admiral who was staring sternly into Captain Weaver's face. "'Mr. Lawrence told you,' said Captain Acton, "'that he had received the news of this cruiser last night. "'At what hour, do you think?' "'That, sir, I couldn't say,' answered Captain Weaver. "'But we might take it as his having heard it after eight o'clock. "'In that case, he must have intended during the day,' "'said Captain Acton, addressing the Admiral, "'to sail early this morning.' for, as I have explained to you, he could have had no time to do his business at so early an hour at which he started this morning, nor would the officials be seen at that time. Therefore, he must have made the necessary arrangements yesterday for what he contemplated as a daybreak departure this morning. Does the ship call anywhere in England before her final departure for her port? asked the admiral, in a voice that proclaimed his heart hot with bewilderment, doubt, and anger. "'No, sir,' answered Captain Acton. "'A pity,' said the admiral, striking the ground with his staff. "'Otherwise I would have posted it, caught him, and asked him his reason, which to satisfy me would have to prove infinitely more intelligible than the one Captain Weaver has repeated.' I saw him two or three times yesterday, said Captain Acton. He had nothing to say about French cruisers in the offing. Nor did he give me a hint that he was taking the necessary steps to quit this harbor early this morning. Is the ship in sight? exclaimed the Admiral. No, sir. A man came down from the cliffs, answered Captain Weaver, and I asked him that question, and he said she'd rounded the coast to the westward. The pilot, said Captain Acton, was John Andrews. Was he on board, do you know? Yes, sir, answered Captain Weaver. I took notice of him on the foxhole. They could obtain no further information from Captain Weaver. They called at the Swan and saw the landlord, who told them that he had seen Mr. Lawrence on the previous day, that, in fact, he had lunched at the inn and sat next to him, but had said never a word about the change in the sailing of his ship. They called upon Mrs. Andrews, the pilot's wife, who informed them that Mr. Lawrence had told her husband the day before that the hour of sailing had been changed and that the Menorca would leave Old Harbor shortly after eight o'clock instead of half-past twelve. "'Did Mr. Lawrence state the reason of this change?' inquired Captain Acton. "'Not to my husband, sir,' who naturally thought the matter all right, and said he would be on board at half-past seven. They met Lieutenant Tupman of the saucy brig of war, a large, fat, purple, smiling man, 
with the word grog written in small red veins over his nose and parts of his cheeks. Obviously a good-natured drunken fellow who would fight, no doubt, if a Frenchman opposed him, but who preferred his bed and the swan to frequent sentinel cruisings in its little ship of war. Both gentlemen knew him slightly. They ventured on this occasion to stop and accost him. They asked him if it was true that news of a French cruiser being off the coast had come to hand, and he answered that he had not heard of such a ship being near the coast. The replies of other questions put to Mr. Tupman were equally unsatisfactory, and it now being past one o'clock, and the information the captain and the admiral had obtained, not being worth the questions that had elicited it, they stepped onto the bridge and walked in the direction of Old Harbor House, the admiral saying that he would accompany the captain to his home, as he was anxious to hear if Miss Acton had obtained news of Lucy. End of chapter 7 Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona, November 12, 2021Chapter 8 of the Yarn of Old Harbor Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell. Chapter 8 Where is Lucy? Captain Acton and the Admiral walked a few hundred paces in silence, each lost in thought. Very abruptly, the Admiral stopped, obliging his companion to halt. "'If I have your permission, sir,' he exclaimed, "'I will at once send a messenger in a post-chase to the Commander-in-Chief at Plymouth, and after stating the facts, request him to send a ship to overtake or intercept and arrest the Minorca, and you will then be able to ascertain direct from my son the meaning and cause of his extraordinary conduct. Captain Acton resumed his walk, and the Admiral rolled by his side, beating the ground. That idea has occurred to me, he said, and I have dismissed it, sir, for what reception would the Commander-in-Chief give such a message as you propose? The master of a ship, who is fully empowered to act in the interest of his owners, chooses to leave a certain harbor some hours earlier than the time announced. The reason he gives is that there is a Frenchman in the neighborhood whom he is anxious to avoid and escape. The commander-in-chief's sympathy would be with him in that. It is no case of piracy to ship a pilot and the mate and crew which the vessel carried last voyage. And besides, sir... Would the sloop, corvette, or frigate which the commander-in-chief might choose to send overhaul the Minorca if your son determined that his purpose, whatever it may be, should be prosecuted without interruption? She is certainly as swift as the fastest thing that we have in the navy, and there is no reason to suppose that any vessel as fast would be dispatched in chase. Plymouth is a long distance from this spot, and the messengers are not always the rapid people we desire them to be. No, sir. We have to accept the position as it is. The ship has sailed. Mr. Lawrence's conduct is unaccountable. We must continue to regard him as the honorable, well-meaning man which I have found him during our association in the matter of this command, and I must await, with a certain degree of confidence, a letter in which he will communicate the full meaning of what is now unintelligible to us. The admiral bowed in silence. He was the father of the person they were talking about. Captain Acton's acceptance of an incident which must instantly prove sinister to a suspicious intelligence was noble and gracious, and it was certainly not for the father to endeavor to prove his son a rogue and a scoundrel, and perhaps worse still, in the teeth of the disposition of his employer, to continue to place trust in him. When they were within ten minutes' walk of Old Harbor House, they met Mr. Adams, who was an agent for a gentleman who lived in London, 
and who owned a great deal of property in the neighborhood of Old Harbor Town. "'I beg your pardon, squire,' said Mr. Adams, addressing Captain Acton, who, with the admiral, was passing on with a nod. "'But I understand that inquiries are being made after your daughter.' Both the old retired officers instantly stopped. "'Has she returned home?' asked Captain Acton. "'I cannot tell you that, sir, but this morning, at about a quarter before eight o'clock, I was about ten minutes' walk this side of Old Harbor Bridge. I was going up the road and met your daughter, who was alone, coming down. A few minutes after I had passed her, I happened to look round and perceived that she had been stopped by a young man, humpbacked and otherwise deformed, well known to me as a fellow who used to hang about Old Town, and called by the single word, Paul. As your daughter was alone, I slackened my pace and continued to look to see what the man wanted with her, and observed that he gave her a letter which she read, and I heard her exclaimed on reading it, Oh dear, I hope it is not serious. And she immediately walked swiftly on, followed by the fellow called Paul. She turned the bend of the road, and I pursued my way. I beg your pardon, exclaimed Captain Acton whose agitation was marked when Mr. Adams ceased to speak. But may I inquire if you are quite sure that this was my daughter whom you met? Sir, there is but one Lucy Acton in this country, and no man who has set eyes on her is ever likely to forget her beauty and sweetness. Captain Acton bowed, but his distress was lively. "'What sort of fellow was this who stopped Miss Acton?' inquired the Admiral. "'Was he a papa? Broken clothes, whining voice, the suppulent's demeanour, that sort of thing. "'I have known the fellow by sight some years. "'He got his living by running errands, "'and has in his day, I believe, been watched with some attention by the magistrates. "'He is a red-haired, hump-backed, long-armed man with rounded legs.' and I marked a peculiarity in him whilst he addressed the lady which I have before taken notice of when passing him, as he lounged in the sun or stood waiting in a door. I mean that whilst the young lady was reading the missive, he scratched his left shoulder precisely as a monkey scratches himself. Captain Acton started and stared hard at Mr. Adams. "'Did you notice how he was dressed?' he asked. In a camlet jacket, there was something of the sailor's rig in his costume. Then the fellow, said Captain Acton, is steward of the Menorca. This gentleman, said he, addressing the admiral, has exactly described the figure of a man who passed me in the cabin two or three days ago when I was talking to Mr. Lawrence. Judging that he belonged to the ship and being struck by his appearance, I asked Mr. Lawrence who he was, and he answered that he was a poor devil whom he had shipped as the steward or captain's waiter out of pity, and he said something about having once paid a fine for the man to rescue him from a term of imprisonment, to which he would have been sentenced for some trifling offense. The admiral's face wore an expression that was almost imbecile with bewilderment. From whom was that letter? Who is this person that Miss Lucy has fled to help? It cannot possibly be my son, sir. If he had met with a serious accident, would the ship have sailed? But even if he had met with a serious accident and left the duty of going to sea with the mate, would he have sent to Miss Lucy? I am utterly beaten. I see nothing and can conjecture nothing. Captain Acton, with a violent effort, had by this time recollected himself. "'I am much obliged to you, sir, for your information,' he said to Mr. Adams. "'We may find her at home, sir,' he said, addressing the Admiral. "'An explanation will simplify the miraculous. Good day, sir, and many thanks.' He bowed to Mr. Adams, and again set off with the Admiral for Old Harbor House. "'To me it is impossible to suppose,' said Sir William, 
that my son could have written the letter which Mr. Adams saw your daughter reading. Captain Weaver told us plainly that my son was aft on the quarterdeck of the Menorca at the time that she was hauling out from the wharf. It is perfectly clear, therefore, that no accident could have befallen him. Nor is it imaginable that, even if he had met with a disaster, he would dream of communicating with your daughter. Why your daughter, sir? If they are on bowing terms, we may take it that their intimacy scarcely goes farther. Depend upon it, there is some man in connection with this business, in whom your daughter is interested. Of course, sir, you will understand me to mean as a sweet and beautiful Christian sympathizer, as one to whom every sort of misfortune appeals, to whom suffering and misery are quick to make themselves known, being sure of heartfelt womanly pity. The moment I have had a peck, after hearing whether Miss Lucy has arrived at home, I will devote the rest of the day to inquiries about this person who wrote the letter which Mr. Adams saw delivered. Speculation is idle, exclaimed Captain Acton, with a slight flavor of impatience in his manner. I am profoundly puzzled. There can be no question from Mr. Adams' statement, and from my own observation, that the fellow who delivered the missive is cabin boy, or steward, or whatever you please to call him, of the Menorca, chosen by your son, as he admits, though it seems to me as I looked at him that nobody less likely and less inviting for such a post could have been found in the district. These and a few further words brought them to the gateway of Old Harbor House. They entered and found Miss Acton in the dining room. Well, she cried in a voice of tremulous eagerness, have you heard of her? This was proof conclusive that Miss Acton had not she has not returned then, said Captain Acton. No, nor can I get to hear of her, answered Miss Acton, whose voice trembled with tears and terror. Wasn't she down on the wharves? We have heard of her, but not as we could wish, sister, said Captain Acton. But what have you done to find her or to hear of her? Why? answered the old lady. I sent George and Joseph on horseback to every house where she is known, and she has visited none, nor been seen by any this morning. Yes, Miss Moore, as she was passing our gate, caught a sight of her, coming out of the house at half-past seven, or at some such time, and gave her a curtsy and received a smile, but nobody else that George or Joseph met and called upon has seen her this day. What have you to tell me about her? Captain Acton repeated Mr. Adams' statement. The old lady's face was slowly molded into a mask that her friends would scarcely have recognized by the horror and terror that worked in her. She cried, A dirty fellow giving her a letter and beguiling her and luring her into some dreadful place, perhaps to her destruction. Oh dear, oh dear, what is to be done? Can't you be discovered? Can't the bellman raise the alarm? Who can the wretch be that wrote to her? And why should she rush away to his help? Oh, dear, oh, dear, what is to be done? I'll do something, said the admiral. I'll call upon you this evening and tell you what I have found out. Farewell for the present. No, I thank you. I must go home first, and I'll get a bite that awaits me. And then away to Old Harbor Town and the place shall be dredged, and the fellow who wrote the letter found, and the lady restored to her home if wrong has been done her, if there is one ounce of energy left in this old composition. He bowed with the vehemence of a man who butts at another, struck the floor hard with his staff, and rolled out on legs that showed themselves more expeditious than his years seemed to promise. Captain and Miss Acton sat down to dinner, an elegant repast was rendered insipid in every dish by the absence of Lucy. The captain's excellent, if fastidious, appetite was gone, and his eyes often wandered to his daughter's vacant place. Brother and sister had but one subject in their minds. 
They talked but little, however, for servants were present. When they were alone, Miss Acton exclaimed, I hope I may be forgiven if I do him a wrong, and I love his old father, who is the soul of honor and a fine example of a true gentleman of the sea, but I cannot help thinking, brother, that Mr. Lawrence has had a hand in our Lucy's disappearance. And the worthy old lady's eyes grew dim as she pronounced the words, Our Lucy. Captain Acton started from a reverie and looked at her attentively. You want to imply, he cried, that there was an understanding between Mr. Lawrence and my daughter? I cannot imagine why the steward of the ship came to be employed, as Mr. Adams tells us, an assertion you justify by saying that you saw this man in the cabin of the vessel, unless Mr. Lawrence sent the letter. Captain Acton expanded his chest, and a look of haughtiness entered his face. Sister, is your opinion of Lucy such that you can imagine she can have anything to do with Mr. Lawrence unknown to me? But a quality of stubbornness was one of Miss Acton's characteristics. He offered her marriage, brother. Yes, and she rejected him with the preemptoriousness which I should have expected in her. A woman, said Miss Acton, cannot but think with more or less kindness of the man who offers her marriage and who loves her. She may reject him, but she will always feel a tenderness for him. But do I understand, said Captain Acton, that you mean that Lucy was secretly attached to the man whose hand she declined, and that she speeds to him at the first call that is made upon her by such a missive as the fellow Paul delivered? I cannot but think, answered Miss Acton, that Lucy had a secret hankering after Mr. Lawrence. He is exceedingly handsome, in bearing, he is superior to any man of quality I ever met, and for fine manners you must look to the aristocracy of this country. He can make a leg with a grace equal to any master of elegant salutations, and though his character is bad, yet there are many points in him which women admire, and I say, she continued, with perseverance and a fixity of meaning truly astonishing in an old lady who in most matters scarcely knew her own mind, who was easily filled with terror, and who seldom acted without consulting her friends. Lucy has a secret liking for the man, which could scarcely escape the observation of any one who watched them when they were in company. With an expression of face that was near to amazement, Captain Acton said, Do you... Want me to believe that Lucy has eloped with Mr. Lawrence? Lord forbid! She is too God-fearing and too nobly and sweetly moulded as a woman to be capable of any such descent. Then I do not understand you, said Captain Acton. What has become of her? cried Miss Acton sinking suddenly into her tremulous voice and into a manner of alarm, bewilderment, and general confusion of mind. What shall you do to find out? As I am quite convinced, said Captain Acton, that Mr. Lawrence has nothing to do with this business, and as I feel persuaded that the call made upon her is by some man or woman, for how are we to know the sex of the person who wrote that letter? in whom her charity is interested, and whom she has been helping according to her want, in ways unknown to us. I shall devote the afternoon, as Sir William intends, to making inquiries in Old Harbour Town and about the wharves. But she cannot be in Old Harbour Town or even in the district, broke in Miss Acton. Or why did she not return to dinner? She has had the whole morning... From a little after seven till now is a very long time, and a hundred acts of charity may be performed in less. Though Captain Acton was not a man to be influenced by his sister's opinions, 
he knew her to be in many directions a shrewd, observant woman, who could deliver herself of many stupid, acquainted notions. Whilst at times she would astonish him by the sagacity of her views and the penetration with which she interpreted human motives. We shall not be surprised, therefore, when we learn that shortly after dinner he ordered his mare to be saddled and rode straight into Old Harbour Town, where he stabled the mare at the Swan, and walked direct to the wharves, first of all to learn if anybody had seen Lucy down at the shipping earlier that morning. He made for the Aurora, and found Captain Weaver on board. He immediately related Mr. Adams' story, and asked Captain Weaver if he had seen Miss Lucy Acton down by the Menorca, or near her, or aboard her shortly before she sailed. No, sir, was Captain Weaver's answer. I came on to the wharf as the Menorca was warping out, and talked with Mr. Lawrence from the quayside. I saw nothing of the young lady who, depend upon it, sir, would have immediately caught my attention had I seen her. It is very strange, said Captain Acton, that that misshapen fellow made by Mr. Lawrence, the steward of the ship, should be employed to convey a letter to my daughter at so early an hour when there was very little likelihood of finding the young lady abroad. The whole job of the ship sailing before her time is a mystery to me, sir, said Captain Weaver. Walk with me, and we'll endeavor to find out if Miss Lucy Acton was on the wharf after the hour of half-past seven this morning, and before the Menorca sailed. Captain Weaver knew many who were engaged on the several wharves, and so indeed did Captain Acton. They asked two or three score of different persons the question, but the majority had not been down on the wharves at that time, and the few who were at work declared they had not seen her. It seemed impossible to Captain Weaver, as well as to Captain Acton, that so beautiful and well-known a lady as Miss Lucy should make her appearance on the wharf at a time of day when scarce more than laborers were about, without being either recognized or seen and her presence borne witness to by those who did not know who she was. They went on board the several vessels lying in the harbor, but the answer they received was that of the wharf. Miss Lucy Acton had not been seen, or at all events, noticed. "'I will leave you,' said Captain Acton, "'to make further inquiries, sir.' and you will be pleased to immediately communicate with me at my home should you meet with anybody who can positively swear that my daughter was down here between seven and eight this morning. He seemed convinced by these inquiries at the wars that, at all events, Mr. Lawrence could have had nothing whatever to do with the communication which Mr. Adams had seen Paul place in the hands of Miss Lucy. Who, then, was the sender of the note. And how was it that Paul, who should have been on board his ship since she was on the eve of sailing, should have been engaged to carry the letter? There was really no particular reason why the writer should be a man. Why should not she be a woman? She might even be a relative of the fellow Paul. Lucy was a girl of singular kindness, who was always helping others and going amongst the poor and ministering to the afflicted. And though Captain Acton could not positively say, he might readily believe that she had one or two or three poor sufferers on her list, whom she saw to and helped with her purse, and one of these, possibly a woman, might have written the letter in a moment of urgency, intending it for delivery at Old Harbor House. Captain Acton walked slowly towards Old Harbor Town. He was sunk in thought and was in deep distress and at a loss to know what to do. He had no machinery of police to command. 1805 was a year very primitive as compared with 1905. He reflected that the first step in the disappearance of his daughter as represented in the statement of Mr. Adams might indicate nothing in respect of the real cause of her disappearance, because suppose his surmise was correct and that she had hastened to the help of some afflicted or humble person whom she befriended, she might, after having left the place wherever it was, have met with some disaster. She might have fallen over a cliff. 
she might on some roundabout way home have been robbed and left for dying. In short, when a person mysteriously disappears, a hundred reasons for his or her vanishment will occur to the mind, and any one of them may so satisfy, so convince, that those who accept it will go to work as though it were the truth, though it possesses but the very attenuated merit of being a conjecture. At six o'clock, greatly wearied, Captain Acton mounted his mare at the Swan Stables and rode home. He was very pale. Indeed, this man loved his daughter, who was his only child. His immediate question, put with bright-eyed passion to the servant who came to the door, was, Has Miss Lucy returned? No, sir. Has news been received of her? I don't think so, sir. Has Admiral Lawrence been here? No, sir. Captain Acton walked into his house and sought his sister, whom he found alone in the dining room. She was seated on a high-backed chair, knitting. Her own and Lucy's dog lay at her feet. She started at the entrance of Captain Acton, dropped her knitting in her lap, and half rose at her brother, clutching the arms of the chair. Well, she cried in a note that was like a suppressed scream with excitement, fear, and expectation. What have you heard? Is there any news of her? What have you to tell me? He sat down, looking very weary. I have heard nothing of her, sister. Nobody saw her on the wharf at the time the Menorca sailed, and there was plenty about laborers ashore and sailors in the ships. Then what have you done to find out what has become of her? Believing that she might have met with some accident, God knows of what serious nature, on her return from the person whose letter she received, Miss Acton looked stunned at such an idea. I called at Aerosmith's first of all, and wrote out a placard, offering a reward of fifty guineas to anyone who can find Miss Lucy Acton, who can state her whereabouts or who can give any information as to her disappearance since half-past seven o'clock this morning, which was dated and the day named. This placard will be printed and pasted in Old Harbour Town and over a wide area of the district before nightfall. I also gave a copy of this placard to the bellman. What further publicity could I command? But what do you fear, brother? What could have happened to her? Why, suppose on her way home by way of the cliffs, or by any other of the roads by which this house may be gained, she fell upon the rocks, or was met by a band of gypsies, or attacked for her money and left for dead. His feelings overcame him, and he looked upon the ground in silence. Nothing of the sort, I am sure of it, exclaimed Miss Acton. Who hears of such outrages happening here? But to fall over the edge of a cliff is not an outrage, said Captain Acton. She is too careful. She may safely be trusted. Besides, are there not blockaders stationed along these cliffs? And would not one see her on the rocks? No, no, no. An accident is not the cause of her disappearance. The more I think, the more persuaded I am that Mr. Lawrence has had a hand in this horrid business. Why did he sail so early and long before his time? Why was his steward Paul engaged to carry the letter? You again want to imply, sister, said Captain Acton with a darkling face, that my daughter has eloped with a man she rejected. Rejected? But she still has a hankering for him still, said the old lady with one of those smiles of knowingness which make the liniments ghastly when bitter sorrow and tragic trouble are the topics talked about. Captain Acton left the room to refresh himself with a change of apparel, and returned after a brief absence. He was a man of considerable but not powerful self-control. He entered the room with a face that indicated a certain resolution of mind and said to his sister, I have been thinking, perhaps, that we have been unnecessarily flurried and somewhat hurried in our conjecture and efforts. 
I believe I have done well in giving all possible publicity to the fact that Lucy left her home this morning and has not returned. But when I come to reflect that even now it is not twelve hours since she started on her early walk, I consider that she has not been long enough absent to cause us the bitter anxiety we have felt and are feeling. Suppose after visiting the person from whom she received the letter, she breakfasted with a friend on the other side of Old Harbour Town. This friend may have induced her to stop to dinner. A drive might follow. There are hundreds of things in this business which, when explained, would seem perfectly reasonable, so that at any moment she may turn up and tell us the story of her day's outing, and wonder that we should be so troubled because of an absence that she makes perfectly comprehensible. I shall hold to this view, he continued firmly, until the night is advanced. If she does not return tonight, then we must take further steps tomorrow. What steps? asked his sister. What steps have not been taken that remain to be taken? He had suddenly sunk in reflection and did not answer her. I should be uneasy in mind in any case, said Miss Acton, but that odious steward of the Menorca being in the business together with the unwarrantable sailing of the vessel hours before her time fills me with dread and terror, and I cannot, brother, listen to what you say about her breakfasting and dining with a friend and going for a drive and so forth. She would guess at our suspense and anxiety. Is our Lucy a girl to cause unnecessary pain and unhappiness, not indeed to those who love her as we do, but to the humblest creature in the world? Just then, the door was opened, and the footman announced, Admiral Sir William Lawrence. The old gentleman entered, not with his familiar deep-sea rolling gait, but slowly and warily, and with an air of dejection. Lucy's dog welcomed him by barking and rushing at his shoe and trying to bite through it. Miss Acton rose and sank in a curtsy, which is to be seen in these days only on the stage, but her kindly heart quickened her gaze for anything that invited sympathy, and she immediately said, Sir William, you are quite worn out. You need refreshment. Pray sit, pray sit. What will you take? We will have some brandy and seltzer water, said Captain Acton, pulling the bell, knowing this drink to be as great a favorite with the Admiral as hock and soda water with Lord Byron. I am sorry to say, said the Admiral, sinking into a chair, that I have brought no news. I have scoured Old Harbor Town and can obtain no information, said Captain Acton. But it is certain that no one seems to have seen her down on the wharf between seven and eight this morning. I heard the bellman recite your notice, said Sir William, speaking leisurely, as one who is tired out. That and the bill which they are beginning to paste as I came this way should help. I've walked my legs off. I've inquired everywhere. I, too, asked if Miss Lucy had been seen down at the harbour at any hour this morning. But my fixed idea was, and still is, that the person who wrote to her through the Menorca steward was somebody that she helped, somebody in poverty and want, and I called upon everybody likely to know of the existence of such an individual, but to no purpose. The parson, the apothecary, all the tradespeople I looked in upon could tell me nothing. Once I thought I had run the person we want to earth, Miss Moore, who keeps the greengrocer's shop told me that there was an old woman who lived in a cottage just out of Lower Street, out of whose house she had once seen Miss Lucy act an issue. I got the address, called at the cottage, and saw a squalid female who said she was Miss Mortimer's niece, and that Miss Mortimer had died that morning at five o'clock. She said it was true that Miss Acton occasionally visited Miss Mortimer and brought her little comforts and read to her. I got no further. This is the extent and value of my report. And I am as profoundly puzzled, said the Admiral, 
raising the glass of brandy and seltzer, and examining it before he drank. As I was this morning. She may turn up at any moment, said Captain Acton, with more gloom than the hope his words expressed justified. She has only been twelve hours missing. Only, cried Miss Acton, Sir William, she went on slowly, nodding at him whilst her face hardened. I have a conviction which my brother does not share. It seems to me, sir, impossible to think of the unexpected and terrifying departure of the Menorca, hours before her time, and the conveyance of a letter by the steward of the vessel, without feeling the conviction I speak of. And what is that conviction, madame? asked Sir William, from whose jolly round face fatigue had robbed much of its warm color. I regret to have to say it, said Miss Acton, but I must think, I cannot help it, that Mr. Lawrence's hand is in this strange disappearance of my niece. Captain Acton slightly frowned upon the old dame and exclaimed, I think, Caroline, you should have withheld your conviction, from the present at all events, from Admiral Lawrence. Sir William looked firmly and somewhat sternly at Miss Acton, and said, I am very sorry, madame, that you should hold this opinion. Very sorry, indeed. I had thought you the friend and well-wisher of my son. In this respect eminently the charitable and warm-hearted sister of Captain Acton. But if you mean to imply that Mr. Lawrence wrote the letter to Miss Lucy, then you have to confess, which would be an indignity done to a beautiful character, that your niece was a willing recipient of my son's missive, that she hastened to him on reading the contents of his communication, and that, in short, the design of the Menorca's premature sailing was that Mr. Lawrence and Miss Lucy Acton should elope, a thing not to be dreamt of, at an hour when few were abroad, and when there was little or no chance of the news reaching her home that Captain Acton's daughter had sailed in the Menorca. Scarcely had the old gentleman pronounced these words when a footman, throwing open the door, exclaimed, Mr. Grayquill presents his humble respects to Captain Acton, and desires leave to speak with him. Mr. Grayquill? cried Captain Acton. Mr. Grayquill? echoed the Admiral, looking with a changed face at the footman. Mr. Grayquill? cried Miss Acton. Why? He may have come with news of Lucy. Bid him step in. The footman disappeared. What on earth but some news of my daughter can bring Grayquill here at this hour, said Captain Acton. The Admiral looked deaf and continued to stare at the door, which in a few moments was again flung open, and Mr. Grayquill entered. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Yarn of Old Harbor Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell. Mr. Grayquill's Visit Mr. Grayquill entered the room by two paces, and, placing his hand upon the spot where he supposed his heart to lie, made three separate bows to the company, each of the your most humble and obedient servant school. It was an expression of ceremony which, for mingled respect and senility, should have pleased, as it no doubt did please, Miss Acton. He was a figure, striking in its way as he made these bows, with his long, snow-white hair, his heavy white eyebrows, his long, curling nose, the purely congenital, satiric leer that characterized the formation of his thin lips, and his faded dress, which was a very good representation of his mind, aided the impression produced by his face. 
Admiral Lawrence gave him a nod, which was barely a mark of recognition. Captain Acton bowed to him in silence. Miss Acton cried out, "'Pray step in, Mr. Grayquill, and be seated.' Grayquill sidled, rather than walked in, and sat down on a chair removed from the others, and observing inquiries strong in each face, as those who watched him would not condescend to inquire the purpose of his visit, but waited to hear it, he said, I was coming out of Lower Street this afternoon, when I heard the bellman recite the announcement that Miss Lucy Acton had been missing from her home this morning, since between seven and eight o'clock, and a reward of fifty guineas is offered to anyone who shall proclaim her whereabouts, or who shall help to restore her to her family. That is so, said Captain Acton, viewing him gravely. Have you news of her? cried Miss Acton. I wish to state, sir, said Mr. Grey Quill, addressing Captain Acton, that if I should prove instrumental, not in the restoration of Miss Lucy Acton to her home, but in your discovering where she is, and how she got there, my candor will be due entirely to the very great respect I entertain for the young lady who has always had a kindly word for me, and whose character is an extremely lovable one, and to the regret, I may say indignation, that one so young, beautiful, and rich should fall into such unworthy hands. He glanced at the admiral, who returned the look with a compressed brow, whilst with his right hand he seemed to be keeping time to an inward and secret tune with the play of his fingers upon the knee, where the leg of his breeches fell into his stocking. "'Oh, pray continue, sir!' "'Pray continue,' cried Miss Acton, in a voice that was almost husky with the hysteric quality of her emotions. "'In other words, sir,' continued Mr. Grayquill, still addressing Captain Acton, "'I beg to state that, if I should be so fortunate as to help you in your trouble, I desire no money reward, nor should dream of taking any.' Captain Acton merely bowed. "'I have not met with the usage—' Old Grayquill went on calmly, steadily, exasperating Miss Acton by a preface that was disgusting and needless, whilst she thirsted for the one essential fact that I certainly think I deserve from either Admiral Sir William Lawrence nor his son, Mr. Lawrence. He spoke with so complete a neglect of the Admiral's presence that the old gentleman might have been out of the room. They have no claim upon my kindness." "'We shall be thankful to receive any news of Miss Lucy Acton,' said Captain Acton, with that collectedness of manner which implies the glazing by a vigorous will of passions growing turbulent. Two or three days after your appointment of Mr. Lawrence as master of the Menorca, I chanced to be going by way of Old Friars Road to visit some houses belonging to me. At the bend of the road, which conceals the bridge and Old Harbor Town, I met Mr. Lawrence, and we exchanged a few sentences on the subject of the sum of three hundred pounds, which he owes me. He informed me that when you, sir, had paid him off on his return, he would hand me the sum of twenty-five guineas in part payment of his debt. We each pursued our way. When I had gone a few yards, I stopped and turned to look after him. He had disappeared round the bend of the road but just about the place where he and I had conversed, I saw something white. It was a letter. Thinking I had dropped it in unconscious play of my hands during our talk, I returned and picked it up. The old man put his hand in his pocket and pulled out the letter, which he held on his knee, whilst he continued. It was not addressed, as you will presently see, but the contents which I took the liberty of reading— the letter being open and manifestly a stray article which was anybody's property, assured me that it had just fallen from the pocket of Mr. Lawrence, who had brought it out possibly with his pocket handkerchief, but who would not know of his loss by looking behind him as the turn of the road hid it from him. I was greatly astounded by the contents of this letter, which is in Mr. Lawrence's handwriting, and somewhat incensed by reading, that he termed me an old scamp. I, who had proved his friend at a time when friendship was valuable to him, 
and who have shown him every consideration since. Will you read the letter, sir? Mr. Grayquill left his seat and stepped across with a missive to Captain Acton. The captain glanced at the contents and without reading extended the letter to the admiral, saying, Is this your son's writing, sir? The admiral took the letter, ran his eyes over it, and answered, returning the letter to Captain Acton. It is. It is a draft or copy, said Captain Acton. It is undated, and it is without the formal beginning of my dear, etc. He then read slowly and deliberately, the handwriting being good and clear. I should have answered your letter sooner, but I have been so worried by debts and difficulties, by compulsory idleness and the absolute impossibility of finding anything congenial to do, that I have had no spirit to communicate with you or anybody else. But the wheel of fortune, which has depressed me to the very bottom, has, by another revolution, raised me. I must tell you that I am very heavily in debt. Even in this antiquated hole, I owe an old scamp named Grayquill three hundred pounds, of which I have only had two hundred. I am in debt, some of them debts of honor, to several men, a few of whom I have spoken of in my time as brother officers, and one of them quite recently threatened me with the law. In addition, I owe a lot to various tradespeople in London and elsewhere, so that my personal liberty hangs by a hair, and at any moment I may find myself clapped on the shoulder, arrested for debt, and flung into jail, there to languish possibly for the remainder of my days, for it is quite certain that my father cannot, even if he would, come to my help. His private means are very small, and his pension inconsiderable, and though he has behaved very well in maintaining me since I quitted the service, and allowed me to use his cottage as a home, he is a man whose morality is high and severe, and he is the last person to part with a farthing in discharge of debts which he regards as dishonorable. I had made up my mind to ship before the mast in a vessel bound to America, where I should have left her, and sought my fortune in a new country. When, through the great kindness that a rich gentleman in this district has for my father, I was offered the command of a bark called the Menorca, a handsome little vessel of about five hundred tons, on terms which a merchant shipmaster would consider liberal, but which to one, in the face of what I owe, are as a penny piece in the value of a guinea. Captain Acton, R. N. retired, you may have met him, is the owner of the two little ships. He lives in a beautiful old house, planted in the midst of a fine prospect of gardens and orchards. He has one child, a daughter, a young creature so beautiful that the instant I saw her, I irrevocably lost my heart to her. I offered her marriage. She rejected me, probably because she had been told that I was a drinker and a gambler. I am, nevertheless, determined to possess her as my wife, and with that view have promptly conceived a stratagem or plot which should either end in enabling me to pay off all my debts and live at peace in this country, or be hanged as a pirate. The admiral, who had heretofore discovered no signs of life, started in his chair and clenched his fist. It is you, my dear Dick, an old companion, messmate, and friend, with whom I have enjoyed many a jaunt to which I could never recur without passionately lamenting the days that are no more, who will help me in this desperate undertaking. I propose to navigate the vessel, not to Kingston, Jamaica, to which port she ought to be bound, but to the port in which you live, Rio de Janeiro. By a ruse which must prove successful, I think, I shall inveigle Miss Lucy Acton on board, and everything being ready, shall make sail immediately after she is carefully confined in my cabin. I have had a cabin set apart for my own use, which I represented to Captain Acton was to serve as a sick bay. This drama has been well rehearsed. When far out at sea, the crew will be summoned aft. I shall read some pretend sealed orders from Captain Acton, requiring me to carry the ship to Rio de Janeiro, and to sell her, if possible, after discharging the mate and crew, 
who will receive from Captain Acton, on application, treble the amount of their wages they would have got for sailing the vessel to Kingston. I shall also take care to destroy the ship's papers, and my story will be that I was overhauled by an American cruiser, who sent an officer on board. He examined the box of papers and took it away to show to his captain, as he considered them unsatisfactory. The cruiser then braced her main topsail yard to the wind and sailed away with the box of papers. On my arrival, we will consult together as to the safest course to be adopted for the sale of the ship and cargo, by which time I have no doubt the lady will have agreed to marry me either for love or because she has been placed in a situation which must render marriage imperative to her in the name of honor. With the money which I shall make, thanks to you, through this business, I will pay off all my debts in England, and Lucy Acton, being my wife, or promising me her hand, I may count with absolute certainty upon the forgiveness of her father, who is not likely to abandon his only child, for a behavior that was no fault of hers, and the rest must be left to time. I think our man to help us for a liberal commission will be your friend, José Zamorano y Vila. His scrupulosity in financial matters is not likely to prove a great hindrance. Eh, Dick? I shall follow this letter soon after the ship that takes it, so that you will not have long to wait before seeing me after you have read it. This letter was unsigned. It was manifestly a rough draft of the posted letter, which had been amplified before it was sent. Captain Atkins' hand dropped with it on to his knee. He exclaimed, that is the end. There is no name. On which Miss Acton screamed out, What did I say? Are not my words true? To think of our beloved Lucy imprisoned in a ship, sailed away with, never to be seen more, perhaps, in the hands of, of, oh, what is to be done? What is to be done? The Admiral started from his chair to his feet. His face was full of blood. His hands were uplifted and his fingers tightly locked. He cried, in a voice that was like mimic thunder in its power, and breaks and falls. I will hire a vessel and chase him. I will pursue him, though he should lead me to the very gates of hell. Oh, my precious God! I, who have ever striven to act my part well in the service of my country. I, who have ever struggled to live an honorable and a stainless life as a gentleman and a sailor. Why am I dishonored and degraded by the possession of such a son? He unclasped his hands and buried his purple face, and stood rocking and reeling as though he were about to fall in a fit, and sobbed twice or thrice with that dreadful note of grief in his dry-eyed agony, which makes the fearlessness of manhood and suffering one of the most pitiful, painful, and pathetic of spectacles. Captain Acton laid his hand on the Admiral's shoulder. Bear up, he said gently. Presently we will discuss the matter calmly. God is good, and this blow may not prove nearly so heavy as we now think it. With kindly pressure he obliged the old seaman to resume his seat, and then turned with something of fierceness upon old Greykwell. May I ask, said he, flourishing the letter, how is it that you, sir, being fully admitted by the perusal of this document into the base plot Mr. Lawrence was hatching, should have chosen to keep the intention to yourself when, by the revelation of this letter, you could have put it out of Mr. Lawrence's power to carry off my child? Mr. Greykwell stood up. His eyes had a peculiar light in them. A faint flush was painted on each cheek and seemed to make whiter yet the whiteness of his brows and his hair. Sir, he answered, I am much sneered at in this town and district. I am very well aware that few have a kind word for me. If you, sir, or Admiral Lawrence condescend to bestow a nod upon me as I respectfully pass you in the street, it has the character of the recognition with which you would honor something you disdain, which you are compelled to see, and by that nod acknowledge the existence of. Your beautiful daughter, Miss Lucy, on the other hand, has always been gracious and kind to me. In the light and sweetness of her presence, 
I am sensible of the warmth and glow which make me feel that I am human and a man. There is no office I would not discharge to oblige her. I make money by lending it, but I would give her money, much if she needed it, for the delight I take in her sympathetic, tender, and generous nature. When I read the letter you hold, sir, I did not believe that Mr. Lawrence would have the power, or the art, to carry out his scheme of kidnapping your daughter, and I was only assured that his base plot, as you term it, had proved triumphant by the calling of the bellman, and by the letterpress on the placards which they are pasting about the place. Then I was determined that you should be instantly apprised, through the medium of Mr. Lawrence's own letter, of what had become of your daughter. Otherwise, sir, the loss of your ship, by an act of piracy, must be nothing to me. Mr. Lawrence promises, in his letter, that he will repay all his creditors, of which I am one to the extent of three hundred pounds. And, as I am of opinion that this is his honest intention in order to enable him to dwell in England at liberty, I resolve to keep my own counsel and to await the receipt of my money. Thus speaking, he picked up his hat from the floor, bowed to Captain Acton and to Miss Acton, and left the room without noticing the Admiral. "'What a wicked, dreadful old man!' exclaimed Miss Acton. "'To preserve such a hideous secret, and to be willing to wait for payment of his three hundred pounds out of another man's robbery. "'What is to be done? What will you do, brother? Our Lucy must be rescued. Is it too late? She was here in this house this morning at seven o'clock. The ship cannot be far off. Cannot she be reached?' "'Captain Acton,' holding the gray cool letter in his hand, stepped to a bell-robe and pulled it. The hue of his face was ashen, the expression cold and severe, such a face as he would carry had he to confront a crowd of armed mutineers. "'What is to be done? What is to be done?' cried Miss Acton. "'What is to be done?' exclaimed the Admiral, starting from a silence in which his form was motionless, though his lips might have been seen moving whilst his eyes were fastened upon the carpet. "'This is to be done, madam. I will commute my pension. I will mortgage my household furniture. I will get together every penny that is to be had by realization of what I possess. I will post to London to-morrow.' He pulled out a great gold watch and surveyed it for two or three breathless moments. "'And in the river seek and assuredly find a sharp-stemmed vessel which shall convey me to Rio de Janeiro.' and I shall be in that spot, if God but grant me wind enough, to greet the arrival of that villain, my son, to secure the person of your daughter, and return her in safety. That I will do. That I will do. And the poor old fellow stood up, snapping his fingers whilst he flourished his arms at Captain Acton and his sister, and made several mouths in an articulate phrase. A footman entered. "'Send George at once,' said Captain Acton, "'with a gig as fast as American trot to Captain Weaver. "'He must call at his house first, "'the Paragon out of Lower Street. "'If not at home, he must find out where he is "'and drive him back here with express orders from me "'that I must see him without loss of an instant's time.' "'The footman ran out. "'Miss Acton looked with eager, tearful expectation at her brother, "'who addressing the admiral,' exclaimed you are a sailor sir and so am i and tis natural that we should both light upon the same scheme but there is not the slightest occasion for you to sacrifice a farthing of your property nor to post to london to-morrow to find a ship some little schooner or other swift enough to enable you to be at rio when the minorca arrives such a ship he said his face brightening a little with an expression of triumph I possess in the Aurora. She has discharged her lading. She can be ballasted at once, and if a crew can be assembled by this time tomorrow evening, I may be far down the channel in such pursuit as must make the bark's chances of escape hopeless, unless indeed she eludes me in the night, or in thick weather, in which case I shall thrash on and be at Rio a week before she enters the harbor. The Aurora, cried the Admiral, with a sudden elation. 
which might have passed as a flare-up of a man in his cups, who has sat for a while in maudlin dejection. By heavens, Acton, you have hit it. Where should I find such a vessel for this purpose? Why, aboard of her in a few days you would be alongside the Menorca, if you are fair in the scent of the trail of her wake, and wanting that, why, your noble and beautiful little clipper will have been at Rio a fortnight before the bark heaves in sight. May I accompany you? But you must allow me to do so. You must permit me to be your companion, for, by God, Captain Acton, it is for you to recover your daughter and your property, but it is for me to greet that malefactor, my son. He smote his thigh hard with the palm of his hand. The noise was like the report of a pistol. He was wont to strike himself thus, in the days of his command, when angered, or when he expressed a purpose, which he intended to fulfill, though it meant life or death. "'Certainly, Sir William,' said Captain Acton. "'I shall rejoice to have you with me.' "'Good, good!' cried the old fellow, and rolling across to his friend, he grasped him by the hand, and held on, looking at his friend with a face awork with emotion, with an expression, indeed, that seemed perilously close to further dry sobs. But, said Captain Acton, who was perhaps helped to a display of comparative composure of mind, by the Admiral's reception of the news, though, if possible, we shall sail tomorrow evening, or the following day in pursuit, my opinion is, sir, that even if Mr. Lawrence were left to his own shifts, he would never be able to compass his undertaking. First of all, he has a highly respectable man, who has proved a good servant to me, to deal with in his mate. Will Mr. Eagle permit him to carry the Minorca to Rio? Will a crew have nothing to say? What will be thought by all hands when it gets about that my daughter is on board, a prisoner in confinement in the cabin? And is my daughter so enamored of Mr. Lawrence that, because he has placed her in a highly equivocal situation, she will be willing to marry him, or to have anything to say to him on their arrival at Rio? Oh, no, oh, no, interposed Miss Acton. She would not be our Lucy if she did. My conviction is, continued the captain, that when Eagle and the crew get sin of Mr. Lawrence's intentions, and understand the blackguardly act he has been guilty of in trepanning my daughter, they will turn upon him, and either do him some serious mischief, or lock him up, and under eagle, proceed direct to Kingston, or if they have not gone far, return to Old Harbor. That's what will happen, cried Miss Acton. Would our sailors permit a stranger like Mr. Lawrence to steal your daughter and your ship, and what is in her, and be dismissed from your service by him at Rio, with promises of your paying them treble wages, when they got home, and applied to you? Oh, no, no, no. And Mr. Lawrence, continued Captain Acton, speaking in a cool voice that was almost sarcastic, little understands the habits and customs of the merchant service, when he supposes that owners give their shipmasters sealed orders to be open, and read to the crew in mid-ocean, or when they are well away from their port of departure. This is the practice of our service, sir, and Mr. Lawrence, as a naval man who is ignorant of the habits and discipline of the merchant's ship, greatly errs in supposing that the crew will be misled by any such device. Suppose, said Miss Acton, that a French man-o'-war should capture you and make you prisoners, what is to become of Lucy? We must defy every chance in our determination to recover my child, answered her brother. Ay, that must be, exclaimed the admiral, even though heaven should reign French men of war. An hour passed from the time the message was sent before Captain Weaver arrived. Captain Acton desired to see the skipper alone, out of delicacy to Sir William, of whose son it would be impossible to speak without causing the poor old gentleman distress more or less acute. The admiral found out Captain Atkins' well-bred and considered wish in the one or two hints he dropped, but stuck manfully to his chair nevertheless, and when Captain Weaver was announced, 
he still remained one of the three occupants of the room. The skipper entered, red, nervous, with a countenance slightly lifted by astonishment. Of course he knew that Miss Lucy Acton had been missing since the morning, but that was all he did know. "'Walk in, Captain Weaver. Pray, take that chair,' said Captain Acton. "'I can ask you no questions until I make you acquainted with what has happened.' "'Then Miss Lucy has been found, sir,' said the captain. "'She has been kidnapped by Mr. Lawrence,' answered Captain Acton. "'She left this house early this morning "'to take one of those fresh morning walks which she enjoys, "'and was seen to receive a letter from the hunchback steward of the Menorca. "'She must have immediately hastened on board the bark, "'urged by some statement which I am disposed to agree with my sister Miss Acton, was forged or manufactured by Mr. Lawrence. "'My son, Captain Weaver, my son!' broke in the Admiral tremulously. "'The best of fathers have known your lot, sir,' answered Captain Weaver. "'There is no need to go to the Old Testament to learn that.' "'The long and short of it is, Captain Weaver,' said Captain Acton. "'Mr. Lawrence, having lured my daughter on board the vessel he commands,' through some ruse which I am unable to explain, made sail at once with the lady on board, not for Kingston, Jamaica, but for Rio Janeiro, where he proposes to discharge the mate and crew after reading to them a forged promise by me that their wages to Kingston shall be trebled on their return and on their application to me. He also proposes to sell the ship and cargo, and he is manifestly acquainted with some scoundrel out of Rio, who, in spite of such vigilance as the officials of Rio may be in the habit of exercising, will undoubtedly discover a market, though not necessarily at Rio. Rascally things can be done at sea, sir, said Captain Weaver, whose face, instead of gaining in the look of amazement that had colored it on his entrance, was slowly settling as Captain Acton proceeded into an expression of hard-weather composure. With such a look, perhaps, a thoroughbred, stout-hearted British sailor would view the calamity or catastrophe that was pressing strong men down upon their knees in devotion and causing tears of terror to flow from the eyes of others. "'Oh, Captain Weaver, there are many wicked people at sea,' cried Miss Acton. "'Think of the pirates! Think of the slavers!' "'My poor, poor niece!' "'Now, sir,' continued Captain Acton, "'it is not the intention of Sir William Lawrence, "'or myself, to suffer my daughter to be kidnapped "'by an act of treachery, "'which I forbear more to say about "'in the presence of my honourable and gallant old friend, "'Admiral Lawrence.' "'Oh, Acton!' exclaimed the Admiral. "'Nothing that you can say could approach what I feel, "'could express what I suffer.' "'My intention is,' Captain Acton went on, "'to fit out the Aurora at once for a chase. "'We know where the Menorca is bound to. "'Mr. Lawrence's course must necessarily be yours. "'Your vessel can sail two feet to his one. "'If we are unfortunate enough to miss him on the high seas, "'we shall be at Rio a week or a fortnight "'before the Menorca arrives to receive him. "'When can you get your ship ready for sea?' Captain Weaver reflected. "'Today, sir,' he said, "'is Tuesday. "'I'll engage to be under way by Saturday.' "'Not before?' cried Miss Acton, "'an exclamation which Captain Weaver received with a faint smile. "'That will be giving the Menorca long odds, won't it?' said Captain Acton. "'No, sir. "'If we took a fortnight to fit the clipper for sea,' We should overhaul the Menorca or be ahead of her long before she heaves her port into sight. What's the distance to Rio, Captain Weaver? asked the Admiral. All five thousand miles, sir. What would you call the Aurora's average? inquired Captain Acton. I'll put it low to make sure, responded Captain Weaver, and call it a hundred and twenty-five miles a day, though a hundred and fifty would be nearer the mark. The admiral might have been observed to be calculating by the movement of his lips. It will be a run, then, said he, of about forty days. At the utmost, said Captain Weaver, and the Menorca will want at least sixty. 
"'What have you to do?' said Captain Acton. "'That we should wait until Saturday.' Here the conversation was stayed for a minute or two, by the entrance of a footman with a tray of sandwiches and cakes, and ale for Captain Weaver, and wine, and the like. "'Why,' answered Captain Weaver, who had had time to think, "'the Aurora's copper wants cleaning badly. We shall need to take in more ballast. There are the sails to bend, and a lot to be seen to aloft, stores to be shipped, and dozens of other matters to be attended to, gentlemen. We're not a naval dockyard down on the wharves. We can't rig out a dismantled frigate and fill her with men, with all her artillery in place, and send her to sea in twenty-four hours, and there may be some little difficulty as to a few of the crew. Two or three of them who are married will want a longer spell ashore than this time gives them. If so, and I reckon upon it, I shall need others." "'You think a detention of four days will signify nothing "'in our certainty of overhauling the Menorca "'or getting to Rio in advance of her?' said Captain Acton. "'I know the Aurora, sir. "'No highwayman could know his blood mare, "'which has galloped him again and again, "'clear of the noose of the gibbet, "'better than I know your Baltimore clipper. "'She'll look up to windward, "'or hold her course when the Menorca is falling points off. "'She was built to sail, madam,' and she do sail. There is nothing in the king's service with her legs. I allow she was born to be a slaver. She looks swift even as she lies at rest, said Miss Acton. You are not armed, I think, said the admiral, whilst the Menorca carries some cannonades and a stand of small arms in her cabin. Mr. Lawrence is a fighting man, and his situation is one of desperation, and, his voice sank as he added, piracy i do not propose to go armed said captain acton such armament as the aurora of three hundred and ninety tons could carry and not perhaps without injury to her speed would prove of little good against an enemy to whom we could only show our heels whilst as to the minorca if we overhauled her we should hail her to back her topsail and if she declined we should hold her in sight "'We might lose her in thick weather,' said the admiral. "'Then, sir, our policy will be to thrash on for Rio.' "'You are quite right,' said Captain Weaver. "'Guns would only be in our way, "'and sarf to check the beauty which we don't want.' "'Can you explain, Captain Weaver?' interrupted Miss Acton, "'whose irrelevancy was feminine, "'and whose question was based on her desire to hear something "'that she could understand.' for the talk now as it ran was beyond her. How it was that Miss Lucy Acton, who is one of the best-known ladies who reside in these parts, should pass along the wharves and go on board the Menorca, to be made a prisoner of, and sailed away with, without anybody seeing her, without anybody being able to say that he saw a young female pass along? Even if he could describe her dress without knowing who she was, we should have been able to conclude that Mr. Lawrence had lured her on board, for we never could have supposed that she would have gone to him without his being guilty of some base stratagem to inveigle her. "'I can make no other answer than this, ma'am,' said Captain Weaver. "'Suppose she was down on the wharves between half-past seven and eight. Most of the laborers would have been away breakfasting. The few that hung about might not have taken any notice of her, or if one or two did,' Then they are people we didn't come across to question. Most of the men on board the ships in the harbor would be in their forecastle breakfasting and smoking and the like, and those that were on deck, and few enough at that hour, might be thinking of other things than people who were passing by. I don't see how else Miss Lucy Acton's not being seen or noticed can be accounted for. No doubt you are right, said Captain Acton. I see no other solution to the puzzle. "'And a puzzle it is. "'For,' said he, "'it is quite certain that my daughter was down on the wharves "'and was entrapped this morning, "'which explains the reason of Mr. Lawrence's hurried sailing. "'I beg your pardon, gentlemen,' said Captain Weaver very humbly and respectfully. "'Both your honors are seafaring men "'who have seen more of the sea than my larnedest notions "'could heave into sight to me. "'But I should like to say this.' 
If our ship is made out aboard the Menorca, supposing we overhaul her, is she likely to back her topsail to our hail? Mr. Lawrence, we may guess, is a determined man. He'll know that you've got the scent of him, and I allow that he'll keep all on with his ship, even if there should be such a breeze as would sarve him to run her under water. We must hoist foreign colors, said the admiral quickly and decisively. American, I should think. There are many Yankees afloat like the Aurora. Still begging your honor's pardon, said Captain Weaver. Suppose the Menorca do back her topsail, and we launch our boat. Mr. Lawrence makes out his father and Captain Acton in the starred sheets. Will he stay to receive ye? Won't he fill on his topsail and be off? You forget, said Captain Acton, that Mr. Eagle and my crew are on board, and they will have something to say in response to Mr. Lawrence's orders. Your honors, said Captain Weaver, I am greatly mistaken if Mr. Lawrence don't prove one of the hardest and most difficult skippers that ever took command of a ship. He'll get his way, though it should come to his sending balls to do it through the brains of those who try to stop him. If the Menorca won't heave to after catching sight of us in the boat, said Captain Acton, we must return to the Aurora and follow her. Then, as I have said, we must head under full press for Rio. But will Mr. Lawrence make for Rio, said Captain Weaver, when he understands, by the Aurora chasing, that you have found out his port of destination? Something at sea must be left to chance, said Captain Acton, a little impatiently. Since you cannot be ready before Saturday, Sir William and I will have time to weigh your conjectures and views. I shall be down early tomorrow morning, and hope to find that you have made a fresh and vigorous start in getting the vessel ready for sea. End of chapter 9 Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona, September 27, 2021Chapter 10 of the Yarn of Old Harbor Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell. Mr. Lawrence and Mr. Eagle. It was a May morning in the English Channel. Over the soft blue of the sky, some large clouds, as yellow and tender for the eye to dwell upon, as the spume of the sea from the receding breaker, with glories in their brows and glories in their skirts, were sailing slowly and stately on the mild breeze, that blew sweet with mingled odors of land and brine from the coast of old England. There was weight enough in the wind to grace the lines of streaming waters as they ran with feathers of foam, and on this wide plain, with the shores of Britain dwelling in a faint, violet shadow upon the starboard horizon north but one ship was visible and scarce to be wondered at war had swept the narrow seas and for hours in the day little more hove into view whether from the cliffs of our country or from those of the enemy opposite than sometimes a large convoy glimmering cloud-like as it floated some compact some scattered under the protection of men-of-war up channel to london town or to other ports, or down-channel to their several destinations in various parts of the globe. Or it might be a cloud of steam-like smoke, far off indicating an action between single ships. An Englishman had hailed a Frenchman to strike. The Frenchman had answered with a broadside, and before the sun sets, the Englishman, with her fore topmast and mizzen top gallant mast gone, is making for Plymouth with a prize in tow. Or again it will be a smuggling luger chased by a revenue cutter with a flash of the sea snow at her stem and the blaze of a long down on the forecastle. The ship in sight carried in those days a very unfamiliar rig. She was what is well known now as a bark. She was under all plain sail and showed many wings, and she lifted sails which Lord St. Vincent, when Captain Jervis was the first to introduce into the navy, and merchantmen, always quicker than navy ships to adopt improvements or changes for the good, were using them when ships of the state, at least a good many of them, 
were still satisfied with the truck above the top-gallant yard. This vessel was the Menorca, which, as we know, had left Old Harbor shortly after eight o'clock that morning, and now she had shrunk the mother country into a delicate vision, and, slightly leaning from the wind, was sliding with a steady keel through the water which beautified the copper that shone ruddily under her weather bow with the prisms and crystals and gems of the ocean fountain. In spite of Admiral Lawrence's admiration of her, she would excite laughter in this age as an example of the stump-ended fabrics which the shipwrights of the eighteenth and the nineteenth centuries were building for sailors. Yet many of these structures made wonderfully long voyages and kept the seas, touching here and there to careen, for as lengthy a period as the average life of the modern steel fabric. The Menorca's length did not very greatly exceed her beam. Her bows were round, though they find down into keenness at her entry under water. She had a large square stern with windows, and her buttocks, when her stern fell into the hollow, swept up as much foam as recoiled from the plunge of her bows. Upon the weather side of the quarter-deck of the ship, on this May morning in the English Channel, Mr. John Eagle, the mate of the vessel, was walking to and fro, sometimes directing his gaze to windward, sometimes aloft, sometimes sending it along the ship's decks at the men who were employed on the numberless jobs which attend a sailing ship's departure from port. High aloft, perched on the foretop gallant yard, was the figure of a lookout man who was told to report anything that hove into sight, and to continue to report how the distant sail was heading. These were Mr. Lawrence's instructions. Mr. Eagle looked a very mean sort of man as he walked the deck. Neither by form, face, nor manner did he express individuality or character. The sole feature noticeable in him was a look of sullenness, a sour, sneering, quarrelsome air about the mouth, to be found, perhaps, in the curve of his thin lips. Whilst he walked, Mr. Lawrence came out from the cabin through the companion hatch, and after standing a few moments looking about him, he stepped to the side of Mr. Eagle. The contrast between the two men was remarkable. You could scarcely have believed that they belonged to the same nation. Mr. Lawrence's tall, elegant, and dignified feature towered above the poor, unshapely conformation of Eagle. His handsome face wore an expression of haughtiness, distance, and reserve. Both Mr. Eagle and the boatswain, named Thomas Pledge, who acted as second mate, and the rest of the crew had already discovered that their captain perfectly well understood, and remembered that he had been an officer in the Royal Navy, a sailor of His Majesty the King, that comparatively brief as his story was, it was brilliant with heroic incident and adventure, and that instead of being greatly obliged to Captain Acton for this command, he considered that he was acting with a very uncommon degree of condescension in taking charge of a merchant vessel, unless, indeed, she was a prize to his man-of-war. "'There is nothing in sight, sir,' he exclaimed, as he stood beside Mr. Eagle, who had come to a halt on the approach of the other. "'You will please see that a sharp lookout is kept for any sort of sail that may heave into view, and I trust to you to keep a sharp lookout yourself. When fairly clear of the sillies, I may breathe with some ease.' "'So far nothing's hove into sight, sir,' said Mr. Eagle. "'We have a pretty little breeze blowing,' said Mr. Lawrence, "'going to the side and looking over. "'And we are under all plain sail. "'The wind's a beam and her speed is under six. "'Can she walk in strong weather?' "'She's done nine, sir, in my experience of her,' answered Mr. Eagle. "'But it took half a gale of wind on the quarter to make her do it. Mr. Lawrence came from the ship's side and said, "'Pray continue your walk. I have something of importance to communicate to you.' And he looked down into Mr. Eagle's face, with a curiously mingled expression of contempt, haughtiness, and superiority. "'It is not customary, I believe,' he said, "'in the merchant service for shipmasters to take their mates into their confidence. It is necessary, however,' that I should communicate one or two facts to you in connection with this voyage. I presume you are not aware that Miss Lucy Acton is on board this ship? I saw her come over the side, sir, 
but didn't know she had stopped, said the maid, with an expression which might have passed for incredulity in the sour, congenital curl of his lips. She remained on board and is in my cabin, and I shall occupy the cabin which was fitted up professedly for a sick bay. Miss Lucy Acton aboard this ship? cried the mate, giving way to his amazement. Well, I am truly astonished. I don't give a damn about your astonishment, Mr. Eagle, exclaimed Mr. Lawrence with haughty severity. I want you to understand that Miss Lucy Acton is on board this ship, and I desire that you will regulate your behavior by thoroughly understanding the facts which I am going to do you the honor to impart. Mr. John Eagle made no answer. I first of all wish you to understand, continued Mr. Lawrence, that Miss Acton and I are in love with each other. We desire to be married. Captain Acton objects on the grounds of what I am forced to term my poverty, and certainly this quarter-deck would not know my tread if I were not poor. At the same time, the greatest esteem and friendship exist between Captain Acton and myself and his regard for me is sufficiently expressed by his placing me in command here. Do you follow me, sir? I do, sir. Miss Acton and I agreed to elope. We found our opportunity in this vessel. This could only be done by contriving what the French call a ruse. It was to be assumed that her father had fallen ill in this ship, whilst inspecting her early this morning and the stratagem was to be carried out by his dictating a letter to me, begging his daughter to come at once to the vessel. This she did, and she is now below. Do you understand me, Mr. Eagle? Oh, yes, sir, I am a following of you, answered the mate, with a face crippled in meaning by astonishment, and by other sensations excited by this extraordinary story. Now, continued Mr. Lawrence, still preserving his lofty, superior, rather overbearing manner, as though he would heave Mr. John Eagle overboard by scruff and breach, if the fellow durst utter a syllable of offense. It is arranged by Miss Acton and myself that she should feign that I have kidnapped her, sailed away with her, in short, against her will. This attitude we preconcerted, to rescue her from the accusation of having eloped, which might greatly prejudice her in the eyes of her father, and injure her future and fortune. When, therefore, you meet her, which you doubtless will, she will probably, with the utmost passion, nay, even with tears in her eyes, declare that she has been torn from her home by a base artifice. And you'll understand, Mr. Eagle, that her sighs, her statements, and her tears are merely tricks and parts of a play which has been carefully prearranged between the lady and myself. Do you understand, sir? he added, looking stormily at his mean little companion from the altitude of his elegant and commanding figure. Why, yes, sir, of course I do. But I never should have thought it. Why, of all the young ladies... I'm not asking you for any opinion, nor will any view that you can take concern me. You have the facts, and you will repeat them to the crew, to some of whom she may probably appeal, as indeed I have advised, that her pretended situation may seem the more real, and Captain Acton, by such evidence, be more fully convinced. You and the crew will know what to think. It is simply a love affair, and my own and the lady's business, essentially. And he stopped in his quarter-deck walk, causing his companion to stop, and flame threats from a pair of eyes as imperious as ever glared command upon another. Mr. Eagle looked as obedient as a quartermaster to instructions sternly delivered by a flogging captain. I have another matter to talk to you about, Mr. Lawrence proceeded, and on this head I have to request, without the smallest qualification of what you must regard as my orders, that you will preserve silence. I beg pardon, interrupted Mr. Eagle, but before you go on, I should like to say that I am only mate of this ship, and take no interest lying outside the sphere of my duties that don't concern me. What I have to say, said Mr. Lawrence, will concern you, at least I think so. 
It will concern you very much indeed. Yesterday, Captain Acton placed in my hands sealed orders with strict instructions to summon all hands and to read the document to you and the men, but on no account to break the seal before the ship had arrived at latitude twenty degrees north and longitude about for we never can be sure of that, thirty degrees west. Mr. Eagle's figure started as he walked. He knew his course to Kingston, Jamaica, as intimately well as you know your home when crossing from over the way to it. He ventured to stare at Mr. Lawrence, who went on. The nature of these instructions I can only guess at from several conversations which I have had with Captain Acton, who without being in any degree specific, yet seemed to suffer me to read between the sentences of his conversation. And now, sir, said Mr. Lawrence with great austerity, this is the communication you will preserve strict silence upon until the sealed instructions are read. My belief is, understand me, I say that the idea I have arrived at from Captain Acton's conversation is that I should carry the ship to a port that certainly is not Kingston, nor is it in Jamaica, though I am unable to say more, and that he wishes this vessel to be handed over to the representative of a South American merchant who does business in London. What the port may be, I am as curious as you undoubtedly now are to learn. I believe also that the whole of us, from captain to boy, will be paid off at this port and sent to England at Captain Acton's expense, and each man will receive treble the amount of the wages that he would have got for his voyage to Kingston and home. All this I infer from Captain Acton's language, and I may be violating his good faith in me, in committing even these conjectures to the strict confidence which I am sure you will observe. Various sensations were depicted in Mr. Eagle's face as he listened. First he looked scared, then fear by mere force of frown and enlargement of eyes then skeptical with his sour, sneering mouth, then obstinate, sullen, mulish. He perfectly believed in the statement Mr. Lawrence had made. Captain Acton, the owner, was a naval officer, and so was Mr. Lawrence. They had agreed to abide in this matter of selling the ship and discharging the crew by a custom of their service, namely, the sealed instructions. A very short silence followed Mr. Lawrence's delivery. Mr. John Eagle then said, You'll find, sir, that when the crew comes to learn that this voyage ain't being made to Kingston, Jamaica, but to another place, they'll turn to and refuse to work the ship as their agreement was for Kingston and nowhere else. That will be mutiny. To refuse an order aboard ship is mutiny. In the Navy, we hang men for that sort of conduct. "'Well, sir,' said Mr. Eagle, who uttered his convictions with the misgivings which fear of the listener excites, "'my own opinion is that it wouldn't be reckoned as mutiny. "'It wouldn't be justice if it was called mutiny, and treated as mutiny. "'Tain't the crew that breaks the agreement by refusing to do something which they never ship to undertake, "'but the owner who gives them a job when at sea which they would have declined to hear of "'had they been told of it ashore.' And I'm surprised, he continued, emboldened by Mr. Lawrence's silence, that Captain Acton, who is a gentleman born, and a man one could sarve all his life with satisfaction to himself and employer, should get rid of his ship and crew in such a fashion. But, perhaps, all that you say, sir, won't be found in the instructions you are to read in latitude 20. I am talking to you, said Mr. Lawrence, with acid contempt not to gather your opinion of Captain Acton and of such instructions as he may have given me, but to acquaint you as an officer of this ship with such facts as I collected from Captain Acton's conversation, which must presently become the property of the whole crew. It seems to me, sir, he continued, looking at his mean companion in his lofty, imperious, flaming way, that even on the bare hint of the possibility of such a proceeding as I have stated, you are on the side of the crew. You advocate and express the cause of the crew. You anticipate the action which would be ranked as mutiny, and which would certainly cost human lives, unless, indeed, I decide upon a course of my own, 
by which I mean that if the crew refused to work on this ship to the place named by Captain Atkin, I would steer to the nearest port and get rid of the whole of them and replace them by others. And if they refused to help me to navigate the ship to the nearest place, I would hoist a signal of distress and make my helpless situation known to the first man-of-war that was not French or Spanish that came along. Having driven in his nail firmly and deeply enough, as he thought, to sustain his wild, piratical, extravagant project, Mr. Lawrence added in his commanding way, I hope, sir, I have said enough. Meanwhile, I must repeat my order to you to keep a sharp lookout for ships, and to see that a sharp lookout is kept. We should be in a very serious plight if we allowed a French cruiser to cross our Haas, and come between us and the coast of England. The Frenchman's frigates sail well. The Menorca has a shabby pair of heels. Therefore, I am for putting my helm to port should anything show ahead, and you will be good enough to report any sail that springs into sight. With that, after a long, penetrating look round, he went below, leaving Mr. Eagle looking as if he was asleep with his eyes open and dreaming. Indeed, Mr. Eagle's mind was so shallow that all that he could think of, or conceive, was simple even to silliness. He resumed his walk to and fro on the quarter-deck, and every time that his face was turned forward, his eyes fastened upon Thomas Pledge, who was acting second mate besides being boatswain and carpenter, and who, just now, was superintending some shipboard business that was going on in the waist. Mr. Lawrence descended the steps into the cabin, which has already been described, with its plain sea furniture and stand of arms, and entered the afterbirth which he had pretended to convert into a sick bay. Here were two rough bunks, one on top of the other, each containing a mattress and bolster. It was the middle berth betwixt the captain's and the pantry. Mr. Lawrence's sea chest, clothes, and nautical instruments were here collected. He stepped to a shelf and took from it a tin box containing the ship's papers, and from this box he drew out a large, portentous, heavily sealed envelope, whose enclosure of stout paper rendered it somewhat thick and bulky. He looked at the address. Upon the envelope, in a bold clerky hand, was written, To Walter Lawrence, Esquire, R.N., in command of Captain Atkins' bark-rigged vessel named the Menorca. Secret instructions to be read to the officers and crew of the above said Menorca by Mr. Lawrence whenever the ship shall have arrived at twenty degrees of north latitude and about thirty degrees of west longitude. He looked attentively at the seals, which were impressed with the acting crest. He mused for a little while over this document, manifestly thinking of other things. Though his brow was knit, his handsome face was a work with thought. Under that netted brow, the expression of the idea in him came and went. There never could have been a finer study for an artist than this tall and elegant creature, slightly bowed, his beauty lighted up, so to speak, by the several colors of the moods which inspired him, and which seemed, by the occasional movement of his lips, to indicate the rehearsal of a passage that was to follow. With an impulse almost as passionate as an effect of stern resolution, he replaced the tin box, walked out of the berth, and dangling a key which he had withdrawn from his pocket, stood listening for a few moments at the door of the berth, which adjoined the one he had quitted. He listened, then knocked, knocked again, and receiving no reply, inserted the key, turned the handle, and entered. This was the berth set aside for the captain, though, as a matter of fact, in merchant vessels, the captain used to occupy almost invariably the aftermost starboard berth. It was plainly but comfortably furnished. The bedstead was like those ashore, and such as in former times Spanish ships chiefly were equipped with. It had a chest of drawers and a washstand in combination, and a table in the middle, at which sat Miss Lucy Acton. Her hands were clasped before her and rested on the table. She shot a swift glance under her beautiful eyelids at the incomer, 
then looked down upon her hands with a gaze which, for motionlessness, might have been riveted, though nothing was to be seen of her eyes under their lovely drooping clothing of lids and lashes. She was plainly dressed in a gown whose waist was just under her bosom. In some such a gown, or in some such attire, she was wont of an early spring or summer morning, to amuse herself in the flower gardens, or to take walks, occasionally remaining to breakfast at some poor neighbor's house. The only conspicuous feature of her apparel was a hat, lately introduced from Paris, and much affected by the fashionable ladies of London and other parts of this country. I speak of it as a hat. It was in truth a jockey bonnet made of lilac-colored silk, decorated in front with a bunch of fancy flowers, and on top was a lace veil that hung gracefully down the back. Mr. Lawrence stood viewing her in silence for a few moments, and then, approaching the table so that he stood close to her, he said in a voice of tenderness, Miss Acton, Lucy, my Lucy, for my Lucy you have ever been in my heart since the day when I asked you to be my wife, and you know, but you must believe that my adoration of you then has not waned by a single ray of its brilliance. Nay, the flame is greater and purer and more glowing than it was in that hour in which you refused my hand, not because you could not love me, nor because you believed the half of what had been told you about me, but because I was in too great a hurry. I had not given you time to find me out and love me as I believe, as I am sure you now do. Oh, my Lucy, this act of seeming treason against you will be forgiven. Your heart will acknowledge that, violent as might seem the step I have taken, by no other could we have been brought together, and all the artifices and all the falsehoods I have been guilty of were, you will come to believe, the inspiration of such a love as few men ever felt for the woman of their worship. He knelt on one knee by her side and tried to take her hand. She started from her chair and recoiled some paces on which he rose and stood towering in his figure and gazing at her, but with a face whose beauty could not have been more perfected than by the expression of the emotion of his heart. Her native blush, which was one of the delightful features of her loveliness, had vanished. Her face was colorless, and this uncommon pallor, which one would have thought could only have visited her cheek in the day of dangerous sickness or in death, heightened the wonder the depth, the power of her dark eyes, whilst those lids of hers, which naturally drooped upon the loveliness they eclipsed in slumber, were raised till the vision she might have been said to pour in soft light upon her companion, looked unnatural and wild, the eyes of madness, the incommunicable gaze of any one sooner than the half-veiled, love-lighted sweetness of the orbs of Lucy Acton. I asked you when you first came in here to see me what you mean to do with me, she exclaimed in a voice so strained and high, so entirely lacking in its native music, that her father, had she been unseen, would not have recognized the tones as his child's. And I answered, I will marry you, he replied. That is no answer, sir, she cried. You have basely and cruelly stolen me from my home. I command you to return me to my father. Is this your gratitude for his goodness to you, and the affectionate regard he has for Sir William Lawrence, who will be more shocked than even Captain Acton by your unnatural, ignoble, treacherous conduct? Home cannot be far. The ship has not sailed many miles. Return me at once, sir. Ships must be in sight, any one of which will put me ashore. If you detain me, if you carry me, I know not where, in the hope of my marrying you, you will drive me mad, as I nearly am mad now. And when she spoke these words, she delivered a wild, shrieking laugh, baring her teeth by such strenuous elongation of her lips, as left them ashen, and the tragic quality of that ringing, dreadful laugh was heightened by the absence of the faintest stroke of merriment in her features. "'You are wrong, madam,' he said, with an appearance of respect, and even of sympathy coloring the tender voice he employed. "'There is no ship in sight, 
If there were, she would probably prove an enemy's cruiser, which must end my dream of happiness by our consignment to a French prison. You are in the hands of a man who loves you, who adores you, who is indeed taking his chance of the gibbet to win you. Trust in me. As my wife, you shall be faithfully returned to your father, who will not condemn an action which merely anticipates the sanction I was looking forward to when he gave me command of this ship, and brought me, by this stroke of goodness, closer to you. You will return me, she said. You are not in earnest. This is a bold and awful act of treachery, attempted merely to test me. Marry you? Send me back to my father at once, whilst my home is at hand, or you will discover that instead of having won a wife, you have driven a girl into a madhouse. Her wild look, the extraordinary change by a dramatization of the eyes which she held in their soft brilliance, fastened upon him, her raised, painful, indescribable voice, her attitude, the hue of her face, might well have suggested to him that her threat was no idle one, that being a young woman of exquisite sensibility, she might be so wrought by his inhuman conduct as to lose her mind. Her delicate intellect would stagger into madness under the cruel blow he had dealt her in the name of love. "'You are not likely to go mad,' he said, smiling at her, and his handsome face, with that smile lighting it up, might have helped to conquer any woman, though betrayed into the imprisonment of a ship's cabin, and sailed away with into unknown regions, who in her heart of hearts felt towards this man as Lucy Acton did. But not in the way that Mr. Lawrence had devised was the victory to be his. "'When am I to leave this ship?' she asked. "'Will you be seated?' "'No, sir.' When am I to leave this ship? You know, madam, Miss Acton, Lucy, my Lucy, that I am a man of broken fortunes. I have struggled hard to retrieve the past, but the world is full, and I have been unable to find room in it. You came in my way. I adored your beauty, and worshipped you for your character. You would not accept my hand, but I felt, in my secret soul, that I was not indifferent to you, nay, that if I could advance higher claims than those of a broken lieutenant and a man with the reputation of being a gambler and a drunkard, you would have listened to me, you would have consented, nor would your father have objected, for he loves our service, and his partiality for Sir William would have helped me. I determined to win you, no matter the machinery I might set in motion. I was determined to escape the horrible trouble of bankruptcy and the intolerable menace of a debtor's jail by carrying this ship to a port and there selling her and her cargo through the agency of a man who is known to me, and with the money thus got, I mean to pay off all my creditors in England and return with you as my wife, assured of Captain Acton's forgiveness for your sake, and equally assured of his approval as it is my intention to hoist the flag of honor as high as my father has mastheaded it, to be a gentleman, to live as a gentleman, and to be deemed by the part I hope to play in the drama of life, worthy of being the husband of Lucy Acton and the son-in-law of her gallant, generous, noble-hearted father. She listened to him with the immobility of a ship's figurehead. No astonishment at his extraordinary revelation of intention varied the expression of her face, which remained as it was when she shrank from him. Truly a wonderful face, the face of an actress of supreme genius, the face of the inheritrix of the surprising, most excellent art of her mother, the famous Kitty O'Hara. Still did she keep bare her beautiful teeth, Still did the tension through the elongation of her sweet lips hold them bloodless. Her eyes had lost in their expression their lovely quality of brooding. They stared, and the stare was that of madness. Her color was gone. Apparently this delicate, fascinating, lovable, gentle girl possessed powers of will and intellect which dominated nature herself in her. And even as it is known of some, 
that they have been capable of arresting the pulsation of their heart, and yet live, so obviously in this lady was an influence, a passion, a very wizardry of determination, which suffered her to drive the blood from her cheek, to narrow the eyelid till the eye had lost its familiar seeking and dwelling look, till the mouth took the form that was to convey the intention of the artist. Her only reply to his speech was, as though she had not attended to his meaning, Are you going to keep me a prisoner in this cabin? For a day or two only, madam, he answered, with his face flushed with disappointment for he had hoped his candor would have produced a very different effect. But I may tell you, frankly, that Mr. Eagle and the crew know that you are on board, and I should have played my part ill had I not provided that nothing you can say, no entreaties that you can make, will persuade them that your elopement is not voluntary. Oh, sir, I had never thought you a villain. You shall never find me one he cried with impetuosity. But I am to win you, and will you tell me the poet or the philosopher who has ever spoken of the strategies employed in love as villainy? She continued to stare at him. Her figure still seemed to shrink as though in her first recoil when he tried to take her hand. Her face then suddenly underwent a change. Her mouth relaxed what in homely features might have been called its wild grin. She frowned. Her eyes took an unsettled look. There was something in her countenance that could hardly have failed to arrest the attention of any one who had a tolerable acquaintance with the insane. Mr. Lawrence seemed to see nothing but Lucy Acton and her beauty. "'You have stolen me from my home, sir,' she exclaimed in a piteous, almost whining voice, "'and I am without clothes except the dress that I am wearing, and they will soon be in rags.' which will flutter if I begin to dance. I am thankful to hear you speak of dancing. If ever your clothes should become rags and flutter to the measures of your feet, your beauty will still make them a finer garment, at least in my sight, than the apparel of royalty in state. But you shall not want for clothes, he said, speaking in his chinless voice, which, as he held command over fine vocal powers that rendered him at the piano, or at any other instrument, a sweet and engaging and manly singer, would have been found soothing by any ear that had not Lucy Acton's to hear with. Your dress will last you till our arrival, and then you shall have plenty. Whatever your choice selects, you may already call your own. She delivered the same wild, screaming laugh which had before filled the cabin with its insane music, and said, dropping her note into one of plaintiveness, whilst she extended her skirt with both hands, as though she was about to make a step or two in a dance. Think of poor Lucy Acton in rags. Think of the lady who was notable before a liar and a rogue stole her from her father, for her fine dresses and modish hats and bonnets. Oh, think of her. She paused to sigh deeply. In rags, a prisoner in a ship owned by her father, who would kill the wretch that tore her from his side. And thus speaking, she turned to the bulkhead, and putting her arm against it, buried her face in her sleeve, and fell to sobbing so piteously that you would have thought her poor little heart was broken. End of chapter 10 Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen Gilbert, Arizona September 10, 2021Chapter 11 of the Yarn of Old Harbor Town. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarn of Old Harbor Town by William Clark Russell. Princess Tatters. Mr. Lawrence approached the figure of the young lady sobbing against the bulkhead and placed his hand lightly upon her shoulder. She shook him off with a passionate convulsion of her whole form, which was full of disgust, aversion, and contemptuous wrath. It was a masterpiece of movement, eloquent in the highest possible degree of what she chose him to believe was in her mind. Her mother, Mrs. Kitty O'Hara, 
had been famous for her artful strokes in this way. No actress surpassed her, and few were the equals of Mrs. O'Hara in the remarkable gift of personification of passion by action. Mr. Lawrence drew back a step. "'Loving you as I do,' he exclaimed softly, "'loving me as I know you do, my dearest girl, my sweet mistress, the sole star of my desire. How must it grieve me to see you weeping? How much more that I am to think those tears flow through me? But I have faith in time, in the unconquerable quality of my love, and in the assurance of my soul, for though I have descended to artifice to enable me to win you, pure gem of your sex as you are, you do not despise me for my struggle. You recognize and approve an effort which has cost me many little pangs. For, dearest madam, my sweetest Lucy, tis all for love, and the world would be lost for me if you denied me, if I did not win you. She stayed her sobbing to exclaim in the high, strained notes she had before spoken in. Send me home, sir. Send me back to my father. There are ships about. You speak falsely if you say there are no ships. We are still near my home. Do as I say before you drive me mad. She rounded from the bulkhead as she pronounced these words. Her eyes seemed to be on fire. Her cheeks glowed. Again she bared her teeth in her wild, insane grin. She appeared transformed. He knew that certain violent and heart-changing passions and emotions could so work in a beautiful face as to make it look repulsive and devilish, such as jealousy or criminal insult. But he never could have believed of Lucy Acton that her loveliness could undergo the amazing transformation he witnessed, for he did not think to recall that her mother had been a great actress, and that this girl might have inherited, perhaps, the finest side of her genius. There is no ship, I assure you, madam. They have my instructions on deck, to keep clear of any sail that heaves into sight, because I am not the man to allow my dream of happiness to be dissolved by a Frenchman's capture of this vessel. And what must we expect to find in these narrow waters but the ships of the enemy, intent upon easy captures, bloodless prizes such as the Menorca would make? For answer, she threw herself down upon the deck, she fell as though in a swoon, and lay motionless with her face buried once more in her arm, that now reposed upon the carpeted planks. Her tears or sobs assured him that she had not fainted, and understanding that his wisest policy would be to leave her to her thoughts, he cast an adoring look upon the prostrate figure, and quitted the cabin, slamming the door noisily after him, that she might know he was gone, but silently turning the key outside, for it was not then his intention that she should go on deck and meet the crew until the statement he had made to Mr. Eagle had passed in growling whispers through the men. It was customary on board the Menorca, and doubtless in many other ships carrying merchandise, for the mate to dine in the cabin with the captain and his watch below, that is to say, when he had no duty on deck. The second mate kept a lookout, and when the chief mate was done, the second went below to dinner. If the mate had the watch during the dinner hour, he remained on deck until he was relieved by the captain. The cabin dinner hour on board the Menorca was one o'clock. When Mr. Lawrence first met Mr. Eagle, and perceived that he was little superior to a working hand before the mast, he had made up his mind to hold no intercourse with him outside the absolute requirements of the ship's routine. He had told him plainly that he desired to dine alone, and that when the mate's duty kept him on deck, he, Mr. Lawrence, would relieve him after he had finished his meal. This arrangement perhaps secretly pleased Mr. Eagle, even on the spot when it was first named, for he easily witnessed in Mr. Lawrence a man so out in a way superior to himself that he judged he would feel like taking a great liberty every time he sat down with the master of the ship. The dinner was served this day at one o'clock. The humpback steward brought the dishes aft from the galley or caboose, as the little cooking place used to be called. The ship had only just come out of port, and she had brought with her a stock of fresh provisions, 
meat and vegetables and the like, which would supply the cabin and the forecastle with fresh messes for some days. Mr. Lawrence had also caused a couple of hen coops to be filled with poultry. In those times, sailors lacked the addition of the harness cask and bread barge to the bitter wooden beef and the coarse worm-eaten ship's biscuit, which science and experience have contributed to the scurvy-making fare which seamen are obliged to eat. Yet a sort of provision was made to supplement the brine-hardened meat and the worms of the sailor's bread. The captain of a man-of-war, for instance, at sea, would breakfast on coffee, toast, potted beef, and tongue, sliced a la vohal. Whole legs of mutton were tinned. Mr. Lawrence sat down alone in the plain little cabin of the Menorca, on this the first day of the vessel's sailing, and upon the table were placed by Paul a boiled fowl, a piece of boiled bacon, a round of cold fresh beef boiled, a dish of sausages, and two or three dishes of vegetables. Paul, having already received instructions, placed a tray furnished for a meal beside his master on the table, and Mr. Lawrence cut some fowl and bacon, adding vegetables, and filled a small tumbler with red wine, and then, stepping to the door of the berth in which Lucy Atkin was confined, he almost noiselessly inserted the key, and softly shot the latch, and resumed his seat, and Paul, bearing the tray of food, knocked on the door, and receiving no reply, entered, and the motion of the ship upon a long, steady heave of swell slammed the door to after him. Mr. Lawrence, with his back turned upon this cabin door, heard Lucy's voice, but not what she said. If Paul answered her, his voice was so sunk by the awfulness of her presence, by all that she meant being at sea, by all that she had typified to this forlorn vagrant when on shore, that his accents were inaudible in the cabin. After a few minutes he came out. He approached the cabin table and stood close. His face wore a mingled look of astonishment and fear, and he was very pale. He was as grotesque as something fanciful in a fairy story, with his red hair, hump, long arms, rounded legs, and whilst he stood he scratched himself as a monkey does. His chin was enormous, and out of all proportion to his face. Is Miss Acton eating her dinner? No, sir. What did she say to you? Why, your honor, when I went in she looked at me and burst into a laugh that turned my blood cold. She didn't know you to be the man that gave her the letter that brought her here? She didn't look as if she remembered me, Your Honor, and she said nothing about it. What did she say? Why, Your Honor, she says, whilst I hold the tray, What are you? I'm the ship's steward, Your Ladyship, says I. Aye, but what else, says she? What forest was you caught in? I didn't understand her, sir, and didn't answer. Do you come from Africa, says she, or have you broke loose from a traveling wild beast show? Mr. Lawrence arched his eyebrows. Certainly he did not recognize the sweet and sympathetic Lucy Acton in these questions. And then she says, frowning as though she'd up with a knife off the tray and run it into me, What have you got there? Your dinner, your ladyship, says I. "'Put it down upon the floor,' says she in a sort of shriek, as if she was trying to sing. "'Don't you see I'm in tatters? "'They've got me here, who am a princess at home. "'And these are my rags, and all I've got,' says she, spreading her dress with her hands as though she was going to skip. "'Beggars in rags feed on the floor. "'They feed so. "'Anywhere's good enough for them. "'I've seen them sitting on the edge of ditches eating.' Put the food on the floor. That's how princesses in tatters dine. I did as I was ordered, your honor, and came away. Go in presently and see if she's done, and ask if she'll have some fruit pie or cake, and report if the tray is still on the deck. Yes, sir, answered Paul, who was not sailor enough to say, Aye, aye, sir, which should have been his speech. Mr. Lawrence was exceedingly thoughtful. What opinion he was arriving at whether he was beginning to think that the girl was really mad, 
or that she was merely acting with extravagant absurdity in the hope of disgusting him, you could not have told by looking at his face. In about ten minutes after Paul had made his report, Mr. Lawrence told him to knock on Miss Acton's cabin door and enter. This time the door swung to and fro, and Mr. Lawrence, who had turned in his seat to follow the steward's movements, saw Miss Acton upon all fours upon the deck with her face close to the tray, as though she was taking up the food with her mouth. A swing of the vessel hove the door to its latch, and hid the extraordinary picture. A minute or two later Paul came out, shutting the door after him. "'I saw her,' said Mr. Lawrence. "'She is on her hands and knees. What did you say?' I asked her if she'd have some fruit pie or cake. She didn't look up nor answer. She's chucked most of what I took in about the cabin. She has made no meal, then? I couldn't tell, Your Honor. The piece of chicken is on the bed, and I see the piece of bacon under it. I don't know what she was a-doin' with her nose and nuzzlin' of the tray, as though she was a-smellin' of the salt. Don't enter the cabin for half an hour. Then go in and clear up, and if she speaks, make no answer, and take no notice of her, but clean up the mess. He left the table and turned the key softly in Lucy's door, withdrew it, and went on deck. The breeze that had blown the Menorca out of Old Harbor still sang in her shrouds, but with a fresh and a stronger song. The sea ran in lines of brine, which flashed friskily. The mountainous clouds sailed down the blue heavens with the solemn majesty of line-of-battle ships draped in sun-impearled cloth from truck to waterway. The bluff boat bark was darting foam from her to right and left as she thrust through the streaming water and rolled with dignity, slowly to leeward and yet more slowly to windward as she brought the violet-shadowed cavities of her canvas to the wind. The hens were noisily in their coops and cocks crew. The sound of waters broken and in motion was musical. The shadows of the rigging slided gently to and fro over the wide breadth of white planks. The men in the picturesque garb of the merchant sailor of that day, some of them in striped pantaloons flowing to the shoe, some in short-cut blue jackets, and most of them in round hats, were distributed over several parts of the ship. Mr. Eagle walked the weather side of the quarter-deck. In reply to Mr. Lawrence's question, he said that nothing had been in sight, and nothing was in sight. This Mr. Lawrence verified by a searching sweep of his gaze round the horizon, and Mr. Eagle went below into the cabin to eat his dinner. When he was there, he bade Paul go forward and tell Mr. Pledge that dinner awaited him. This privilege was Pledge's because, though he was the ship's boatswain and also her carpenter, he kept watch and headed the starboard division of the crew as second mate. He was a tall, lank man, rather knock-kneed, with a long neck, and, which was very unusual in those days, his chin was garnished with a quantity of straggling reddish hair. His face looked as though it had been put together without much judgment. His nose, which was broken, was not in line. His mouth was somewhat on one side, one eyebrow was raised and the other depressed. His eyes were small, of a deep, moist, soft blue. He had served in the American Navy, and had much to tell about Yankee captains and commodores. He was dressed in the garb of the common sailor, and it is not wonderful that Mr. Lawrence should decline to meet him at table, which, if it did not make their footing equal, must bring them into relations the fastidious, haughty, handsome naval officer would regard in an uncommon degree objectionable. He entered the cabin and took his place. Mr. Eagle, at the foot of the table, carved the boiled beef. When they were fairly under way with their dinner, Paul went forward, and the two men were alone in the cabin, out of hearing of Mr. Lawrence's ears through the open skylight, if they suppressed their voices, equally out of hearing of the inmate, under lock and key, of the captain's cabin. Though Mr. Lawrence had communicated the intelligence of the girl being on board, and of his holding sealed orders from Captain Acton in confidence to Mr. Eagle, the sensations excited in this plain and acid sailor by the extraordinary, astounding, and unexpected revelations had filled him to bursting point with a fever and passion for giving the news. In short, 
the man's mind was much too small to retain what had been poured into it, and of course it overflowed. To whom other than Tom Pledge could he speak? Pledge and he had sailed in Captain Acton's employ for two or three voyages. They were friends, and visited each other ashore, where each had a little cottage and a wife. So, after a careful survey of the skylight, which lay open just above the table, and a cautious look round, Mr. Eagle said, "'Tom, did you observe me and the captain walking up and down this morning in conversation?' "'Aye,' answered Pledge, "'and I wondered what there was between ye to keep you so busy in talk.' Mr. Eagle again looked up at the skylight, and said as softly as his gruff voice permitted, "'What do you think, Tom, of our sailing under sealed orders from Captain Acton?' which the captain's to read in latitude twenty north and longitude thirty west. The contents of them sealed orders aren't exactly known to the captain, but he told me, from what Captain Acton let fall, he believed that the ship was to be carried to another port, and there handed over to a Spanish gent as was awaiting to receive her, and that the whole ship's company was to be discharged, and sent home at Captain Acton's expense, and the wages they had agreed for trebled. "'What do you say to that?' Pledge, who chewed slowly as a cow the cud, watched his companion steadfastly, his temples throbbing with the action of his jaws, and said, "'Do you believe it, John?' "'So help me God, yes, then, as I sit here,' answered Mr. Eagle. "'Who is to work the ship for him?' asked Pledge. "'For you may depend upon it, that if the crew are to be carried away to an unbeknown place,' They'll all go below to a man, for Jack's as good as his master, when it comes to his having to do something which he didn't agree for. I put it as you do, though in different words, said Mr. Eagle, and he answered that Captain Atkins's orders must be obeyed, that the crew's refusal would be mutiny, and that if they wouldn't work the ship to a port where he could ship a fresh crew, he'd heave aback the main topsail yard and wait for a man o' war to come along. "'Well, I'm jiggered,' said Mr. Pledge, "'not looking slightly startled, "'for he was an old sailor. "'He well understood the despotic powers "'of the captain of a ship, "'and he readily perceived that Mr. Lawrence's threats, "'in case of refusal by the crew, "'were to be carried out. "'But that's not all,' continued Mr. Eagle, "'with another glance at the skylight. "'It ain't even arf all, "'and I think you'll agree with me "'that the rummiest part's got to come.' "'Another slice, John,' said Pledge, pushing his plate and cutting a big chunk from a loaf. "'Who do ye think's aboard?' "'Who?' "'Why, Captain Acton's daughter, Miss Lucy Acton.' "'What's she doing of here?' inquired Pledge, pulling away his plate heavy with meat and fat. "'She's a-running away with Mr. Lawrence.' "'Or is Mr. Lawrence a-running away with her?' "'According to his yarn, said Eagle, with sour solemnity, "'they ruined away with each other.' "'Where is she?' asked Pledge. "'Eagle dumbly pointed to the captain's cabin. "'It's an artfully laid plot,' said he, "'if the captain's to be believed. "'She's supposed to be locked up again her will. "'By and by she's to go among the sailors "'and swear that she's been carried off by violence.' This is to make her father believe that she never consented to run away, as she don't want to lose the fortune as it otherwise come to her. Wasn't there some talk a bit of a time past of him a courtin' of her? said Pledge. Why, yes, now that you remind me, I recollect. Well, John, said Pledge, it's not for me, nor the likes of me, to interfere in such a gallivantin' job as this. If the young lady's been run away with, with her own consent, it's not for me, I says, to pay any attention to what's happening. People who fall in love with each other, and are objected to by their relatives, will sometimes carry on their business in a way as might make pious, respectable Oparians feel their hair standing short upon their heads. I've lived long enough in this here world to discover that no good ever comes to a man by messing about in other people's concerns. But when it comes to this ship being navigated to another port than the one agreed for, why, naturally you set me a-thinkin', John. I don't know nothing about them sealed orders you refer to, 
but it seemed strange to me when I heard of it, and it's strange to me still, that Mr. Lawrence should have been chosen to command this vessel when the berth was yourn by right of sarvice. Was it because Captain Acton couldn't be sure of your uh, executing his wishes? What do you think yourself, John? You've got to consider it's two naval officers acting together. They know each other's mind, and I guess that when Captain Acton chose Mr. Lawrence to take charge of his ship, he knew that he was in the hands of a man who'd listened to no talk, who was used to man-of-war's discipline, and would act if it came to having to shoot men down so as to gain his ends. Mr. Eagle, whose views were undoubtedly in accord with Mr. Pledge's, viewed his companion in acid silence. Just about this time, the steward Paul came down the companion steps with the cabin key, which he had received from Mr. Lawrence. He took no notice of the two men seated at the table, but stepped to Lucy's door, knocked, paused, inserted the key, and passed in. He emerged in less than two minutes, holding the tray that was covered literally with broken victuals, and, locking the door, was about to step up the companion ladder when Mr. Pledge said, "'Who have you got locked up in that there cabin?' "'You must ask the captain that, sir, if you want to know,' Paul answered. "'You dog! Do you know I'm second mate? "'Answer me, or I'll flay you before sundown,' said Pledge, turning scarlet. "'I durst, whined Paul. "'I've the captain's orders to keep my mouth shut,' and he hastened up the steps. "'He was followed by Mr. Eagle, who thought it about time to relieve the captain.' Mr. Pledge had eaten his last morsel of cheese and was leaving the table when his attention was arrested by a knocking on Lucy's door, accompanied by the cries of a female. But what she said he could not hear. So Mr. Pledge, taking some steps, stood close to the door. The voice of Lucy within cried out, "'Is anybody there?' "'I'm here, ma'am,' answered Pledge." Who are you? I'm Thomas Pledge, acting second mate of this here ship, ma'am. Open this door. I can't, ma'am, it's locked. And in proof of his assurance, Pledge turned the handle and shook the door. I demand to be set at liberty, cried Lucy, in the strained, wild voice that had frightened the hunchback steward. The villain who commands this ship lured me into her by pretending that Captain Acton who is my father and the owner of the vessel, lay seriously injured through an accident, and wished to see me. I demand to be returned to my home. I have been stolen away by a base artifice. The crew of this ship are the servants of my father, and they would know his wish must be to recover me, and your duty, and Mr. Eagle's, and the men's, is to turn the ship for Old Harbor, and surrender me up to my father." If this is not done, I shall go mad. I am mad now. The wretch who, by a lie, has seduced me into this vessel, has driven me crazy. And with that she fell to singing, from which she broke off after a few moments to burst into a shrieking, lunatic laugh. Thomas Pledge's mind was of a very common order. He had gathered from Eagle that the girl was to pretend a situation of acute distress, that when she was married... Her father should not hold her responsible for her elopement. Her words might have carried weight, and even conviction, but for the song and loud unmeaning laugh that closed them, in which Mr. Pledge saw nothing but acting, not having experience of insanity in any shape or form, and shouting through the door, "'I'll go and report to the captain, ma'am, that you're locked up and want to get out.' He turned, with the intention of making for the companion ladder, when he saw Mr. Lawrence standing a few paces abaft the steps, tall, stern, frowning, his face fierce with the strain, and indeed almost fury, of the attention with which he had bent his ears to catch the syllables of Lucy through the bulkhead. Mr. Pledge started like the guilty thing surprised. "'What are you doing at that cabin door, sir?' asked Mr. Lawrence. "'I do not inquire what you are doing in this cabin, for—' according to the custom of this ship and perhaps of others in your service you take your meals here but what are you doing at that door conversing through it with the lady inside 
"'The lady thumped, and I went to see what was the matter, sir,' said Mr. Pledge, awed in his old man-of-war instincts by the overbearing, I may say, the overwhelming demeanor of Mr. Lawrence, which was, to his words, as the thunder of the explosion is to the message of the firearm. "'Has Mr. Eagle been talking to you about the subject of our conversation this morning?' said Mr. Lawrence. "'Now, Tom was too sound a shipmate to betray John.' He answered doggedly, as though Mr. Lawrence as well as himself must be aware, that he was trespassing on ground he had no right to tread. We yarned, of course, together. We've sailed together afore, and can always find something to talk about, sir. Mr. Lawrence seemed to read the man's thoughts. Unscrupulous as was this naval gentleman, he was an extremely clever fellow. Preserving a severe austerity of countenance, a demeanor upon which the word discipline was writ large, he exclaimed, It is not my intention to ask you if Mr. Eagle has broken his faith with me and communicated to you the confidence I imparted to him this morning. You are, sir, by virtue of your rank aboard the ship, free of this cabin, and it is therefore desirable that I should trust you. The lady in yonder berth is Miss Lucy Acton, who consented to elope with me, providing it should be understood by all on board that she was being kidnapped or stolen from her home. That this should appear, it was arranged between us that she should be locked up as though she were a prisoner, and then, in a day or two, I should enlarge her, and she would go amongst the crew and speak of my cunning and stratagem, and her desperate lot in being torn from her father's home, all which would, in due course, reach her father's ears, and mollify his wrath at her giving me her hand in the existing state of my fortunes, and preserve to her the fortune she must inherit as Captain Acton's only child. Now, sir, continued Mr. Lawrence in his frowning, imperious way, this is submitted to you in confidence, and it is manifestly my wish that some of the crew should credit her story, that they may give the evidence we desire when they are called upon to tell what they know. "'Well, sir,' answered Mr. Pledge, pleased by the skipper's candor and condescension, "'it's not for a plain sailor-man like me to put his hand into such a tar-bucket as this. "'I know my bit, and I'm a-willin' for to do it, "'and if the hands get to hear the story of the lady, "'it'll come from her, or from that there humpback steward who waits upon her, "'and not from me, for I'm for minding my own affairs.' and sticking like a barnacle to a ship's bottom to the undertakings I enter into. He said this with a grave nod of the head, that the significance of the closing passage of his speech might be mastered, for it was then, running through his mind, that more lay behind the presence of Lucy Acton on board than Mr. Lawrence suspected he knew, by which he referred to the sealed orders. Mr. Lawrence made no answer, and Mr. Pledge, seeing that he was to go, went on deck by the only exit, namely the companion ladder. Immediately after he had passed through the hatch, the steward, Paul, descended. "'Did you clear away the mess from Miss Acton's berth?' asked Mr. Lawrence. "'Yes, sir.' "'The lady, I presume, ate nothing?' "'I couldn't see that she had, Your Honor. "'When you have cleared this table,' Go forward and tell the cook to cut a plate of the most delicate beef and chicken sandwiches he can contrive. Get a bottle of red wine and a glass, and be ready to carry the refreshments to the lady when I've left her. He approached Miss Acton's door. Lucy was seated on a locker under a window, three of which embellished the stern of the Menorca. The ocean, as the ship lightly depressed her stern, was visible through this window, a blue field decked with flowers of foam that rose and sank. The large glazed space filled the cabin with light, which trembled with the pulse of the white wake streaming fanwise, and with the shivering of the sunlight into splinters of diamond brilliance by the fretful motions of the breeze-brushed waters. Miss Lucy Acton sat with her eyes, veiled by downcast lids, fixed in a stare as lifeless as the dead upon her hands, which lay clasped in her lap. So motionless was she, you would have said she slept, 
Much of the lovely bloom that always gave to her liniments a choice sweetness was absent, but not the less did as much of her face as was visible express its refined and delicate beauty. When Mr. Lawrence entered, she did not raise her eyes, nor whilst he stood looking at her did she discover, by any sort of movement, the least knowledge of his presence. Lucy, he said, speaking the word in the wooing voice of love. She made no sign. He repeated her name as though startled by her immobility, in which an element of tragedy might have been found in the singular, unwinking fixity of her stare upon her hands. He stepped to her side, and peered closely into her face, and listened to hear if she breathed. Oh, yes, she breathed, she was alive, but though he put his face so close to hers that she might have felt his breath upon her cheek, her form did not move by so much as might indicate the passage of a thrill. Her eyes remained as steadfast in their gaze as though they were painted. He withdrew a step and exclaimed, Lucy, why will you not speak to me? Why will you not look at me? You know that all this is done in the holy name of love, and God who knows me knows that I would not cause you a pang, that your beautiful eyes should not be shadowed by a tear drawn by any action of mine, if I could have believed that loving me, as I know you do, that loving you, as you know I do, you would have come to me at the summons of my passion, and hand in hand with me as my wife, taking your chance of all that might have followed. The emotion of an impassioned heart, the melody of a rich and manly voice were in his words, and no man, though he should hate the fellow for his wrongdoing, could have doubted his sincerity whilst listening to his speech. Add to this his superb figure, his handsome face glowing with feeling, the hereditary dignity of his demeanor, but these were expressions of his meaning which she would not raise her eyes to witness. All of a sudden, and when the silence that followed had not lasted ten seconds, she sprang to her feet with a shriek. She dashed her hands to her face. She rushed as though pursued to the other end of the cabin, and there, crouched with her face to the bulkhead, hidden in her hands. And thus she stood rocking herself sideways, moaning, Why am I not sent home? Why am I here a prisoner? What will my father think has become of me? Home! 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 In the hands of a man that dare rob his employer, at the mercy of one who, of all Captain Atkins's friends and acquaintances, should feel the most deeply obliged to him. She wheeled round and out of her incommunicable attitude and language of distress, and said, looking at him vacantly with a cold, pale smile, are you Mr. Lawrence, the son of Sir William Lawrence, Captain Acton's friend? You know, madam, that I am, he answered, bowing with graceful suavity, and with a light smile that was like saying, I understand the import of your tactics, and am willing to wait and watch you. I know, sir, she exclaimed with a vehement indignation and contempt, conveyed by that perfection of art, which conceals art and which is a gift of intuition beyond the reach of those not born with it, that Sir William Lawrence has a son, and that he was dismissed from the Navy for a brutal, drunken outrage of which he alone, of all the gentlemen and officers in the service, was capable. He colored brightly at this, and his frown was as though a shadow had come between him and the light that revealed his face. I know, she continued, still preserving her accent of scorn and viewing him with eyes that did not seem to be hers. So did she contrive to diminish the breadth of the beauty of the lids. So did she manage to look passions and feelings, which the memory of her oldest friend could never have recalled, as vitalizing her brooding, half-hooded gaze. I know that this man came ashore, and lived upon his father who was poor, and drank and gambled until his name provoked nothing but a shrug, and that one day, in a fit of pity, for which doubtless he has asked God's pardon, Captain Acton, who loves Admiral Lawrence, gave his poor creature of a son command of a ship. This I know, she said, letting her eyes fall suddenly from his face, down upon her fingers, 
which she seemed to count as she proceeded. But I had always supposed that there was some spirit of goodness left in Mr. Walter Lawrence. I believed that, though he might gamble and drink and live in idleness upon the bounty of his father, he, with all his imperfections, was a man incapable of outraging the feelings of a young girl, incapable of betraying the generous confidence of one who stood to him as a warm-hearted friend. "'Can you be that, Mr. Lawrence?' she said, peering at him in such a peculiar fashion, with such archness of contempt that a spectator, short-sighted and at a little distance, would have supposed she was looking at the handsome fellow through an eyeglass. "'Oh, I'm going mad to suppose it, mad to think it possible.' She flashed her hands to her forehead. Sobs seemed to shake her. She turned on her heel and went to the big stern window and looked out upon the sea. He seemed to have been struck dumb by the fury of her candor. His teeth were fastened upon his underlip. His cheek had grown pale. "'Will you leave this cabin?' she said without turning. "'And acquaint the first ship you meet with, that you have a young gentlewoman on board who desires to be set ashore in England?' "'I do not ask you,' she continued." with a cutting sneer that was on her lip, as plain in her voice, as though her face was visible to him, to return the ship and her contents to their lawful owner. But, if you suppose that you are going to gain me by keeping me a prisoner in this den, if you imagine that all the horror which my soul can feel for a wicked, unscrupulous man is not likely to be with me in all thoughts of you that come to me with your presence, or fill me with madness when I am alone, then better for you if you should go to the stack of muskets, which is in the cabin, load one, and shoot yourself. And clapping her hands as though she was in the box of a theater, ravished by some transcendently fine performance, she once more delivered herself of the maniac laugh which had curdled Paul's blood, and which, though ringing from lips, though proceeding from a face hidden from him, seemed to strike Mr. Lawrence as nothing which she had spoken had, and, save it for the swaying of the ship, he stood as motionless as a statue facing another statue whose back was turned to him. End of chapter 11 Read by Nancy Cochran Gherkin, Gilbert, Arizona October 15, 2021Chapter 12 of the Yarn of Old Abertown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by George S. Williams. The Yarn of Old Abertown by William Clark Russell. Mr. Lawrence reflects. When Mr. Lawrence found that nothing he could say, nothing he could implore, nothing he could entreat his companion to forgive, provoked Lucy into looking loud from the window through which she gazed at the sea, nor caused her to alter her posture, which curiously suggested with dramatic as that she was alone, that the man was gone, that she was engrossed by thoughts of her own, he withdrew. After closing the door, he seemed to a state of turning the key, but turned it nonetheless and pocketed it as before. The cabin was empty. Mr. Pledge was again superintending work forward. Mr. Eagle kept the lookout. This was the ship's first day from home. The watches had not been set, and they would be all hers with the ship's company until the second dog watch came aloud. The vessel swayed on the heave of the swell with the podosity. You would have looked for it in one of her mood. She creaked in every tiba. She pitched rapidly, albeit the blue afternoon horror was very shallow, but the sullenness of the study loud the bow was in her long waist motion. If Lucy meant to be sick, she was neglecting her chance, for here was a movement more fitted to decompose the large going stomach than the lofty bureau that is swung by the storm. But so far, this sweet and amazing young lady had proved herself as good a sailor as Mr. Rollins himself. While he stood in the reflection at the cabin table, the steward Paul came 
down the steps bearing a tray of refreshments so plentifully decorated as to prove that the ship's cook had been chosen with the judgment. The pair made of sandwiches might have kindled a right in the dulled eye of one lying or placed with nausea. In addition, were a plate of cold tongue, a small plate of brown, with two or three other delicacies. On the tray stood a bottle of red wine and a tabla. Mr. Lawrence told Paul, holding him the key as he gave him the directions, to take the tray to Miss Acton, place it on the table in perfect silence, and quit the cabin, making no answer if she spoke to him. When this was done and the key received by Mr. Lawrence, he took a tabla from a rug out of the skylight and entered the bath which under the name of Sikibe had been fitted up for his own use. Here he contrived to find a bottle of blood, a small carcass of which without water he swallowed. The interior presented a very inhospitable look. Its rough hewn banks might have been intended for the accommodation of prisoners. The deck was without carpet. Indeed, the only color or warmth which this melancholy hollow presented to the eye or the mind was to be found in such wearing apple of swung from hooks in Mr. Lawrence's sea chest, in the nautical instruments, in the shelves with a little pardon of tin, a few books, and so forth. He folded down upon his chest, folded his arms, and sank into thought. Had he needed a motor for his reflections, he would have found one in the Duke of Gloucester's speech. Was ever woman in this humor would? Was ever woman in this humor would? He had been so transported by his scheme for winning the beautiful young girl whom he worshipped that his survey of the vast canvas of his intentions was in reality restricted to but one corner of it, so that he saw only a little of the whole truth. First, and certainly foremost, he had counted upon her love for him, which, however, carefully the circuit might have been kept by her, was witnessed by him every time they met, and flourished as a conviction in him. He had looked for her forgiveness for the rashness, and it may be added the cruelty of his conspiracy of love, and he never would have believed that this sweet image of girl dwelt such a strange character as she had exhibited since. After envying her on board into his cabin, he confessed that the story which he had brought her to him was a lie, and with a face filled with the right of worship for her, about his intentions. In some strokes of his character, he might have indeed believed that she was merely acting, but other features had impressed him to such a degree that though he was determined not yet perhaps to accept the suspicion or the persuasion of his own opinion, he, behind the darkest curtains of his heart, felt a fear that his stratagem would force her reason from her brain that she would go mad when she clearly understood that the ship was bound to Rio to be feroniously sued there when she realized that she had been ruthlessly torn from her father, from her home, and all she loved, and that her name must ever bear the stain. Happen what might Mr. Rollins' ignoble feat of abduction. But as a rule, men who act with excessive imprudence are endowed with a quality of self-complacency which enables them to persuade themselves that it is all right, and to this believe they cling until time and experiment prove that it is all wrong. Whereupon their moral beings fall to pieces, they become mean, cheap, and weak, and bewail their folly under the name of misfortune. Mr. Lawrence, having meditated a while, rose from his chest and clasped his arms and whistling softly the familiar air of wiping on the stairs, quitted his naked, fallen, inhospitable bath. As he advanced towards the companion steps, the hatch was darkened by the figure of Mr. Eagle, who, on catching sight of the captain, cried, A sail blowed on the labboard, Bosa. 
Mr. Lawrence lashed back to his cabin when he took from a shelf a telescope of uncommon power for those times, the gift of no less a man than Captain Acton, after intelligence had been brought to him of a particular heroic piece of behavior on the part of Mr. Lawrence. With this telescope, he sprang onto the deck and leveling it at the sea over the Libo, viewed in the lenses the picture of a large man of war with two white birds broken by gun pots. She was far away, yet not so distant, but that a heart's breadth of her black side could be seen shivering in the mileage betwixt the lower white bird and the whole white treble of water running aft. Men of the Minoka were on the deck at work here and there. They looked at Mr. Lawrence as with the leveled telescope he stood on the quarter deck viewing the distance battleship. They all belonged to old Harbour Town, all had heard of him, and a few knew him by sight. They were members of a group of inhabitants who felt that the presence among us to them of a man whose sea story, though brief, was brilliant, did them and old town of Harbour a honor. And they regarded him as he stood with the grass at his eye, as though they would say, Young man or war and she may be a journey, but there is a jack who will know what to do with her. And maybe some of those who thus reflected cast their eye upon the figure of Mr. Eagle, who stood near enough to the captain to enable the sight to master the details of a very striking contrast. Hoist the ensign, exclaimed Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Eagle, breaking into a lawn, sent aloft at the peak of the back the meteor flag of old England. British, said Mr. Lawrence in a moment, as though speaking to himself, as I thought, holding the man over in view in his telescope and marking the slow soaring of the British flag to the gaff head of the two decker. The captain's exclamation had been overheard and the gaze of the merchant seamen of Minoka were fixed upon the figure of one of the fabrics which could never light up with their cloud of sail and the confines of the sea or the near fuse of water without exciting a veil of interest or causing the heart to rip up in momentary transport of patriotic pride. She was under four and misanjali topmasts. With the main all was well and the spars lifted their canvas to the moon-like loyal without hint of leg or suggestion of wood. Either she had been in action and had come away crippled or had been in trouble on a lee shore or among the rocks. And still she painted a stately and a swelling picture upon the blue sky past her. The sun was westering, his yellow light flung upon the distant canvas the delicate sheen of fine silk from the hard bread of black side under the lower white bird. The stately roar to reward flashed lightning sparks from the wet, and she slightly pitched the upheaval of her bows, exited at the forefoot the snow-like clubbing of foam. She passed in grandeur and in tranquility. All the hearts aboard the Minoka British as they were must wish that Gallant show might not fall in with something superior to herself in weight of broadside and perfect in equipment aloft. Though every man felt that the circle of such a encounter must be inevitable one, that is, sailing of jerry rigged two decker in company of a powerful prize boat bowed, let us suppose, for the sweet and lovely waters of Plymouth Heaven. Mr. Eagle approached Mr. Rollins, who turned upon him suddenly. The sail of that ship, cried the captain, must have been in sight some time before you reported her. When I came to deck, she was hull up. Is this your idea of keeping a lookout? I reported her as soon as I saw her, sir. Wasn't she reported from the masthead? Yes, sir. And then I saw her and reported her to you. And this is the way that a lookout is to be kept aboard this ship. Mr. Lawrence was a biting insolence of scorn and that sort of pity which enlages more than kicks or excursions. 
If you don't hold to the instructions you receive from me, sir, you will soon find yourself eating black bread in a French dungeon with a straw from a stiff or bed. He made a step to the ship's side, and the mate without answer struck away to leeward. About this time the breeze began to freshen. The horizon slightly thickened with some weird change in the atmosphere and the shadow of the evening. The Monica and the all plain sail held into the white smother of the sprung alongside, and as she sprang, crashed the surge with her loud weather bow till the bright brine sometimes leaped like a fountain athwart the forecastle. Mr. Lawrence watched her behavior with attention, and, uh, and often soon a look at the gleaming road of wake which was so brilliant and long that as the shadow deepened, the tail of it was lost to view. In the second dog watch, the crew were mastered aft and divided into watches. It was tolerably certain that down to this moment no hint had found its way amongst them that their course would presently be for any other port in the world than Kingston. Mr. Lawrence swooped alone as he had dined alone and as he intended to breakfast alone. At the sea, the last meal which in the old forecastle days consisted of black tea and ship's biscuit was invariably called supper. At six o'clock, Mr. Lawrence sat down to the last meal of the day. A tray for the inmate of the captain's cabin was prepared. It was furnished with a tea and milk for the ship was but one day out, and though she wanted a cow, she could not need at least a day's supply of milk, bread and butter, slices of ham and biscuit. When the steward came from the cabin, Mr. Lawrence said, Did the young lady speak? No, sir. What is she doing? She is pulling feathers and other stuff out of her bed, which she has drawn from its place on the deck, and she is sitting alongside of its fluffing of the feather over the cabin floor. Did she look at you when you entered? She didn't seem as if she even saw me, Your Honor. Has she eaten anything? Can you tell me? When I fetched her tray last time, sir, I noticed that some of the sandwiches and the tongue was gone, and there was a little red wine in the bottom of the tabula, as though she had drunk some and left a drop. She had lifted up her mattress and is drawing the inside of it around about her. Mr. Lawrence frowned. Passed his lip and stared upon the deck with a strange and mixture of gloom and anger. In truth, there had come into his mind the resemblance of a person who had fallen mad, and among us, the earliest indication of his insanity was his tendency to tear up everything that would yield to the power of his figures, including his clothes. By and by, he said, Go in and clear the mess up, take no notice of her, nor heed her if she speaks. Then fetch the mattress from the upper bank in my cabin and place it on her bedstead. He finished his supper in a very gloomy mood. His character has been imperfectly drawn if it leaves upon the reader the impression that he was no more than a gallant, had some hectoring scudrel, a drunkard, a liar, and a gabbler. He was more than this, and better than this. In him was a very great deal of honesty, study, British human nature, and among us those who saw the white skin of his character peeping through the rags and the tatters of his morals was the young lady who he had locked up in his cabin. He was driving. Had he driven her mad? This was an awful thought to him, a figure, a presentiment on the canvas of the scheme which his utmost imagination never could have painted. He was passionately fond of her. In truth, he was risking his neck to win her. His innermost sensibility as a man and as a gentleman was in perpetual posture of liquor over the reflection that he had. It was that he had his gentle, nurtured, beautiful, adorable girl, a prisoner in a little ship that she was rolling to a port in which she was to be fraudulently sold. 
He thought of her in the lovely drawing room of old Harbour House, the soft illumination of wax lights, the sweet incense of flowers, the piano whose keys were accompanied by her own melodious wobblings, her little dog, all the comforts and luxuries which wealth could provide her with, all that a tender-hearted and loving father could endure his only child whom he loved with. And then he thought of her torn from all this pleasantness and sweetness and elegance, so robbed that in a short period she must become burglary to the eye. After her father's hospitable and depletive table, fed with the poor fear of a common little sheep. For some time after he had closed his knife and fork, he sat at the table shading and supporting his forehead with his hand, his elbow resting, and deep thought was in his attitude. To one who knew his story, he submitted a picture for memory to cherish. Night was near, though not yet come, but its shadow was upon the ship, and the three or four stars like little balls of quicksilver ran to and fro athwart the gleaming black pins of the skylight grass. The hum of a steady breeze in the stout shrouds, in the cat humping, in the drumming hollow of many sails, sounded like the strains of an organ muffled to the ear by the walks of the church that holds it. The low thunder of the charge, washing past the ship, was as constant as its accompaniment of the concert of creakings, jarring shocks in backhead, ladder post, and the strong fastenings. Mr. Lawrence started suddenly, stood up, looked around him, and viewed steadfastly for a space Lucy's cabin door. Then, muttering to himself, Tomorrow, he made his way towards the deck. He had half mounted the cabin ladder when he was brought to a stud by a sound of voices of men speaking hard by the companionway. What beats all my going a fishing, said Mr. Thomas Pledge in a voice which, in spite of its being subdued, and in spite of noises of the wind aloft and of water washing along the beds, yearning and seething, was distinctly audible to Mr. Lawrence as he stood in the shelter of the companionway. This else ship belongs to Captain Acton. His purchase of her was square and above board. Why should he go behind his own back in a manner of speaking and put a man that was an officer in the Royal Navy in charge to carry her to a port and sell her by stead as though she was a piece of plunder and the officer in charge ordered two and her over to a fence which John, as a cause of you know, is a vulgar name for a man as he receives stolen goods. Why is the crew kept in arrogance of Captain Acton's intention? There is no harm in a man a selling of his property. But I say, there is a good deal of harm in a man deceiving of sailors for making them an offer to do something which he don't rightfully explain and which he would decline to undertake if they would be told the nature of it. In all of what you say, I agree with you, Tom, answered Mr. Eagle, and I should have thought that Captain Acton was the last man on this earth to have behaved himself in such a way. For my part, I have always found him so straightforward that the needle ain't truer to the poor than he is to his rightful and honorable meaning. Aye, said Mr. Pledge. But don't you forget that the needle sways and leaves the poor mark point off? But he swings back again, said Mr. Eagle, and is true as God's law allows him to be in every atom of steel that goes to the making of him. Have you talked at all for us about this here matter? Not yet, was the reply. Well, said Mr. Eagle, I am for leaving this alcohol on the pin until the time comes for chucking the fix down and letting go, by which I mean I am for waiting until the captain calls the, the ads after and leads to him the seal orders he told me about. It will be time enough to speak up when we know what Captain Acton's instructions to him are. 
You might be right, said Pledge, but I should uncommonly like to learn what old Jim is going to say to this L. Travers, meaning by old Jim, the oldest had forward, and one who had served Captain Acton ever since that retired naval officer had commenced ship owning. At this point, Mr. Rollins, who judged that as much had he said as was like to interest him, put his foot over the coming and passed onto the deck, walking without heeding the presence of the two men to the binnacle stand. He inspected the compass and then looked along the deck. Only one figure was now visible, and he had started to stamp the planks into the true deep sea look out of fashion. It was, of course, as Mr. Lawrence had foreseen. Ego had betrayed Mr. Lawrence's confidence, and the pledge manifestly was thus to carry the report into the forecastle. As this was a part of Mr. Lawrence's program, his mind made no other comment upon it than that he was pleased to discover that honest John Evil, as Captain Acton held him, was a log who could not keep a second, although impacted by so exalted a personage as the commander of a ship, and that in breaking his promise, the soul shall my dead mate was doing exactly what Mr. Rollins wished. The night came down in a heavy shadow that was not lightened by its burden of stars. The form of the sea looked as spectral as the faint astral splashes in the velvet deeps on the high through which sailed many visionary shapes of the cloud. A little time before it fell dark, and when the soft, moist crimson of the sun that was set yet lacked in the west, the steward pole was aft with the lanterns for the cabins occupied by the captain, the maid, and the Mrs. Lucy Acton. The great cabin or living room was already lightened by two lanterns which swung from hooks on either side, the skylight fore and after. The lanterns power bow was more of iron frames fitted with glass, and in them was consumed a mess which was fed with oil. Mr. Lawrence was in act of passing from the cabin steps in his bath when Paul, who had received the key from him, came out of the interior tenanted by Lucy. He looked pale in the lantern night, ugly and grotesque, and his face wore an expression as though he had been terrified. Have you hung up the light in Miss Acton's cabin? said Mr. Lawrence. Yes, sir. What is she doing? She was laying on the mattress I took in. Did she speak? No, sir, at least not at once. Has she ripped up the mattress? I didn't see she held your honor. What next? As I turned after hanging the rattan up, I found her standing behind me with a knife in her hand, one of the knives I took in the train, and it didn't miss when I cried away. She says unto me, speaking through her teeth like as though she was trying to talk whilst holding on to something with her mouth and in the strangest, thinnest voice I ever heard in all my life, like when you are trying to fall down the head of a snail. What do you want here? You rule some creature. You come flesh from your forest. Go back before I kill you. And she flourished the knife which glittered in her, and as though it was a fire on which I ran out, sir. It would have been difficult to tell what was in Mr. Lawrence's mind as he stood being Paul for some moments in silence after he had legged hatchback had ceased. He said in a voice without a tremor, in tones of steady and collected as those in which he would ask a man how he was or bid him good morning. Have you ever met with mad people? Yes, sir. What proof have they given you that they are mad? A tearing up of their clothes and a going about without shame. He was a man called Mickey Crippin, sir. Another would stop at every pool to wash his feet. I knew a man who would attend a service cause he said that the devil always came in and took a seat behind him. 
there was old mother Copton who would spit at a dog if he barked at her who used to do her washing on the Sabbath, saying that she was too good to go to church and that the person ought to be hanged for having committed the forgery where he last lived. And this she would say of a new person just as she would to another who had gone afore him. Do you think Miss Acton mad? said Mr. Rollins, speaking with an effort, but determined to have an independent opinion and willing to believe that the wretch who stood humped, pallid and terrified before him might be able to distinguish clearly what was obscured by his prune, his own prejudices, wishes and dread. Yes, sir, I do, was the answer, swiftly delivered, as is the characteristics of conviction. Without the further speech, Mr. Rollins passed on to his cabin. Till midnight, he was frequently up and down. The mate in charge, rounding up his hail, would see the figure of Captain, who might not have long before gone below, raising and falling against the stars as he stood, grasping a backstay, watching the darkling ship as she crashed the phantom lights of the deep out of the black coil of surge with its troubling nodding of stars of the sea gloom and ever and anon setting the eye of a man who was being used to looking out for a ship of the enemy and allowed the gloom of horizon. But the mate of the watch did not know that Mr. Rollins valued his routine of vigilance by often studying in his own cabin with his ear pressed to the bulkhead that separated Lucy's bag from his, with the idea of catching any noise that might be made within. Shortly after midnight, he softly turned the key in Lucy's door and looked in, and deeming that she lay asleep, he passed in, closing the door behind him, that the roll of the ship might not slam the door and awaken the sleeper. The light was dim, but sufficiently clear for eyes that had come out of the gloom or darkness. A mattress lay upon the deck close against the bedstead, which was emptied of its furniture, and upon this mattress was stretched the figure of Lucy Acton. She was fully dressed as in the day save that she had removed her jockey-shaped hat. The bolster from the bedstead supported her head. Some of her dark hair had become disengaged and lay loosely about her cheek, giving the purity of marble to her brow in that light, and her sleep was so deep that she lay as though dead. On the deck, close beside her grass was a common table knife. Mr. Lawrence made a step and quickly picked up the knife and drew back again, cautious that the fixed gaze will often awake a slumber even from deep repose. He stood close to the door, viewing this picture of a sleeping girl in a ship's little cabin irradiated by a dim light, whose motions, with the rolling and the pitching of the ship, filled the darkling interior with the hardened dancing specters. His marine ear would take no heed of the voices of the ship in that cabin, the groans and murmurs, the low whistling and the last streaming. This was a concert which his seasoned sense of hearing must miss or overlook in his perception of the picture he viewed. He gazed at the sleeping figure for two or three minutes and then left. Again locking the door, he entered his own cabin and stretched his form along the lower bank. But used as he was to sleep well in an hour betwixt one scene of slaughter, of belching block sides, of fierce and murderous building, and another scene scarred by the cannon flame, terrible with its thunder of guns whose muzzle yawned close to the muzzles of the foe, slumber was not to be his. Was it possible that Lucy's situation had driven her out of her mind? Her behavior throughout the day had been extraordinary. Features of character had appeared in her in the extravagance of her moods and humors which he never could have conceived would, though latent and demanding the summons of insanity to become visible, had formed a part of her nature. She, the gentle, the sweet, the refined, the tender, the sympathetic, had uh, exhibited even coarseness. Could she be mad and yet slumber so soundly? How do the insane sleep? 
He contrasted her latched bed on that cabin floor with her home bed chamber, which he figured he had never entered it. A room sweet scented with the flowers of the creepers at the window, white and fair in the apparel of the girl's boa of lace. Elegant in the equipment as were all the rooms of home of the Actons. He loved her passionately, even to madness, and must win her, but he never would have sought to win her at the price of her reason, had he foreseen the blow his stratagem must deal her. He must turn robber to rescue himself from a lifetime of imprisonment as a debtor, and he could not steal his friend's ship without stealing his daughter too, because he knew that his act of piracy would be effectually had all the chance of his possessing her as a wife, as though she lay as dead as Juliet in her tub. He was on deck early in the morning. Daybreak had turned to shine the surface of the scene. The wind was a steady breeze, and the minoka, crowded with every crew that she carried, saving her stand sails, plunged and pitched and frothed and formed in prodigious fine style as she was swept onwards by the wind that was a point above to the beam. The sun rose in the wet pink spreader on the larboard quarter, and by his light, which drew out the sea line like the crystal limbs of tabula against the heavens which were full of travelling clouds, Mr. Lawrence swept his grass the whole brimming circle. Then there was nothing in sight. Mr. Pledge walked to the deck in charge of the watch. When Mr. Lawrence appeared, Pledge saluted him in man of all style, but Mr. Lawrence's policy towards Pledge was the same as his policy towards Ego. He would not sit at a meal with him or have anything to say to him outside the necessity of strict discipline and ship's routine. Mr. Pledge so pride haughtiness and contempt in the handsome face that was turned to him when Mr. Lawrence condescended to ask a few questions about the ship's rate of going and the like. But this much the captain added, Did you ever serve in a man of war, sir? Yes, sir, answered the pledge. British? American, your honor. Well, the Yankees' discipline is stout, though not as stout as ours by the length of the long line to a lead line. You therefore understand the necessity of obeying orders. With some astonishment, Thomas Pledge answered, I do, sir. I told Mr. Eagle to keep a bright lookout for ships, and he reported one to me when she was hull up. She might have been a Frenchman, and if so, we should now be occupying her hold. You will please keep a bright lookout for ships, sir. He added, with which he stepped to the weather side of the quarter deck and pledged close to leeward, thinking to himself, If he talks to old Jim like this and with that their face and manner, he'll find out that the discipline of the British merchant service ain't all these navy ideas would like to see it. Damn me, on top of this talking to me like this, if I don't have a yarn with old Jim after breakfast and the brass to the consequences. And he sent a skull at Mr. Lawrence. He was looking to the Midward. End of chapter 12.